Okay. We are alive right now. Okay. Okay. Okay, let me just put this up on Twitter here. Hey, Pro, you've got the wrong thumbnail, and it's the GTA thumbnail. Oh, the, the G, it's the GTA thumbnail. Oh, yeah, my bad. One second, I'm going to fix it right now. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, yeah, I made a mistake here. Okay, wait, wrong wrong thumbnail, everyone. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to fix it right now here. Uh, okay, here we go. <laughs> Fixing the thumbnail. I'm sorry about the thumbnail, guys. I have a mistake. I had the f last thumbnail from last time. Um, okay. Okay, there we go. Thumbnail is fixed. I'm sorry about that, everyone. Okay. Uh, okay, there we go. Thumbnail is fixed. I'm sorry uh, about that, everyone. Hey, can you lower that? Uh, I just hear my okay, video playing in the background. Uh, okay. Okay, there we go. How's everyone doing? I hope everyone's having a good uh, a good Friday. I'm gonna have another part of Godfather 2 up soon, so just 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 wait. It'll be up soon. Hey, uh, Mario. Hey, Henry. Noah. Um. Hey, Isaiah. Uh, Kyle. Uh, Drift. Uh, Mr. Waifu. What the? Uh, somebody. Uh, somebody's TV. I hear their their gameplay in the background. Uh, oh, one second. I, have a one second. I might have to check. So. Okay. But how much is it at? Oh, it's only like like thirteen percent. My TV. I did not realize it's that loud. Uh, do I think Connor in Assassin's Creed 3 was cool? A lot of people uh, didn't like him, but I thought he was cool. Yeah, Connor was fine. He was a fine character. I didn't have much of a problem with him. I guess people just didn't like that he wasn't as funny as Ezio, but you know, you don't really need humor to make a to make a character good. Hi, Pro, you're my favorite YouTuber. Thank you, uh, Resident. Thanks, man. Thanks, I appreciate that, man. Uh, uh, I'll invite you, Brandon. There you go. Okay. I did get 100% on GTA 5 on PS3 and PS4. I haven't done it yet on PS5. Rest in peace to Kevin Conroy, the voice of Batman. Uh, oh, I, I didn't know about that, Adam. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, in which, uh, which, uh, did he do the animated voice? You know the Arkham games? He's done the voice for the Arkham games. Oh, the Arkham games. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. He was a good one. It, that's unfortunate. Holy crap, this this city is so hard to ride through sometimes. Uh, thank you, uh... uh PRP... Haze? Or is it Purple Haze? Is that is that your name? Thank you for the super chat. Thanks, man. Okay. My favorite food is sushi. Let's get in there. Sushi's uh, really, really good. Search the area for the target. Indeed it is. It's really healthy. <laughs> Am I gonna make a GTA lore video soon? That's probably gonna be up next week. This weekend we're gonna have the Saints Row reboot review, Henry. There's an echo. Is the is the is my volume good, guys? Is it okay? Oh, you found him. Okay, I can't believe I didn't see him when I was running around the cemetery. I actually hate this um this one this one uh, bounty mission. The yeah, thumbnail the thumbnail is fixed. If you just refresh the page, you'll see the thumbnail is fixed. Um, I just had wrong thumbnail earlier. I'm sorry about that. Are you going to mention Volition's Twitter behavior in your review? Yes, there's actually a section on that in the review. It's Volition's response to fans. That's the section of that review. Okay, uh, just wait until there's like 
two two minutes or one minute we'll deliver the target. This was a pretty pretty easy mission. Someone cosplaying as a 1900s American soldier here. Oh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, thanks for the super chat. Yeah, that, that's that. That would be me. Cause I'm affected. Gaming 349. I'm I'm cosplaying as a 1900s uh, soldier. Yeah. Oh, pretty good on the outfit. Yep. Uh, rest in peace, Kevin Conroy. He was a legend. He was ve uh, vengeance. He was the knight. He was Batman. My opinion, he's the best voice of Batman. I never played the Arkham games. I know they existed. Um, I know the games, but I didn't. Uh, never got the chance to play them. I should play them one day. Thank you, George. Do you think uh, you'll ever do like a playthrough on them? Uh, no, I I didn't uh, Mario, but I will. Um, I will look into them. Some of these fools want us to get caught. You got that right. Beg your pardon. All right, today today is Veterans Day. It is. Well, happy Happy Veterans Day, everyone. Yep, we say Remembrance Day here in Canada. A lot of veterans, um, uh, you know, a lot of veterans fought for our freedoms and you know, uh, keep kept us safe from things like terrorism and fascism. Exactly. Thank you to all the veterans who have served um, uh, my this country. Have you seen the Red Dead uh, Four leaks? No, I I haven't. I don't believe any of that. Um, Red Dead Four leaks. <laughs> Carl, would you agree that freedom isn't free? Well, I, I honestly, I think that I think that a lot of people personally, um, uh, a lot, I think a lot of people take for granted the country that they, they, if they live like in the West, I think that a lot of people take that for granted personally, and I don't think they realize how hard some people have it in other countries. After Vietnam, a lot of their veterans were treated uh, terribly. Oh, you're, you are, you are right on that, he Heisenberg. Yes. There's a lot of a lot. The American public treated Vietnam veterans very badly. Like it was that uh, Korean Korean and World War II veterans were treated as heroes, but Vietnam veterans were treated really badly. They were, um, uh, yeah, people spit at them, called them baby killers. It was just it was really bad for um, Vietnam veterans. It, and most of the people, most of the veterans that fought in Vietnam had no choice. It was a draft. They had to go. And yet, imagine imagine how ridiculous that is. That you're forced to go and fight in a in a war. And then yet, and then yet, when you survive that war and you come back from the war, that you have people calling you a baby killer and spitting at you. That's, you know, how st stupid the public was when they treated Vietnam veterans so badly. Very stupid. <laughs> I'm sad. Yes, I'm aware of that, Mr. Wave. Your streams are the best. Thank you, T Takumi. Has anyone in your family served in the military, pro? Um, yes, um, uh, yes, my, um, uh, my great-grandfather served in the Polish military during World War II. My, um, uh, my father had served in the Polish military also. But my great, my great-grandfather, though, was proud of his service, um, uh, during World War II. He survived World War II. But he, um, uh, it was, um, my father was never proud of his military, my, my father despised his military service, and the reason my father despised his military service was because, uh, my father was in, in, in the Polish army when it was communist, so Poland became a communist country, was forced to become a communist country by the Soviet Union after the, um, after the World War II, when the Soviets occupied Poland, and so my father was drafted into the Polish army, he didn't have a choice, because it was in Poland, it was that if you went to college, if you, if you didn't go to college, you would, uh, you would have to go to the military, and so he didn't go to college, and so he was forced in the military and he he despised the um uh the communist military uh let's see here uh your st uh, streams the best thank you takumi do you remember what they were pro also the uh uh yes you 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 mentioned the um 
you mentioned Gamergate, which I, di I didn't know what that was, and I, ha I actually don't know what it was. I know a lot of people, like, talk about it, but I have to, uh, you told me to look that up, and then you told me also about that, you know, case. Um, I would just have to go back to your comment, but I would, um, uh, you know, I'll read both of them. Uh... Dumb son of a bitch. Okay, let's deliver him when it's one minute. Uh, a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of people throw insults around and, you know, make ridiculous accusations against people that they don't like um, for political reasons. Thank you, Mario, for the super chat. No, I didn't, I didn't watch Breaking Bad, Riddy. Thank you for the super chat. Right on the dot. One minute. We are done. Pro, your father was technically in the Soviet forces? No. My father was in the- my father was in the Polish army, which was allied with the Soviets, um, uh, which was a, um, uh, that was a, um, uh, the Warsaw Pact, so he served in the Warsaw Pact's military. He didn't serve in the Soviet military, but my father had no choice. My father hated the communist military. He had- he had to, uh, you know, go in. It was- it was forced conscription, so he hated it, uh. Well, respect to both of your family members, bro. Thank you for their service. Wait, what did you say? I said, uh, I said respect to both of your family members and thank you for their service. Well, it was, um, uh, you know, my, my great, my great grandfather, like, uh, my great grandfather, he fought, you know, he fought against the Nazis in World War II. He was, um, a hero. Uh, my dad is, my, my dad is a hero to me also, but, um, you know, my dad's, you know, he, you know, if you if, if you said thank you to my dad for his service, my dad would probably get annoyed by that personally because my dad just hated the communists so much, and so that military was just you know so you know propaganda. She was, I'm not talking about the Polish military before World War II. I'm talking about it after uh, World War II because it was you know run. It was completely reorganized by the Soviets, and it was you know uh, communist propaganda military, and so that was um uh. You know, that was that. But my father, he had no choice when he had to serve in the Polish military, so that was it about it. I, I appreciate your comment, but, you know, I was just saying that my father, he uh, he really, you know, hated the Polish military during the Cold War, to say, when it was communist. You know, he loves the Polish oh. military today, but he hated the Polish military when it was um, uh, communist. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean. I didn't mean any offense. No, I... no. It's it's perfectly fine. You just didn't. Uh, you didn't. You didn't know. But it's you know. Poland was a Poland was a dictatorship. You know, um, uh, when my father was um uh, young, so it was uh. uh... Can't believe there was so much dictatorships in the 20th century. Yeah, there's still a lot of dictatorships today. Uh, thank you, thank you, Victor, for the super chat. My uncle was in the car. In Cargill War, I would have to look. I would have to look that one up. Cargill War, uh, sounds familiar. Uh, oh, this war. Yes, I know. I know a little bit about this. Um, I know a little bit about this conflict. This was in the late nineties. I didn't know the name of it, but this was the war between Pakistan and India. Yes, I know. I don't. I don't know much about you know. Um, the war itself, but I know that this was, this war was about the Kashmir region, because the, the Kashmir region, the Kashmir region is like a really scary place to go to today, um, because it's very, a very dangerous place, um, and it's like, Kashmir is like basically like no man's land between India and like Pakistan, and like both countries claim, claim the land, and so like you, you could, you could be walking in the Kashmir like mountains and you don't know what country you're in. And also China, I think, also claims a part of it. Also, it's like a very, it's a very contested area. Um, but also the 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 um, uh, what did you call it? The Kargil War, I think it was. The Kargil War is actually the or the Kargil War. I'm sorry, the Car Kargil Kargil War. The Kargil War, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong on this. It is the the war where the soldiers fought in the highest altitudes in history. I think that's what it was. The car, the cargo war. They fought in the top, the highest altitudes possibly, like because it was like in the very high mountains, in the Kashmir region. So it's like a, it's a, it was in the f highest elevation where armies fought was in the um, the cargo war. I think that was it. Uh, but it was um, uh, it was the other the other one was in the Italian campaign during World War One. The Italian Alps. That was the other you know place where soldiers fought at really high elevations. So it was um that but i don't know much more about the conflict it, itself i just know about that um uh i just know about that ready um 
Thank you for the super chat, oh, um, uh, Brett. Anyway. Yeah, but, um, oh, let me see here, uh, thank you, Brett, uh, thank you for, thank you, Brett, $40 super chat, thanks, Brett, and, uh, thank you, hey, 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 uh, pro, have you had Godfather's Pizza, if so, did you enjoy it? That sounds very familiar, but I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think I've had that before. Thank you, man. Yeah, my, um, uh, my great, um, uh, my great grandfather, who was on my mom's side, um, uh, this pretty like you know, it was pretty crazy history. He was um, uh, he um, uh, he was a, a soldier in the Polish military, and uh, what happened was he was fighting on the eastern side because what actually what happened was the, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany had a pact in which they divided up Poland, and so the Nazis invaded from the west uh, on September 1st, and then the Soviets invaded two weeks later in the east, and so my grandfather was great-grandfather was one of the people that fought in the East, and he got captured by the Soviets, so he was a prisoner of war. And then what ended up happening to him is he got sentenced to a gulag in Siberia, where he had to, like, he had to fight to survive. Like, that was, like, the, the gulags in Siberia were just, you know, even if you got sentenced there for just a year or two, like, it was almost always death sentence. Like, he had to fight to survive. Like, it was just, um, it was like he would, he was two days on the train, and when he was two days on the train, it wasn't even in Europe anymore. It was somewhere in the you know, far eastern parts of Russia in Asia. And um, what ended up happening was when they act, when the prisoners were actually allowed to eat food, this is according to what my mom told me, that the prisoners were actually given like spicy fish to eat. And so they weren't given any water. And so basically people died of dehydration in like the freezing temperatures in Siberia. And so, you know, my great grandfather had to mine rocks in like negative 30, 40 degrees um, weather. It was ho horrible. And he, you know, he survived for right. two years. But my great grandfather, he was like a really tough guy. Like, and so he survived. Um, uh, he survived, you know, the gulag for two years. And then what ac happened was, um, you know, uh, two years later, the um, uh, Nazis betrayed the Soviets. And so they invaded the Soviet Union. And then what actually happened was then Stalin was requesting aid from the same Polish government that he actually ran out. And, uh, and what ended up happening was the Polish government in exile told him to release all the Polish people who, were, who, has, who has, is, has in prison so that they could fight the Nazis. And uh, so, you know, my great-grandfather was one of the prisoners that was ended up getting released. And so he served in General Anders' army, and so he fought in the Italian campaign, and he fought at the Battle of Monte Cassino. Uh, and he ended up surviving the whole war, but what actually happened was there was two Polish armies. There was the there was the, the more Western friendly Polish army, which was Anders Army, and then there was the Communist Polish Army, and I'm, I forget what the Communist Polish Army was called. But uh, my great uh, grandfather fought in the Anders Army, so you know he was a prisoner in the Gulag. He was uh, he ended up fighting in the more pro uh, Western friendly um, army. And what actually happened was the Polish soldiers that actually fought in Anders Army were like heavily discriminated when they got back to Poland, um, because a lot of the Anders Army soldiers were like and big anti communists, and so the new communist government in Poland didn't like that and so they treated them like garbage and so it was still at the time with Stalin's rule and so my great-grandfather spent some time in the UK and then after Stalin died he you know when Khrushchev took power Khrushchev Khrushchev initiated a lot of reforms in the Soviet Union and so he de-Stalinized Russia and um, and things calmed down and so my great-grandfather then returned to Poland and uh, you know that was his story he ended up um, you know but his his story is like so tragic how he died uh, because he survived the world war uh, he survived world war ii he survived the soviet gulag but then he actually got killed by a drunk driver and that was it uh that's you know he died it was the late 60s i think it was early 70s so it was he was, he was a really tough man you know to go through all of that but his you know death you know at the end to get killed by a drunk driver it just it, it's just it's just really scary that how death can just you know happen like that like he was like a such a tough guy and this you know this really bad luck you know had a really stupid driver on the road and you know, caused my great grandfather's death. My uh, great grandfather died the same way. Got run over by a drunk driver. Uh, let me see here. Uh, uh thank you for the super chat. Uh, uh, thank you for the super chat, Jimmy. And I, I don't I don't know what you mean though. Um, 
Like, it's like, um... Like, even like, um, uh, you know, when I was, um... When I was, like, a teenager, like, you know, growing up, like, you know, I didn't... I didn't... Ne I didn't necessarily agree with the Iraq War, but, you know, I would always support the veterans. And, um... I... I, um... You know, I, I understand that there's, like, you know, there's, you know, there's bad people, like, in the military-industrial complex, but it's, um, you know, most soldiers are just, you know, decent human beings that just want to serve their country. And that's the thing about it is, uh, you know, it's the big, you know, arms manufacturers. It's those people at the top that, you know, are, um, you know, bad people. You're well read and informed on history, pro. Um, uh, very impressive, I must say. Not many people care about history. Well, thank you, um, thank you, Purple Haze. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that um, uh, super chat. Did you have time to watch Cobra Kai? The first two episodes are free on YouTube. If not, please try it. I want to hear your opinion on it. I will get around to watching it. I didn't get a chance to watch it yet, though, David. Thank you for the super chat. I've been busy with a lot of things, and I've been, uh, I've been, uh, you know, working on my Saints Row um, uh, review recently. I've been working on that the last two days, and it should be up by Sunday. Brad finished watching your Saints Row 1 playthrough. He was really impressed by the game. His favorite character was Lin, and uh, the ending caught him off guard. Oh, well, thank you guys for uh, uh, thank you guys for watching my Saints Row 1 playthrough. I had a lot of fun with that. And my Saints Row 1 playthrough, the first part is about to hit 100,000 views, so it grew a lot. That's just for the playthrough part. Did you know much about Che Guevara? Uh, if so, what info can you give on him? He was a um, he was a revolutionary. He was a doctor from a uh, former doctor from Argentina. But um, you know, I I wouldn't say that Che is a good man. Like he's um, uh, like a lot of people. A lot of people think that Che Guevara was like a hero and like he was like a a freedom fighter and stuff like that. And Che Guevara did fight against a dictatorship, so he did fight against Batista's dictatorship in Cuba. But uh, Che Guevara basically supported Castro's policies of imprisoning anybody that basically didn't agree with Castro. So you know he claimed to be fighting for the people, but anybody if you didn't agree with Che Guevara, you didn't agree with Castro. You know they would throw you in prison or you kill you. So it was um. That's what I know about him. Uh, che Guevara got killed by the CIA in the, um, uh, he got killed by the CIA, was it the, the 70s? He was trying to, uh, he was trying to cause a communist revolution in Bolivia, and so the CIA knew about that, and they tipped off the Bolivians, and they ambushed him, and they caught him, and then he was killed by, uh, he was killed by firing squad. Wait, but that, that's what I know, fun? that's what I know about Che's, um, uh, history. Though, I, you know, Wait, I, the, the thing about it is, I see, like, a lot of people with the Che Guevara t-shirts on, and they don't know, like, they don't know about the bad, they don't know about his imprisonments, they don't know about, you know, his support of Castro's regime and all the other stuff, they just think that he's, like, a, a freedom fighter. That's, like, um... Che Guevara was a, a smart, like, you know, commander. He was, he was a, you know, during the Cuban uh, Revolution, he was, you know, smart in his lot of his tactical decisions. Like when he derailed the Q the Batista's armored train, that was a very smart thing to do. Uh, but, you know, I would not necessarily say that he was a good person. So that was, um, that's, you know, what I think of Che Guevara. Yeah, when I went to Cuba, I actually saw statues of uh, Che Guevara. Yeah, well, Che was seen as almost like a god in Cuba. He's heavily idolized in Cuba. He's considered a national hero. He has like this whole mausoleum yeah. thing um, dedicated to Shay in Cuba. It's like it's massive. Oh, uh, so he was a military officer in Cuba. Oh, no, he was a revol. He was a. He wasn't even from Cuba. He was from Argentina, but he was like a. He was like a big revolutionary. Oh. He 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 fought in Africa also. He fought. He was like he fought in the thing of the Dominic. Uh, no, the um. Not the Medi I want to say Dominican, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I think that's here. He fought there also. He fought in the Congo. So he served in Africa and he served in um, uh, in Cuba and uh, in and in South American Bolivia. What's this one? Paris. But also, Shea. Um. Uh. Uh. What 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 Shea actually did was a lot of people don't know this. Shea actually lashed out at the Cubans who actually left Cuba. So when Castro initiated his communist like uh, reforms and all, I shouldn't even call them reforms. You know. It was a, um, tyranny. When Castro initiated his communist tyranny on Cuba, a lot of Cubans ended up fleeing, and, and they left the country. 
And what actually happened was Shea um, accused those people of being like traitorous capitalists, and he accused them of being um, he accused them of being in league with Batista, which that wasn't true. You know, there's plenty of revolutionaries who fought against the dictatorship in Cuba, who um, uh, who fought actually on Castro's side, who Castro ended up betraying him later on. There's people who didn't want to live under tyranny in that, and so he he basically said that the revolution doesn't benefit them, and so they flee. So that's what uh, Che fought of people who left Cuba. So that was. Um, there, but it's like I said, the, the people who idolize him, like, and consider him, like, you know, this big hero, if they knew a bit more about him, um, uh, you know, I think that they would, uh, you know, they would drop the hero worship of him. Yeah, you know, thank you for that yeah, super sorry. chat, Boombox. Wait, are we delivering this wagon now? Or are we General Patton this? also died via drunk driver. No, I will, did he? I know General Patton I got hit by a train, that's what happened. I don't know if his driver was drunk, but he got hit by a train. Uh, thank you, Edgy. No, no. From what I've heard, he got hit by another by another by another driver. Was it a driver? A, um... I think he got hit by a train. Well, I, well, he died like shortly after World War II, so he he didn't live very long after the war. Um, you think? Yeah, he died in December of '45. Oh, so yeah, so he saw the end of the war, but he didn't live very long on, until after it. You think the Vietnam War and, games and would make a comeback? Uh, I don't know. I don't know about that. Um, uh, thank you for the super chat there, Eclipse. There aren't there aren't too many Vietnam War games, nor there's um uh, I don't know if there's necessarily a demand for them. Um, I think that there might be like more of a demand for World War One games because World War One wasn't as covered. I'm not saying I wasn't saying the soldiers are bad at all. I'm mad at the government how they treated the Vietnam veterans. Oh, I I agree with you. Um, uh, Pearl, have you heard the Ukrainians retook her son? Yes, I heard about that. Um, uh, and and the thing is though is that the I tell you the Russian military is just a giant joke. It's you know it's incompetent as hell, and it's like um you know I'm not you know I'm not scared of the Russian military anymore. Um uh, you know I thought that the Russian military was this big scary force, but you know they're just a giant joke is what they are. You know they're they've you know had setback after setback, and it's good you know the Ukrainians are retaking their country and they're kicking them out. So it's um uh, but the uh. Yeah, the and the, and the and the Russians are claiming that everything's going according to plan. They're claiming there was a planned withdrawal. Everything is going according to plan. Everything, every single time they have a setback, every single time they lose a battle, it's always going according to plan. They never admit defeat. They never admit any of that stuff. But it's not going good for them. So it's uh, you'll have to see. Hopefully the war ends soon, and you know this you know horrible conflict comes to an end. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't, uh, but about your comment, Jimmy, yes, um, uh, it was, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of, like, a, um, uh, oh, there's a bot? Where's the bot? I'm sorry. Didn't Bolivia become a socialist state? Well, it, I think, I think Bolivia was a non-aligned country, but it wasn't necessarily allied with the U.S., but it wasn't, like, Venezuela, um, Hey, Trio, how much money do you have in the game? In Red Death? Yeah. Uh, 194 pounds. Uh, you were correct about most of the conflict, the high-altitude Kashmir conflict. Um, uh, Israel helped out India during the war. One thing you missed was the Kashmir genocide. Oh, well, I, I, don't, I didn't know about that, um, really. I, I don't know India's history um, a lot, but I'm, I'm really sorry that that happened. That, that's yeah, really hard. be getting paid well. I, I just know that Kashmir is a very disputed, like, you know, part of the world, and it's, like, a very dangerous land, but I didn't know about that. I, I, I you, you know, your comments, like, are going to encourage me to read more up on it, and I'll read more up on the conflict. Is that the um, piece of land between uh, India and Pakistan? It's very, it's the north of India, and it's, like, it borders, like, India, Pakistan, and it's also, like, um, China claims part of it. Uh... But it's like a very dangerous part of the world because it's so like it's so disputed. Because I think as soon as the British left India, they from the war. Did you hear that some people in the U.S. were upset about that Cuban revolution last year? Well, I wouldn't call it a revolution. It was more of just um, it was it was a bunch of protests. But you know, the 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 thing is though is I I find it so stupid how like you you can have some total idiot, some total moron on Twitter who can just look at somebody in Cuba that doesn't have enough to eat and protesting against the government and just lash out at them. 
Like, you know, what kind of a moron does that? Like, you know, somebody who sits in the West comfortably, all the food that they can imagine, you know, ha sits on their computer, has their iPhone, and is going to criticize people in Cuba who protest against the government, saying that they don't know what they're pro pe people like. I just think it's personally stupid that so many people defend the Cuban government and say that it's a it's a good government. They just they they like communism. That's basically what it is. They think communism is a good system, and they're stupid. Uh, they don't understand, you know, the suffering that you know Cubans have to deal with. They don't understand the tyranny of it. They, and these these idiots who like support the Cuban government, I'll tell you though, is they, they they don't understand that without Cuba they wouldn't have their Twitter, they wouldn't have their iPhone. Um, if they lived under Cuba, they wouldn't have their uh, they wouldn't have their Twitter, they wouldn't have their iPhone, they wouldn't have all the other stuff. So it's just you know a bunch of dumb people. That's just what I'll say about it. I meant no res disrespect to veterans or people in the military. No, I I understand, Jimmy. I I know. I know. I, I I think I I figured you were talking about the military industrial complex. I just didn't know what you were what you were saying exactly with your with your um uh, with your comment. But yeah, like like uh, Vietnam veterans were treated horribly, like you know horribly by the government and by the public. Like Vietnam veterans have suffered so much. Um, it was it was like World War II My veterans had like were coming back from the war and they were getting loans on houses like houses were being built for them. Um, it was just uh, but like Vietnam veterans didn't have all of that. They didn't have that warm welcoming that like that World War II and Korean War veterans had had. And so they were treated like garbage. Like a lot of a lot of Vietnam veterans have like massive depression. They're um, they you know a lot of them had committed suicide tragically. And it was um, uh, uh, oftentimes whenever you see a homeless veteran, it's most of the time it's a Vietnam veteran, and it's just because it's how badly they were treated. It 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 breaks my heart. It's horrible. And it, and it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what you think of the war it doesn't matter whether you think the war was justified or unjustified the point is a lot of these guys that were that fought in the Vietnam War had no choice they were drafted they were forced to fight it was that or jail and so it just you know to treat them like garbage and call them baby killers anybody you know anybody who you know call them a baby killer has no respect in my uh, in my eyes the person's a complete idiot um, but uh, let me uh, let me uh, let me uh, trio you said you needed help selling right I can help you with that now. Thank you. Oh, would you like me? To, would you like to uh, send me an invite to uh, Trio? Yeah, I'll send you one. Thank you. All right. Okay, invite me when you get the chance. You're good with the volume. Well, thank you, DW. Yeah, that's that's. That that is literally when 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 and and I'll tell you something like when I was growing up, in, do you know what my my father would always say to me when I was growing up? My father would always say to me, he said he said that there should be communism in America for just one day. My father isn't a communist; he hates communism. But he says that there should be communism in America just for one day, just so that people see what it's it, it's like. And he said that that if they experienced it just for even one day, he said that they would they would uh, realize just how terrible it is. And so that's um. That's that. It's like it's, it's like pe people are living in like a, a fantasy land in their in their in their minds. They never lived under it, and so it just it disgusts me so much when they never lived under that system. And then they can say that they can say that it was a good system and that it works and you know all the other stuff. Um, hey trio, I think you're gonna have to make your uh, posse a little. But bit I'll tell you something. Not like you, join. you know, I'll tell you something. The same the same people who like call American soldiers in Vietnam baby killers are the same people that like praise the Viet Cong as freedom fighters and they think the Viet Cong were like good people and like the Viet Cong were you know murderers they were you know cold-blooded killers they were terrorists is what they were because um you know that a terror basically the definition of a terrorist is somebody who kills and instills fear for a political ideology and that's what the Viet Cong were the Viet Cong hid within a civilian population they pretended to be civilians you know, they would put bombs in, you know, unexpected places. They would set the traps. Whenever you see the traps in movies and, like, games, the Viet Cong were the ones who set the traps. And the, the worst thing was getting captured. Like, if you were an American soldier and you got captured in, Viet, in Vietnam, the Viet Cong were going to torture you to death. You had a very little chance. You, you had a greater chance of surviving if you got captured by the North Vietnamese. And the North Vietnamese were, were, army was also very brutal. But the Viet Cong were even worse. If you got captured by the... the uh, and teleport me in the, in the um, business when you get the chance. But if you got captured by the Viet Cong, it was almost always a death sentence. It was just horrible. Um, the torture was just come. terrible. You, you need to come to camp, bro. Hang on, I'm getting attacked right now. Where'd you guys go? Now you guys disappeared off the map since you guys are gone now and then not able to I've join sent, the posse. I've sent, I've sent you an invite, Michael. Okay.
Oh, I, I don't think that anybody should be, you know, I don't think anybody should be attacked on, you know, how they vote, Mario. It's people, people okay. vote how they want to vote, but, you know, it's, um, you know, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I cannot imagine, honestly, I can't imagine how, like, you know, a Cuban immigrant feels when he comes to America and he sees, like, he sees, like, um, you know, people, Americans, that say that communism in Cuba is a success and they think that it's, they think that it works. I don't know how, like, um, uh, that... <laughs> But um, yeah, and and what I, what I'll say about it is that like like if you watch my Godfather two like videos like Godfather two, I'll be talking a lot about Cuba's history and stuff like that. And, and Cuba like it, Cuba has just like a such a sad history. It's a, such a sad story because it just it goes from dictatorship to dictatorship. Like it's just like that. It like like it has had a series of corrupt governments in its history, and it's just um, it, it just it's just really bad. But like but the thing about it is that. Typic typically, well, what will happen is that if you if you criticize the Cuban government, what will happen is the people who support the, the uh, Cuban revolution and support the you know the Castro regime, they will typically accuse that person of being a Batista supporter. And B Batista was basically a dictator of Cuba. He was a dictator of Cuba before um, Castro. So Cuba was a dictatorship before Castro came to power. It became another dictatorship under Castro. But Batista was a scumbag. He's a terrible person, and he deserved to get overthrown. He did. You know the people were right to overthrow him. But the thing about it is that not everybody who fought in the Cuban Revolution had supported, uh, had, had, you know, been a communist. A lot of people who fought in the Cuban Revolution, they wanted democracy. They wanted Cuba to transition to, you know, a free and fair country. They didn't want it to, you know, turn into a communist, you know, Castro regime. And, like, and, you know, and Castro fooled a lot of people because when, you know, nobody knew that Castro was a communist. It was like, you know, even the Soviets didn't even know he was a communist. So it was, um, uh, it was, and when Castro announced that he was a communist, the Soviets were so surprised by that because they weren't even prepared for an ally in the West. So it was, uh, it was that, but... Yeah, but Batista was just, you know, a scumbag. He deserved to get overthrown. But just because, just because, you know, you oppose the uh, Castro regime doesn't mean that you're some supporter of Batista. Like, Batista was, a, you know, an awful, evil person as well. So, I, I think, you know, why, why do you have to settle with one dictator? Why is it that you support one dictator or the other? Why, why not get rid of Castro and get rid of Batista, get rid of both dictators? So that's it, you know. Batista was also the dictator in Cuba that brought the mafia in, so he had the mafia come in and they built like casinos and stuff like that. And so it's in The Godfather 2 they show it pretty well, but yeah. But you know, it makes me very surprised that they went to a communist country. What country? Oh, hey, Steve. Cuba. I went to Cuba. Oh. Well, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Americans aren't allowed to travel there. You're, you're from Canada, right? So you're, uh, that's why you got, um, you're, you're allowed to go there. I don't think, you know, I don't think the U.S. government should be telling Americans where they can and can't travel. I think that's personally stupid. Um, but it's, uh, but it's, yeah, um, I've seen the, um, yeah. I've seen the, uh, the Cubans say before and stuff that they, um, this is like back in 2014. They kept saying that they don't welcome Americans, but they welcome Canadians. That's what they kept saying. <coughs> Castro originally did good things, but then it developed into hysteria. Well, it's it's like I said, Castro Castro was considered a freedom fighter during the revolution, and like nobody knew, like nobody really knew what his true political viewpoint. Like his political viewpoints were all over the place, and then like and then like a year after he had um uh, you know a year after he had taken power, he declared himself a communist, declared Cuba like a socialist state. Um, yeah. And also, what a lot of people what a lot of people don't talk about is they don't talk about Castro's crackdown on the Catholic Church. Like Castro went really, he he really went after the Catholic Church in Cuba. Like he Castro tried as hard as possible to make Cuba like a state atheist state. And this is coming from somebody who's an agnostic. I'm not even you know um, you know religious person, but I'm just saying he he like he went after Catholics really badly, and he went after the church. You know he discriminated against people, and I'm not even I'm not even talking about like the the rich you know people that are in the church. I'm talking about like the average you know everyday Cuban. Like if you were like if you were like um you know religious person, you know Castro would go after you. So it is uh, a lot of people don't mention that. Why can't Americans travel to Cuba because of the embargo? Americans can also not travel to North Korea. Yeah, Mar well, um, the, the 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 travel ban to North Korea is North Korea's ban. I don't think I don't think I don't think the U.S. government restricted Americans from going to North Korea, but I think it was North Korea who banned all Americans from its some um, uh, country. Yeah, because some American guy attacked a soldier. I think it was. He he. Wait, what? 
I, I don't know if I'm right, I might be wrong, but I think it was like an incident between an American tourist and like a soldier or something. No, it wasn't about that. It was an American student that was visited North Korea, and when he was when he was in the hotel, he tried to take one of the North Korean propaganda posters, and they caught him on camera doing it, and he got put on a show trial, and basically, like, Otto had no chance at that trial. He had no chance of being found guilty. That trial was rigged from the start, and they were... North Korea's entire goal in that trial is they were just... It was done to humiliate and attack America. That was just basically... This is... There was basically them saying, this is what we do to Americans. That's what what Otto's, um, you know, trial was, was about. It was a show trial. North Korea was trying to scare Americans. And so, you know, they, you know... He took a poster, but it's just, you know... He got sentenced to, what, like, five or ten years hard labor for a poster? That's, like, that's that's insanity. And like, 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 Is he still there, no? like, no, he, he passed away. He, um, uh, he, uh, he, he, he was there. He was in the North Korean, like, work camp for some time. And then he came, he was in a, put in a coma. He got, he, he, the conditions in the, in the work camp in North Korea put him in a coma. And then the North Koreans released him. And then when they released him, he died in the U.S. From, uh, in his coma. So that was like, it was just, I, I don't know what they did to him that he got put in a coma. But that was like, uh, uh, that just shows okay, you this, okay. this, this psychotic, like, the psychotic, View of the North Korean government, so like never go to that country. I'm actually gonna have I'm actually gonna have a lore video on North Korea specifically in the future when I finish Mercenaries. So when I play Mercenaries Playground Destruction, uh, when I I'm gonna play it again because I played it like two two years ago. When I play it again, I'll have a whole like lore video on like North Korea and like comparing like you know the um, the regime in the game and like um, you know talking about it in real life and stuff like that. But that's when I complete Mercenaries again because Mercenaries takes place in North Korea. That's where that game takes place. Um, yeah, looking forward to seeing an open world military game again. Hey, Sevi, how are you? Was Imran Zakaya from Modern Warfare a psychopath? Um, I don't know if he was a psychopath, Jimmy. Um, he was, you know, definitely like a cold-blooded, you know, killer. Um, no, I, I actually, no, I don't think he was a psychopath because he loved his son. So, you know, psychopaths don't love anyone. So, no, he wouldn't be a psychopath. Makarov is a psychopath, on the other hand. Yeah, Makarov's a psychopath. So, that's what I would say. Raul Menendez was definitely a sociopath, I think, from Black Ops 2. Yeah. Because he had for his family, like his sister. Yeah, but the, the thing is, though, is that, you know, as, as bad of a situation as that, as that was, um, uh, ultimately, that was uh, Raul's fault, not Woods' fault. Because how was, you know, how was Woods supposed to know that, like, in that room that his sister was in there? And, you know, Woods was being kind of reckless in that. But you also have to put yourself in Woods' shoes. Like, Woods got tortured by Raul, like, really badly. And then Raul, like, you know, Raul has, like, this personal vengeance against um, uh, Woods and Mason. But the thing is, Raul is the one who started it in the first place. Because Woods was captured, and Woods didn't do anything to him. You know, he's just a prisoner of war. And, you know, and literally Menendez had tortured him, left him in that container to rot. And so, you know, you can't imagine, like, the type of suffering that Woods had to go through. And the second that, like, Woods saw Menendez, he just saw red. He was going to kill him. And so, like, you can't really blame Woods for having that state of mind at the same time. You know, he was furious. So it was ultimately, yeah. like, I would, I would blame it ultimately in Raul. Like, Woods is somewhat at fault, I would say. I would say maybe 30% of the fault is on Woods, but 70% of it is in Raul's fault. So that's what I would say about, like, the whole situation Menendez and Woods in Black Ops 2. Yeah, because um, cause Woods' um, men were uh, killed. Yeah, killed he butchered, right. like, you know, uh, Woods' men. So it was, like, it was it, that. He was also left to rot. With his yeah, and, and the thing is, Menendez didn't care about all those people that he tortured and killed. He didn't care whether those soldiers had families or anything like that. But then, you know, it would happen to him. You know, he, he went all absolute crazy. And, I'm, and his sister was an innocent victim, you know, to be fair. But it was, you know, it, I, I blame Menendez ultimately for that whole situation in Black Ops 2. It's his fault. Yeah, definitely. He's a villain after all. Hey, Pro, I know there really aren't comparable, but what's your favorite story to compare between GTA 4 and Red Dead Redemption 2? Um, another story that's I'd like to... I would say Saints Row 2, maybe? Like, Saints Row 2 was another really good gangster storyline that came out the same time as GTA 4. That was a really good one, too. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, funny story just happened. What? When I was registered to the trio's gang right here, I had I had my horse on and I didn't see the train coming and not kill my horse. Have you watched the movie Platoon? I have seen Platoon a long time ago. That was that that movie with Charlie Sheen was in it. I think it was me. yeah, Charlie Sheen was. In hopefully it. the other horse is fine. But I'll play it. Black Ops Two in the future. 
I have a question. Do you work out? Yes, I work out every three days. Should I go along the bridge here? Uh, yeah, you just going to have to be very careful um, that it doesn't get run over by a train. Yeah, I'm going. Ahead. Okay, well. I mean, being put in a container with a bunch of dead corpses of people you knew wouldn't exactly make anybody very happy. I understand Woods being reckless getting so close to Menendez. Yeah. Hey, Menendez, you can Imagine me go halfway into the bridge and the just starts to come. Uh, you're good. You know, I, you know what I always thought was weird about it is like, um, uh, I always, you know what I always thought was really weird about it was like the, like, Menendez's relationship to Mason's son, I always found that kind of weird, like, like, it was like, it was, it was almost like, it was almost like Menendez, like, I don't know, it's almost like he saw Mason as like a son or so, his son as like his own son or something like that. It was it was like weird, like the way he the way he talked to like uh, to Mason's son, like when when he was on the ship, remember that he's like he's like I want to talk to Mason, just that like he, Mason was the only person he felt comfortable talking to. So it was that um I don't know, it was like that. It, I, I think I think more of it was he was he more he wanted to see he wanted Mason's son to see what he was gonna cause. I think that's more of what it was about. Uh, hey Toby. I don't know. I don't know if maybe it was some some guilt they killed that he got his father killed. Hi, that's Sebi. that, but it was. Hi, um, Sebi. Hi, Sebi. Good night, Jess. Good night, everyone. Will you do another Mega Man play for? I still gotta play the Misadventures of Tron Bon when I get the chance. Um, hey, Pat. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I posted a comment in, um, your oh, careful, careful, monthly, careful, careful, monthly Wait, 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 hang on a second, video. Sebi. Wait, wait, Trio, whenever you c come across this turn in the future, always go very slow on this turn, because this turn, people lose their, their, their cargo on this turn. This is, I've seen numerous accidents here. People take too much of a sharp turn, and the wagon gets flipped here. So just, um, just, uh, yeah, yeah. just yeah. be aware of that this turn in the future, this awesome. corner. So when you go through here, go yeah. slow. You can you can start going faster now, but I'm just saying on the turn there, you always want to go slow. Yeah. Because I've seen so many wagons get destroyed on this turn. Yeah, sorry, Papa. It's okay, it's your sale. It's um it's fine. It's gonna be gangs at the hideout. My name is Patrick, yes. But Pat. Maybe Menendez knew how terrible it was to lose family, so Menendez tried to make some kind of fatherly role in Mason's life after his father died. Maybe. Um Hey, Chess. Pro, have you ever tried to exercise called planking? Yes, I've done planking before. Actually, I actually find planking to be like the easiest exercise that you can do. It's like the easiest one. Like people, some people might disagree with me and say it's really hard, but no, I found planking kind of easy because planking, you don't really have to do anything. You just basically just, pl uh, I guess it is the position called plank. But you just, you know, just lay down and you just, you know, you stay kind of like, I don't know, you, you basically just hold yourself in like a specific position. So you don't even have to move, you just hold yourself in a specific position. And I know it works out like, you know, I think upper body and stuff like that, but it's, um, uh, yeah. So planking is like very, I would say it's the easiest exercise to do. Oh, it definitely makes you tiring, but it, yeah. Oh, what the? Oh, look at that. Whoa. Yeah, wow, that was, that was a like, crazy one. I've never seen that happen before. How long can I, how long can I actually do on the plank? Oh, um, if I wanted to, I could probably, I could probably hold a plank for more than two minutes. Oh, that'd be true. Yeah, I could probably go longer than that. If I really push myself, I could probably go longer than that. I've done it before. It's, I, don't I think find, the longest it's, I've it, been it, to, it, it, it's, I think it's about four to five minutes. Yeah. Do you know what I actually, you know, you know what I actually found to be easier when you're planking? Like, it's like, um, uh, what I found to be easier is when you, um, when you watch a video. That's what I found easier. Like, I would, I, what I would always do when I, I didn't, haven't done planking in some time, but when I did, you know, work out and I, uh, planking specifically, when I did do that in the past, I would just watch, like, a video. So I would have, like, a video playing on my phone and I would just have it down right in front of me as I was, like, you know, down on the floor. And so I'd just focus on the video and just not try to focus about, like, you know, the pain of working out. And so that was just, um...
this might be a really good payout. Yeah, there's gonna be gangs at the, at the place. But Pat, I um I made a comment in your monthly update video saying um keep up the good work. Oh. And it showed um a fake account of you replying to me. And Was it, it some said, telegram oh, thing? Support. Um no, it just said it, it had like a phone number that That's I should call for, for for like a free gift or something. Oh, it it's a that. scam. Yeah. It's a scam. I, che I checked out the channel and it only had like one subscriber. Yeah, it's a scam. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have that happen to one of my comments on one of the uh, videos as well. I just report it for misinformation. That's what I do. Uh, this is enemies here, by the way, when you show up. That's not been. I told you guys, because if. You, you, oh. Oh, zombie, you got me. What? Do you want to write down the stuffy? I have, uh, is this, um... Do you want to write uh, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, This sure. is, a, you know, like a friends, no okay. shooting friends thing. On. I said then, do you want to join the stuffy? I don't know, it doesn't make any sense. Damn, there's so many of them, okay. That's what happens when you play this. Yeah. We are just making me turn, turn off the... Turn on the free. Uh, Thank you. Okay, there we go. That's everyone down. Okay. Uh, let me look at the comments again. Scam the what? Uh, there's a scam that's going around. Where people specifically, like, um, uh, people will, like, the bot accounts that will say, like, congratulations, you won on Telegram, and just, you know, all that stuff is a scam. Um. I just, I just screenshotted the, um. Don't let people rush the, you. Uh, your only job is to create, to um, uh, uh, good content and be the best you that can be. Thank you, David. Since you are part Polish, what are your thoughts about Ukraine banning the movie, Polish movie, Volin? Uh, well, it's, it's, it would be called Volin in Polish, um, because Polish is W, because it criticized UPA uh, nationalist Bandera, uh, led a genocide against yeah, the Poles. Yeah, take a look at that. Um, yes, um, uh, I, 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 I heard about them, I haven't seen the movie, but I know about the historical event that you're talking about, and I think that, you know, it's, you know, stupid that they banned it. I don't think, you know, you know, I don't think you can censor history like that. Um, you know, I, I support Ukraine today as a country, but you know that that movie was you know about like a um, you know that was movie was during World War II. Was Ukrainian nationalists during World War II was you know Bandera's people. They did some horrible things to Poles um, that lived in the Volin region. It was um, really really bad. Um, but I didn't know that the movie was banned. This is the first time I'm hearing that it was banned. I heard about the I I never seen that movie before, but I know that it was um uh, you know a very popular movie in Poland. Oh yeah, that's the that's Have damn. you seen the Pianist movie? That's my only reference of Poland in um uh, in World War Two. Um, it was um uh, I've seen the Pianist before. I've seen that movie a long time ago. That's a really messed up movie. You know he you know he hid in the city and just you know see everyone die and like it showed what Warsaw became like Warsaw became the most destroyed city in um uh, the, like one of the most destroyed cities in the world like Warsaw was like completely obliterated like after the Warsaw uprising like you know Hitler ordered the entire city to be burned to the ground and so very little of Warsaw actually survived it was such a such a destroyed city this is, the pianist shows that really well like what happened to the city. Uh, Yeah, well, I, I don't think I don't think anyone should be you know I don't think anyone should be censoring history whether that's the you know the U.S. the Russians the Ukrainians the Poles um, Germans um, uh, you know everybody should tell history as you know what happened and so I didn't know that that movie was banned this is that movie was banned in Ukraine but you know that movie was about like a um, uh, for people that don't know what happened it was um you know during World War Two there was like um uh, you know. There was this extremist faction called UPA, which was led by Bandera, and so, you know, they they did some, you know, they they murdered like a lot of Polish people. They they killed a lot of you know Polish people. This was this happened in the Volin region, and uh, it's just a really bad event. It's a very you know horrible time in Polish history, but uh, you know, 
I support Ukraine as a country today in their struggle against Russia, but uh, nobody should be, you know, denying history. So I didn't know that they banned that movie. This is, you know, the first time I'm hearing about this. Uh, Have you ever seen the um, the film Darkest Hour? Bro? Darkest Hour? No, I know the film that you're talking about. Um, uh, that was the um, uh, the the film that you're talking about. It was um, it was the movie about Winston Churchill, and it was like it was when when it was it was like right at the beginning of World War Two, right? Yeah, just after the fall of France. Well, during the fall of France. It basically tells the story of what was happening in the government during um, the war, at the beginning of the war, during the time France surrendered in an article film. Uh. Pro, have you seen the movie um, An Anthropoid? No, I haven't. A lot of countries, um, uh, a lot of countries today, unfortunately, like, um, uh, a lot of countries today, unfortunately, like, um, uh, they, uh, a lot of country governments today and, like, schools and stuff like that, a lot of countries will censor history. Like, um, you know, World War II, for instance, is, ha is, is taught, um, pretty well in Germany, but in a country like Japan, for instance, in Japan, it's not, you know, it's not taught you know, to the full extent. Um, in Japan, they, uh, in J Japan, for instance, they ignore, like, a lot of the atrocities that the Imperial Japanese had committed, uh, when they're talk covering specifically World War II. In Turkey, for instance, when, in schools, you know, they're, they, they're taught a more positive view of the Ottoman Empire. They're taught, like, the Ottoman Empire was a good thing, when the Ottoman Empire was not a good thing. And a lot of schools in Turkey don't teach the Armenian Genocide which the Armenian Genocide is a horrible event. It was, you know, one of the Ottoman Empire's greatest crimes. Um, and the, in Russia, for instance, in Russia, they don't teach the Holodomer um, fully, which that was like, um, th that's basically where like 7 million Ukrainians died. Um, it was under Stalin. It was in the 1933, I think that's when it happened. It was a really bad time in um, Ukraine's history. And, you know, and in Ukraine also, like, the, I don't know how Ukrainian schools teach, like, the, the Volin Massacre, but that was, like, um, uh, you know, that, that's happened during World War II, and that was, like, you know, every country, every country should teach its, its history, and every country should admit to the bad things that they did. Uh, but... A lot of people argue in Britain that uh, British people don't learn enough about the Empire and stuff. I think that every, you know, people should learn their history, and um, I think people should, uh, I think history should be taught, like, um, uh, I think history should be taught in, like, a, a balanced view, and that every, everything, every good thing, you know, the good things and the bad things should be covered. I don't think it should just, you know, have good things and, you know, ignore the bad things totally. You know, what way is that to teach history? Because you're bound to repeat the same mistakes again if you don't teach, learn from it. Um, so moonshine sold a fifth five minutes. Yeah, that, that doesn't, doesn't in the United States, don't they, um... Uh, do uh, this uh, the American Civil War and, and history class? They mm -hmm. must talk about that a lot, though, right? Yes, um, oh, but, it, it, the, but the, the thing the thing about America is that every state in America teaches, you know, has different curriculum. So it's um, uh, but that's but that's basically the foundation of America is states' rights. So it's like you know, states are gonna you know do a lot of different things. But the thing is, though, states teach different histories um uh, and so you know they'll teach the same event but states might not necessarily teach it in the same way that's what it um uh, it might be like like i probably they're probably you know the civil war is probably taught differently in mississippi than like in um uh you know new york i'm not saying that they justify it but they're probably um uh you know i don't think they ju i don't know if they i don't think they justify the confederacy as well but they probably teach it a very different way. It's not taught like in New York. Like when I was, I'm, I'm from New York, so you know, Civil War is taught very differently um, between states. Um. Could I please have an invite to the posse? Uh, sure, I'll invite you. Uh, uh, oh, he knows his, oh, uh, all right, Trio ended his posse and he started up here. Do you, um, do you need to sell Moonshine or anything since we're at the Moonshine check? How much do you know about Southeast Asia in World War II? How about Japan going uh, on dominating spree there? Um, well, what happened was Vietnam was a colony of, um, of, of France. And then what happened was um, uh, Japan invaded it. 
and the Vichy government, which was the puppet government in France, the Nazis had had uh, told them to uh, uh, told them to allow it, and so the uh, the puppet government in France, you know, was okay with the Japanese invading Vietnam, and then the um, uh, I know I don't know much about Laos and Cambodia during World War II. But I know that Japan had occupied Burma during World War II, and so there's like big battles between like the British and uh, the Japanese in Burma. Also, I think the Americans also fought in Burma, but there's some pretty big battles there. In the movie Rambo 4, there's actually an exploded British bomb in World War II that he uses. Um, and um, at Thailand, I, I think Thailand was a monarchy, your country, uh, Patrick. Um, uh, but I know that Thailand was, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think Thailand was the one country in that region that was more friendly to Japan. But I think, I think didn't Thailand have like a puppet government? So I, I don't know. I don't know that, uh, that much about that. But I know that Thailand was the one country, I think, that was more friendly to Japan in Southeast Asia than the other countries. Um, Japan Do you know the movie Come and See? I've never seen Australia. that movie, Edgy. Didn't Minamar ban Rambo 4 because they hated being portrayed as villains? Yes, well, Minamar is a dictatorship, so it's, um... Always cool joining your streams pro to get on Red Dead. Thank you, Slim. Thanks, man. Like, they'll avoid talking about Pearl Harbor. No, I, I think I think in Japanese schools, they'll talk about things like Pearl Harbor, but they... And they'll talk about, like... Japanese schools, like for like, okay, like the way that Japan teaches World War II, they'll they'll teach they'll teach students about like the major battles and stuff like that, and you know how the war ended and everything like that. But what they won't cover in schools in Japan is they won't cover the atrocities that the Japanese committed. They won't cover like you know the the the, the mass killings, the mass rapes, like you know stuff like that. The um uh, the forced labor. You know, because the J Japan had kidnapped, like, Japan kidnapped hundreds of thousands of Koreans, uh, Chinese, Vietnamese, um, uh, Taiwanese, um, uh, plenty of people, Indonesians, a lot of people from different countries, Malaysians, and, you know, used forced labor on them. So there is, like, you know, parts of that that they're not necessarily going to cover in schools. No, I haven't seen the movie. I've seen the old movie, the old movie All Quiet on the Western Front, but I, I haven't, like, um, seen the new movie. I've seen the old... I've seen the 1930s movie and the 1970s movie, but I have I, I yet to see the new one. Um, I know Hitler doesn't like that book because he, um, if they create war, it was, like, all violence and stuff. I think he banned it. Yes, Hitler yeah. banned All Quiet on the Western Front. That is true. Um, and I don't know what happened to the... Uh, the offer was a German, so I don't know what happened to him during World War II. I'd have to look that up. Um, but basically, a lot of the people, All Quiet on the Western Front is like one of my favorite books that I've read. Like that, was, that, was, that book was a masterpiece, and so is like, um, uh, uh, you know, Animal Farm and, and All Quiet on the Western Front are two books that I really like. Um, but the thing about All Quiet on the Western Front is people don't understand like the point of that book. They don't understand the point of it because it's been made into a movie, but they don't understand the message in the uh, in the in the movie. The 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 book and the movie are it's it's basically what is the message? The message is anti-war. That's what it is. It shows you the horrors of war and shows you how war is just a stupid thing. Uh, and basically in that book, like in the book, I read it so many years ago, like 10 years ago, but I remember the main character in the book, him and his friends are like, you know, school kids and their teacher is like, you know, big propaganda guy. And so their teacher is telling them, you know, go and fight for, you know, the German empire and, you know, go and, you know, we're going to get land for, you know, it's going to be like an honorable war and everything like that, and blah, 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 this. And they're, all the students were like rushing to join the war effort. They were rushing to like get to the front lines to fight for Germany and all the other stuff. And then when they actually got to the war, they saw how horrible it was. They didn't expect that. They didn't expect, you know, the mass killing, the poison gas, the artillery constantly blowing up, boom, 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 over that, over and over again. They didn't expect, like, the brutality of, you know, heads getting blown off and all this other stuff. So the, the, the kids quickly ch changed their tune, you know. They were so patriotic before, but they changed, quickly changed their tune. And so the point of the book was to show, like, it shows how, like, this ridiculous, like, you know, patriotism that, you, like, pushed these kids into the war and just, they, they, they basically, they didn't even know what they were fighting for. Like, in all quite on the Western Front, they didn't even know what they were fighting for. They didn't know what the war was about. I doubt that they even knew about, like, the assassination of France to Ferdinand. They just knew they had to fight. They didn't even know what the, 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 the whole purpose of the war was and everything like that. But, you know, they were taught all these bad things about the enemy and everything like that when they realized the enemy is just like them. They don't understand why they're there also. And they're just, they're trying to survive. So that's, that's, that's why the Nazis hated All Quiet on the Western Front so much because they, 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 the end, All Quiet on the Western Front was an anti-war book. And so the Nazis were pro-war. The Nazis wanted to go on their conquest. And so that's why they banned the book. That's why they, they got rid of it. Uh, because they thought that it wasn't gonna, they thought that it was gonna, um, that people were gonna question the war and question them. And so that's, um, 
that's that. But all that that book is oh just my. a masterpiece, and it just shows you how you know, you know, ridiculous World War One was as a conflict, and you know, it's um. Hitler wanted like Hitler wanted like the idea of war to be honorable and like glorious and stuff, and that book like uh, was the opposite of that. Yeah, well, uh, hit you know you know. Hitler was like you know same prop. It was you know same dictator nonsense propaganda that they're that they're somehow you know fighting to defend Germany and that ever and and the thing about it is that is that do you know what it was is Hitler would constantly spin it to his people and he would claim that everyone is an aggressor to Germany he would claim that he would claim that all the other countries were aggressors he would claim that France and Britain was an aggressor he even claimed that Poland was an aggressor um, which was just ridiculous like Hitler Hitler was claiming that like Poles Polish people were like discriminating against Germans and that they were like doing ethnic cleansing of Germans. That's not true. There's no historical basis on that. There's no proof that Polish people were murdering Germans or anything like that. He used that as a clear excuse to just invade Poland and take Poland over. He wanted Poland. And so that's 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 what it was ultimately about. And then you had the you had the the Gluitz incident. The Gluitz incident is basically where a bunch of Nazi SS officers actually dressed up in Polish uniforms and they went and shot up like a German um, uh, base on the border. So that's what it was. So they were Nazi officers that dressed up as Polish soldiers. And that was to instigate a war. That was the whole. They, they found out about that after the war. But it was, um, uh, you know, it was just all propaganda, all you know, all stuff to try to justify his ridiculous, um, uh, his ridiculous conquest and his ridiculous ego too. Oh, it's. Uh... Man, I gotta, I gotta get my controller like, um, uh, uh, I gotta get my controller like checked out, but. Does anybody does anybody know how I can get what I can do about is my controller like busted cuz like my controller has gotten stick drift again so like this place this PlayStation controller is only oh. like how old is this PlayStation controller this PlayStation controller is like I would say like 7 months old and even though it's just 7 months old I'm getting stick drift now so you guys see how I'm like I'm turning to the left like it just keeps doing that and I I don't I hate stick drift. Does anybody know like about this in the comments? Like, is, am I able to get this fixed, or is my controller oh, um, busted at this point? Like, um, what, what, I hope what, I don't um, have to buy another controller. What, They're expensive, what, but it's just. Um... I remember what, the PS4 what, controllers. Like, they would wear out quite a bit. Yes, I'm PS5 Hold controller, down, so it's um, uh, it's uh. Like pull down on the analog sticks, and then sort of like blow inside it. And then uh, that's what I've done. It worked on the PS4. I haven't had it on the PS5 yet, but it worked on the PS4. It get rid of it temporarily, and then when it comes back, it's do anything. I never knew about all this in World War II. Thank you, Aussie guy. Yeah, so you know, Hit Hitler Hitler wanted some way to sell the war to his people, and so he sold you know he 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 sold the war to his people by basically claiming that everyone else was an aggressor. And and do you know what the ridiculous thing about it is? He he claimed several times that he wanted peace. That's like the most ridiculous thing about it. Like that that is just so ridiculous and so nonsense, so stupid. Uh, but he he would he claimed that Germany wanted peace and that all the other countries were being aggressors. It just and the, and the, do you know what the the really sad thing is? A lot of the German public believed it. They believed him on that. That's the that's the really sad thing that everyone else was an aggressor, and that he um uh it, it's just. And so this is this is why you know yeah, dictators you, um... dictators try to there there's a reason that dictators try to control the flow of information uh, because it's much easier to brainwash people and you know he had that um yeah so it, it's 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 you know that Hitler did offer peace to um, Britain no. well he was um uh, I don't I don't honestly don't believe that. Um, uh, it was only a matter of time until he was gonna attack Britain. I think, personally, I think that he wanted, he wanted to take the Soviet Union, and so he didn't want a distraction in the, in the West. And so afterwards, I think he would have turned his attention West. What do you think the war is it being like, how do you have invaders, like... Wait, what? Britain? What do you think the war is it being like if he never cancelled Operation Sea Lion? Because he would... He if, was wait, so you're saying what would have happened if he invaded Britain? Well, he was gonna invade Britain on September fifteenth, but he cancelled it indefinitely. So, like, what? Would if Hitler like invaded Britain, the war would have ended quicker, um, uh, because German Germany Germany was um, stretching its resources a lot and preparing them for Operation Barbarossa, which was to invade the Soviet Union. And so, if they tried to invade Britain and they they invaded the Soviet Union again, 
um, uh, that would they would the war would have lasted. And I, I don't I don't think that the Nazis would have been able to take Britain. I don't think they would have. Um, uh, Britain was like such a heavily fortified island at the time, and they were ready. They they thought the Nazis were gonna land any moment. They were ready, and they were gonna like you know. And and even if the Nazis landed, they would have to take the whole rest of the country, which I don't think that they would have done that. So what the Nazis tried to do instead is they tried to bomb the British into submission. They realized they couldn't conquer them, so they tried to bomb them into submission. So they would they would send those air raids over London, and so they would keep bombing them. It was called the Blitz, I think. That's what the air, uh, the um, air campaign yeah, you're was right. called. But it was um... uh, another another thing. Well, about that, um, because because um, the reason why like Hitler was so successful in conquering Europe is because of the Blitzkrieg, and the majority of the Blitzkrieg was used by tanks. He couldn't use tanks in Britain without getting them shipped over and probably sunk in the water. Yeah, but um. Yeah, I, I, I would say that, but it's, it, it's also, it, it, the, t the tactic of Blitzkrieg only works on the right environments, and like, you know, it wouldn't work in Britain because it's, you know, it's an island, um, you know, they would have to get all the tanks over, and so the battleships would probably get sunk, you know, the British would have r big artillery guns, big naval cannons to sink the battleships before they could dock any, like, tanks in the first place, uh, but, um, it was, uh, like, for instance, like, the the reason that the reason that Bl Germany's Blitzkrieg cam campaign was like so effective in Poland was because Poland is does not have like that many forests like there's forests to the south of Poland but Poland is largely like an, an agricultural country very farming country and so a lot of fields and so flatlands and so it's very easy for Germany just to move the tanks through that but what happened was Stalin actually tried to do Blitzkrieg as well and he failed Stalin tried to do Blitzkrieg in Finland so when he invaded Finland in the Winter War he tried to do the same thing he thought that it would work out just for him just like for it. it did for the Nazis originally, and so he, um, uh, but the, the difference is Finland is mountainous. It has forests. It's not, it, and, 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 and has a lot of muddy terrain in the winter time, especially. It's not like, it's not like Poland. And so because of that, the Soviet tanks got stuck in the mud in Finland. There was a lot of forests that would block them. And so it was the, the Stalin's attempt at Blitzkrieg in Finland was a massive disaster. Um, that's why the Soviet casualties were so high in, um, uh, in Finland. One of the reasons, um, I missed some comments, let me see here. From what I've known, yes, Thailand was forced to join their side, help conquer the neighbor countries, uh, an attempt declaring war against the U.S., but failed since Japan surrendered before doing so. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know much about that. I just know that Thailand, I think, was an ally of Japan during World War II, but I, I don't know more than that, though, Patrick. Um, you can get it fixed. Uh, oh, buy warranty and get a new one. Uh, uh, I, I don't even know. Do I, I even have warranty on this? I'd have to see. Um, my birthday is on, um, Pearl Harbor Day. Oh. Well, uh, your birthday is Decem December 7th. That's, that's, that would be Pearl Harbor. Thank you, David, for the super chat. Um. December 7th, 1941. Yes. A date which will live in infamy. And you know something, um, wait, uh, hi, Pearl, how's your day? Mine is good. Mine does too, but I always keep a spare. Thank you, Eric, for the sponsoring my channel again. Um. Thanks, man. Oh, uh, yes, they, um, yes, they did, uh, Mario. And, and the thing is, though, is, like, I honestly, like, you know, as, as, as bad as the Soviets were, you know, I always think that the Nazis were worse than the Soviets, much worse. Um, because the thing is, though, is that if, if the Nazis had, like, won the war, they would have killed hundreds of millions of people. Like, they would have ex exterminated entire nations of people, and they would have just settled Germans on that, on, on that land. Like, the Nazis were gonna, you know, kill off anybody that they didn't like. And so it was, um, you know, anybody that they didn't look, they didn't like how they looked, they would kill. Anybody who spoke against them that they, uh, uh would also get killed. So it was, um... You know, I, I would say, I would say the, the, I would say the Nazi regime is definitely like the, the worst, like, dictatorship in the 20th century. Definitely. Why did the Nazis not invade, um, uh, Sweden? Because they were, they invaded Norway. Oh, uh, I think it was Sweden declared itself a neutral state. I think that's why. Uh. So Sweden wouldn't allow Sweden wouldn't allow Allied aircraft to operate in its space, and I think it was the same thing for Switzerland, and so that was part of it. Um, but here's the thing about it is 
even though Switzerland, that's another country that was neutral, Switzerland declared itself actually a neutral state, and even though it declared itself a neutral state, um, what, uh, what happened was the Nazis were still planning on conquering Switzerland, even though it declared itself a neutral state. Like, you can go on Google and look up Nazi plans to invade Switzerland, and they actually did plan on invading Switzerland. Um, but the thing about it is that Switzerland was a heavily fortified country, so even though it was a neutral country, it had a very strong military. It was not weak by any chance, and so fit Switzerland is very mountainous, a lot of mountains, and so the Nazis knew if they invaded Switzerland that they that the resistance would be heavy and that there'd be a lot of mountain warfare, and so they, they, they didn't choose to invade Switzerland because of that reason. Um, Switzerland has like a militia history where people are part of the militia, and so pretty much everybody has to, uh, you know, join a militia, has to train, and so when, when there's a, if the, if the country gets invaded, they're able to mobilize a force very quickly because of that. So that's, um, that's the story with, um, uh, with Switzerland. Um, Uh, the Nazis also had an operation to invade Ireland called, called Operation Green. That's what their operation name was for the invasion of Ireland. No, I didn't. I didn't hear about that one, but I um uh, I know they plan on invading Britain. Uh, yeah, it's, it's called Operation Green, the invasion of Ireland. Hmm. I'm gonna put that one up. Yes, I'm gonna talk about that in my Saints Row reboot review. Yeah, and 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 the thing is though is. Is I, I didn't know about the coal part, but here's the thing about Switzerland is even though Switzerland was a neutral country It wasn't it, it it wasn't technically completely neutral And what I mean by that is that Switzerland actually took a lot of Nazi money So the Nazis had put money into Swiss banks And so the Nazis had put gold into Swiss banks and a lot of this was stuff that was stolen so it was stolen. So the Nazis would steal a lot of stuff when they invaded countries. And so Switzerland in their banks had a lot of this. And a lot of this stuff was not found to this day. Like a lot of art and other stuff that they stole was not found to this day. And so a lot of people speculate that Switzerland was actually hiding it in their banks. Uh, so that's um, uh, that's the story with that. So people don't know that about Swiss um, uh, history, that a lot of their banks were involved with the Nazis. Uh, my favorite historical period is Prohibition. I've always found the Mafia interesting. Thank you, Poison Soda. Um, I, I like that time period too. Like, and I think I would love to see a game in that time period in the 1920s, like, you know, open world game like in Chicago or something, 1920s. Like, the closest thing I've gotten to that is Empire of Sin, but Empire of Sin, technically it's open world, but it's it's, it's a strategy game. It's not like, um, uh, you know, I wanted to see like an actual like open world like um, Mafia game in the 20s. I think that'd be cool. But my favorite time period personally is the French Revolution. That's my favorite uh, time period personally. Um, um, pro, do you like Manhunt? Uh, I, I've seen some gameplay of Manhunt in the past, I gotta play it again in the future. No, no, I mean like, I mean on Red Dead, I mean like the, uh, the event on Red Dead. Oh, no, I don't. I, I hate that event. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, your PS5 controller is pretty much busted with stick drift. You're gonna need to replace it because it happened to me before. Also, have you heard of the Polish World War II bear? Yes, I have, Raphael. Um, the Polish World War II bear, um, the bear was actually originally from Iran. I, I think that's where the bear was actually from, so it was, uh, can I, can I get on my horse, by the way? Somebody's on my horse. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so, sorry. the, the Polish, the, the Polish army was training in Iran, and, and so they found a bear there. The bear's name was called Wojtek, I believe. I think that's what the bear's name was. And so the, the bear actually smoked cigarettes, as ridiculous as it is. The bear actually smoked cigarettes, and the bear drank alcohol, too, and would mimic a lot of what the soldiers were doing. And so, what actually happened was, um, the, the soldiers would bring the bear around, and the bear actually fought in combat, too, um, w during World War II. Uh, the bear didn't, like, actually, like, melee fight, but the bear actually loaded artillery, um, uh, which that was just crazy. So, the, the, what actually happened was, the Polish soldiers were actually loading artillery to fire at the Nazis, and the, the Polish bear actually saw what the soldiers were doing, and was just picking up the artillery crates and just carrying it over to the artillery. And so, it was just, that's just a, such a crazy thing. Um, the bear was uh, the bear was actually put in a zoo, and the sold the Polish soldiers would visit the bear, and so that's that. But the the bear was completely friendly to humans. It was never like hostile or aggressive or anything like that. So it grew up around humans. So it was. Um... Yeah, but just look up Polish bear in World Polish Bear War Hero. It's a pretty interesting um, story. But man, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to go to the store or something like that and get like um get a new controller because this is ridiculous. It just happened. It just happened yesterday. Yesterday I was playing and all of a sudden my controller started going to the left. I don't know why it was doing that and now it just keeps doing that. The stick drift is just so annoying. But 
um, Pro, I'll be, I've got to go for, like, um, for like an hour. Um, I'll be back, okay? Uh, okay. Right. Who had the strongest yeah. military during World War II? Uh, the strongest yeah. military... Who had the strongest military during World War II? It depends on what time. If you're talking about 1941, it would be Germany. Germany had the strongest military in 1941. If you're talking about um, uh, 1945, at the end of the war, it was the Soviet Union. The Soviets were even stronger than the Americans at that time. You know, they had much bigger man manpower. So it was, at the beginning of the war, I'd say it was Germany. At the end of the war, it was, it was the Soviet Union. So really, when you think about the strongest military during World War II, you're, you gotta think of the time during World War II. Hey Pat, did you also know um, that the um, you know that the UK denied troops to be sent to Australia during World War Two? The UK, wait, the UK denied. Uh, uh, wait, say that again. Because uh, uh, Australian troops were fighting in Europe mm -hmm. during World War Two against the the the, uh, the Nazis. And when Japan was going to invade Australia, Australia um, wanted its Australian troops back to help defend Australia, and the UK said, no, we need them here and to fight the Nazis. But what about Aus Australia possibly I mean, getting invaded? Yeah, they, they, like, you know, they didn't really consider that. All right, one second, I'm gonna put, uh, I'm gonna Bro, what do you know about the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich? Wasn't Reinhard Heydrich that Austrian Nazi who got, he, he, he got assassinated by the resistance in the Czech Republic, in the Czech, Czechoslovakia at the time, I think it was, right? I think they was, they shut up his car. Was that, it was correct, am I right on that? That guy was a butcher, you know, he deserved it. Um, I'm gonna Google and see if we're thinking of the same guy, but I think that's the is the Austrian Nazi, right? He was from Austria, and he was um, I think the resistance were that killed him. Um, let me see if I was right on it. Um, I know World War II history pretty well. Um, let's see, was I right on it? Uh, yep, he was um, uh, was he? Uh, okay, no, he wasn't from Austria. He was from Prussia. Um, uh, okay, I got, I got his birth wrong, but yeah, I was right on it. Um, uh, you know, that, that guy was a mass murderer, so, you know, the resistance, the resistance did a world a favor by killing him. I'm gonna get on the wagon with you. My controller just keeps drifting left. This is just making me pro frustrated. I gotta get this controller changed. Tomorrow I'm gonna go to the store. Okay. Uh, what, uh, what, 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 what time on the timer do you want me to deliver it? Um, let's deliver it in like five minutes. Okay. Uh, Whoa. Australia had Germany and Japan to take on during World War Two. Yeah, well, well, um, Germany was, you know... Germany didn't have the capabilities to invade Australia, but Japan certainly did. Japan, Japan didn't have the capabilities to invade America, but they had the capabilities to invade Australia. They could have. Uh, at least they, Japan wouldn't have been able to occupy all of Australia, but they could have possibly taken the cities. Um, that's entirely a possibility. I mean, they they pushed. They took Singapore. So if they took Singapore, they definitely could have taken Melbourne. Um, but it's um, uh, what is it? Yeah, yeah. That that was about that. So, so yeah. J Australian the, um, soldiers fought the Australian the Nazis in, in Europe and the Japanese in um, Asia. The Australian government was actually, um, if they couldn't defeat the Japanese, they were actually prepared to give away the entire top half of Australia to the Japanese and then, like, you know, have that as a peace treaty. Yeah, but the thing is, Japan wouldn't stop. If they, if they, if they no, honestly, they if, they, if they did that, that would be stupid because that's basically exposing themselves to more invasion. Because Japan could just group up their forces on the part that Australia gives it to them, and they could just invade, making it easier to actually get conquered. Um, China actually did that. China, like China, gave away part of their country. Japan invaded Manchuria in 1933, and then China signed a peace treaty w w with them. And Japan then promised not to invade the rest of China and just gave them like a part of China. And then Japan just built up its forces in that region of Manchuria and just in 1937 invaded the rest of China. So that's, um, uh, Japan, Japan is like, 
Japan today is a country that I think you could sign a treaty with, for the most part. But, like, Japan, a if you signed a treaty with Japan, like, back then, you don't expect them to honor that. Like, it's just, um, uh, you know, they're not, uh, yeah. There are a lot of remnants of wars in the past in my hometown near the seashore. Battleships, which is now an exhibit in Tel Air Airport, which used to be an airstrip for American Air Forces in the Cold War. Oh. Hmm. Oh, right, because they, the Americans did use uh, Thailand um, during the Vietnam War, probably for resources and military um, uh, stuff. Uh, it's, it's been years since I last watched your content. I know I'm late. Uh, congrats on to one million. It is great to see you uh, moved on to something else and not just GTA. Thank you, killer. Um, Did the U.S. try to kill Hitler? Um, uh, yes. Um, uh, well, it was the, the Americans and the British together. Um, uh, they actually... Watch my watch my video on Sniper Elite 5. So go go on my play... If you like, you know, World War II history, because I talk about it a lot in some... When I, when I play World War II games, I talk a lot of World War II history. But um, go into my Sniper Elite 5 playthrough, Sniper Elite 5 France, and go to the video... Uh, it's, it's at the, near the very end. It's where um, it, I, Carl kills Hitler. It's like the assassinate Hitler mission. That mission that's in that um, in that game is based on a real life operation, and the the actual real life op. So it's it's based on the actual operation they planned at the the place that Hitler was going to be at, and it's um uh but it, it the operation never happened, and it was actually going to be a sniper. A sniper was supposed to kill Hitler, and in the game you're a sniper. Sniper was five. So it was um that was the uh that was the whole purpose. Uh, what is that, that sound? Yeah, I don't know what that sound is. Also. Can you say hi to my friend Saeed? Uh, he is from Ar Iran. Well, hello t to your friend Saeed. Uh, General Deathshed uh, from Wolfenstein terrified me. Not only his appearance alone, but what he did. The scariest thing, he is based off real people. Um, is that is that the guy in the first game that's like the, the, the bald guy um, with the scars? Is that the guy? I, I don't remember Wolfenstein that well. Um, it's have I ever have I heard of Operation Unthinkable? It sounds familiar, but I, I don't I don't think I've heard of that one, Antonio. Thank you, Antonio and Jimmy. Um, is Steve still here? So Steve, I got. It looks like I got your um. I got your um your question right a little bit um. Right earlier. Yes, that's Death Shed. Oh, okay. How are you? Can you make a, a day in the life of a full-time YouTuber like a video? Um, possibly. My, do you know my, my seven-year anniversary of my channel is coming up? Um, and so I might do a video on that. Um. Well, World War II started because Germany went on a conquest and was trying to co conquer, was trying to conquer a bunch of countries. Kevin, um, Japan was doing the same exact thing in Asia. Um, Italy was doing it also. Italy tried to take Greece. Pol uh, Germany took Poland. Um, so it was, um, you know, France and Britain declared war on Germany because they had a treaty with Germany. Didn't Poland used to be a monarchy? Yes, um, uh, t uh, Poland was a monarchy, um, but 200 years before World War II, or actually, wait, 1789, yeah, so it was, no, 200, 1789, that'd be 230 years ago, or, you know, close, close around their 1790s, um, uh, it used to be, the last king of Poland was actually King Augustus, and he was a traitor, um, uh, because Augustus had actually collaborated with the Russians, uh, is somebody opening up something? Or chewing something? No, not me. I'm just hearing a lot of background noise right now. Uh, why did America get involved in World War II? Because Japan attacked us in Pearl Harbor. Who's making all those noises in the background? I just hear a lot of some snapping st stuff. Not me. Yeah, I don't know who that I think it is, Jess. Japan did bomb Darwin at one stage, which was closest. Um, okay. It got to invading yes. Australia. Also, what do you think of Anne Frank? Um, it was, um, uh, her story is r really sad. It's, uh... Thank you, thank you for the super chat, Mario. 
but I, I forgot about that, that Japan did air raids on Australia. I did forget about that. Yeah, um, Darwin. Damn, this, this, this stick drift is getting really frustrating. Um, okay, let me, let me go to my, I'm gonna go to my moonshine business right now. Can I ride my horse? Yeah. Let me get through. But, um, do you know what I'll say is that, um, the, when, when Ameri when Germany was falling apart in its last few weeks, and, like, American soldiers were, like, discovering, like, you know, the camps, I can't imagine what that must have been like as an American soldier to, like, see that and just, you know, you, you knew your enemy was bad, but you didn't know that they were doing that. Like, it was just like, you know, the, for the American soldiers, when they, like, Band of Brothers shows it really well, and they walk into, you know, the camps, and they just see that, and they see, like, all the people, and they're just so, like, you know, they're so, like, hungry, and they're just, you know, they're malnourished, and it's just, it's just really bad. And and the, the really scary thing about that is that when, when they were liberating those people from the camps, they actually had to start them on a specific diet. Like they, they had to control what they could eat because the people the people that were liberated from the camps were so badly malnourished that if they if they just let them eat on their own they would have ate themselves to death. So they had this the the Americans had to put the people on a specific diet to save them. So they had to control what they ate specifically, and then eventually they were going to regain their you know their health and just all of that other stuff and able to eat normally. But they had to, the Americans had to. Con I'm not a doctor, so I don't know much about it, but I know that like it was like they had they had to keep be kept on a specific like diet because it was um. Just the, the malnourishment was just so bad. The starvation was just so bad. It was, um... But oh, what, what I'll chance, tell you yeah. is, one of, one, of the, one of the best things the U.S. did was the American soldiers would actually take all the people in, like, a German town, and they would take them to the camps. And they would, like, and they would, like have them see that. And I think that's, that is, like, finally when Nazism was finally broken. Finally that. The, the propaganda of the regime was finally going away at that point because people people were con convinced like a lot of people were brainwashed in Germany and they were convinced that like that their leader was defending them and that everyone else was being aggressive and so it was just that like like and the, and the thing is though is that you know pe people you know there's idiots today to even deny the Holocaust happened you know despite all of the evidence but it was you know bringing those bringing those people to the camps and actually like you know you know showing them what their government what their leader did to these people. It was that, that's finally what finally convinced a lot of people that, that, um, a lot of Germans that Hitler was wrong in what he did. But there's, there's pictures of this that you can see. There, there, the pictures are kind of disturbing, but there's historical pictures that you can see of, like, American soldiers, like, bringing German civilians into the camps. And they also forced the civilians to actually clean up the camps. So they forced them to actually clean up and, and help the people. So that was that. So it was, um... The, the, Mario, the, those those people on Twitter are just idiots. Just don't don't um, ignore them. Um, it's, it's just ignore them. Um, Operation Unthinkable is Churchill's plan to invade the USSR after Germany was defeated with the help of German POW. Oh, I I know about that. But that that plan was just so um, uh, was just so ridiculous. And Chur Churchill wanted to do that so that uh, Churchill wanted to try to honor the commitment he made to Poland um, with that. Uh, because Stalin basically Stalin went, when Stalin went into Poland, he just basically said, "This is mine. You can't do anything about it." And so, um, and the thing is, though, Churchill was a bit foolish at, at the start, because because when Stalin took Poland, Churchill was basically like, he gave me his word. And, you know, for me, that's like, you know, a, a brutal dictator, you know, gave you his word. You honestly expect that he's going to keep that. But he, he did try to keep his commitment to Poland. Um, but, you know, that plan that he had was just so ridiculous. And both the Soviets and the Americans and the British, they couldn't fight anymore. They've been fighting for years, and they couldn't fight anymore. If that, if that you know plan went through it would have just been you know you know that's that's why it got canceled in the end but yesterday Murray birthday I got banned for GT online what uh, you got for what poisoned um, uh, thank you poison soda what battle do you think sealed World War two um, thank you Kami uh, uh, for the super chat um, there are two battles that pretty much, you know, after after those two battles, it was just, you know, they defeat after defeat for the Axis. And the, the two most important battles of World War II were Stalingrad and Midway. And it was that 
Stalingrad was the beginning of the end for Germany. When Germany lost Stalingrad, they lost the war. It was over. They, they, they had no chance to win at that point. Like, Stalingrad was their last chance to win, and they had no chance to win after Stalingrad. They lost an entire army. An entire army had gotten obliterated in Stalingrad. And, um, uh, and also, here's the thing about it is that the, uh, the, the German propaganda and the Soviet propaganda are, like, very different. Um, uh, when they were covering, like, um, uh, when they were covering World War II. Uh, because, like, a lot of the Soviet propaganda wouldn't necessarily lie about the state of the country. Like, a lot of the Soviet propaganda, like, if you listen to it, like, the prop the Soviet propaganda was typically that, like, you know, comrades, like, our motherland is under threat, and, like, a lot of our land has been taken, but, like, we will not allow ourselves to be conquered, we will fight until the last man, stuff like that. So, the Soviet propaganda, I would say, was, you know more effective because it, 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 it at least admitted the bad situation. It didn't lie about the bad situation. It admitted their, their country was getting invaded. You know, it was very bad. They were about to be conquered. So it admitted the bad situation, but then it told its people to fight and said, you know, fight till the end. Do not give up. Um, uh, we will keep fighting. The Nazi propaganda, when it comes to the war, was very different. The Nazi propaganda, it was always the same thing. It was always, we're winning on all fronts, we are not losing, we are winning, you know, the Fuhrer, Hitler is, um, uh, you know, completely correct, he's never making any mistakes, we will not see defeat, Germany is on the verge of victory, it was always that for years, even like late 1944, they were still saying, we're on the verge of victory, and all they would never in their propaganda admit defeat, however, though, Stalingrad was the only time that they admitted defeat, this is the only time they admitted it, it was the first time, and the German media had to admit that they lost to Stalingrad, they couldn't, why couldn't they, they lie about it, because they lost an entire army. An entire army had gotten obliterated, so they couldn't just cover that up. They couldn't just lie about that. And even when the, their entire army got destroyed at Stalingrad, they still lied about it. They still covered it up. What they said was, they said that the they said that the German, that it was the Ninth Army, I believe, that they, they fought till the very last man, they supposedly fought heroically and everything like that when they were the ones invading, so that they, they had fought heroically and they fought to the last man. And so they were trying to use that as propaganda to try to get people to, you know, to fight even harder for Germany. But the thing is, though, what they didn't announce in that propaganda is they didn't announce how the, the German general um, had, act, the German field marshal had actually surrendered. So he had surrendered to the, um, to the Soviets. And so what actually happened was the, the Germans who were actually at Stalingrad were actually begging to, um, begging to be able to retreat. They were begging to be able to leave. Like they were, they were surrounded. The winter was kicking in really badly and um, they were begging to be able to, to leave. And Hitler basically said, no, you know, you, you're not leaving. You're fighting until the very last man. You don't, uh, you, you do not give up. You do not retreat. You, you stay here. And this is why Hitler was like a really stupid tactician. He was very, he was a complete idiot. He was a complete buffoon. Because for him, there was no such thing as retreat in his mind. There was no such thing as retreat. And just because somebody retreats doesn't mean that they lose the war. Sometimes you have to retreat. Sometimes you have to leave an area specifically. Because if you don't leave that area, the, the, uh, you can suffer even greater losses. Sometimes it's better to retreat from an area, regroup your forces, so that you can have a better counterattack in the future. Sometimes you have to do that. But for Hitler, there was no such thing as retreat. It was only advance, advance, advance. Every, every, any kind of retreat was always seen as, as a form of defeat for him. And so that's why he didn't allow the... Uh, he was a, an idiot when it came to commanding. So it was, uh, that's, that's ultimately what happened. They were begging, the German army was begging to be able to leave. Hitler denied it. Um, they tried to resupply the German army. They failed. The Soviets had controlled the airspace at that point. It was um, over, and they had gotten cut off. And the German general at Stalingrad, Paulus, um, about him, is Hitler had actually promoted him to a field marshal. And the thing about that is that the field marshal promotion was a trap. The whole thing was a trap. The reason it was a trap was because... In German history, no field marshal had ever surrendered in battle. In German history, ever. The G German field marshals had been defeated, but when they got defeated, they would either get killed in battle. Uh, they, would they would either get killed in battle or they would win. It was never that they would... It was n there was no German field marshal before Paulus, I don't think, that ever surrendered. And so because of that, when Hitler promoted Paulus to field marshal, he was promoting Paulus so that Paulus would be pressured not to surrender. So that Paulus would not feel like he's disgracing German history by doing that. So basically Hitler promoted him just so that he wouldn't give up, so that he wouldn't surrender. But Paulus basically, Paulus got really angry. And Paulus basically said, you know what, screw this. You know, we're not dying for this idiot. Um, uh, and so Paulus basically then started negotiating with the Soviets and surrendered. And so uh, Hitler at that point was like saying like, I promoted him to field marshal, but he surrendered and just going on this crazy rant and everything. But like, you know, what did you expect the guy to do? It's like, you know, you, you, you don't resupply the guy, you don't let him retreat, they're about to get annihilated. You know, these, you know they don't, they don't want to, like, die from some crazy psychopathic leader, and so that's, that's why they call the surrender.
um, almost all the Germans at that point wanted to surrender. They didn't want to keep fighting. The only, the only people that wanted to keep fighting were the, you know, the brainwashed Nazi, um, um, uh, you know, brainwashed Nazis, pretty much. It was everyone else wanted to surrender at that point. They knew that Stalingrad was a lost cause, and so they didn't want to keep fighting. And that's, you know, that's that's, you know, Paulus's promotion to field marshal was like a trap. But Paulus didn't fall for it, and Paulus, you know, Paulus did the right thing by surrendering. So that was, um, that was that. But yeah, but yeah, that that's basically like the difference between Nazi and Soviet propaganda is that the the Soviet propaganda would at least admit that they're losing, um, but the Nazi propaganda would never admit that they're losing. It was always that we're winning on all fronts, we're gonna win, and it was just a, it, it was always that. Uh, so it, it would never admit defeat of any kind. Uh, but yeah, but uh, but basically, the reason that Stalingrad was the beginning of the end for Germany, the person that asked me that question earlier, is because they had an entire army that got destroyed, and it was like it was the first time in World War II where Germany suffered a massive defeat. Like Germany has had like defeats in North Africa before that, and North Africa was still going on. North Africa wouldn't end until early February uh, 1943, and so it was that uh, this is the first time that like the, the Nazi army had gotten completely destroyed. And after that, everybody thought the Nazis were unstoppable. They thought they couldn't stop that. They couldn't stop. Them. They were just going to conquer everything. But you know, Stalingrad gave people hope, not just in in the Soviet Union, but it gave people hope like all across Europe because they realized, hey, you can beat them. You can defeat them. You can stop them. And so it was it was the beginning of the end. The Soviets then started, you know, they got resources. They had way more manpower. They brought a lot more manpower from the east. And so they were just, you know, it, it was just only a matter of time. The only, the only thing, the only thing Germany could have done at that point is they could have only delayed the defeat. That's the only thing they could have done. And Hitler's stupid decisions only made Germany lose faster. So that was just, um, that was it. But the second, the second battle, the person asking me what battles were the deciding factor in World War II, the second battle was Midway. Midway was the second battle. And I don't think Midway gets like a lot of like credit as, as much as like Stalingrad. I think Midway is just as important as Stalingrad. Like a lot of people like overshadow it. And I think that it's like, I think that it's like, you know, when, when people say that like Russia won World War II, I think that that's stupid. That's a stupid statement. It was a combined effort. It wasn't just Russia. And it was the Soviet Union at the time. It was a bunch of different countries. Like a lot of Ukrainians fought in the Soviet Army too. They helped win World War II. A lot of Kazakhs fought in the Soviet Army. They helped win World War II. A lot of Belarusians did. A lot of Estonians and Latvians that also fought in the Soviet Army. So the Soviet Union was like a, a, an army of just a lot of different countries. So when I hear like Russians saying that we just won World War II, it was a combined effort. It was like everyone like fought together and won. And the Americans also, the Americans had supplied the Soviets with a lot of resources. And so if the Americans didn't give the Soviets the resources that they had given them, there's a huge chance the Soviet Union might have collapsed. Like Stalin even admitted how much the American aid had helped. Like the Americans were sending them over like, you know, so much food, so much uh, weapons, guns, um, ammunition, jeeps. That's the reason that Soviets had jeeps. Uh, they had American vehicles because the Americans uh, had given them so much stuff. And so the Soviets needed it. They needed it to, do, to be able to fight the Nazis. So the Americans did the right thing by giving them the equipment. But, you know, I just find it personally ridiculous when people will say that Russia won World War II. It was a combined effort. And, um, and I don't think that one country alone could have done it. I think that everyone working together did it. And also, it's like, you know, what about Japan? You know, if, 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 Russia, if Russia is the reason that World War II was won in Europe, then would, would, would somebody argue that, that the reason that uh, Japan was defeated because of America? And that's stupid also. Uh, America didn't defeat Japan. It was a combined effort. It was like America was the largest force that fought Japan, but it was also a combined effort. So anybody that says that America beat Japan or that Russia beat Germany, it was a combined effort. That's pretty much what it was. So you got to look at it from like, you know, a historical perspective on that. But it was the Americans. It was the turning point. Uh, it was in Midway. So like, you know, we won Midway and uh, Midway was basically Japan Stalingrad, but, but at ocean in the ocean. That's pretty much what it was. It was because before that, Japan was on the offensive. Japan was constantly conquering, invading countries. But at Midway, it turned it around. Japan was now on the defensive. And um, and it's, it's really sad that like a lot of Americans don't know the history of Midway. And like if, if Midway was like taken, if, 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 if Japan took Midway Island, they could have used that as a staging ground to invade Hawaii. There's a very strong risk that Hawaii could have been taken after that because Japan would have a huge force on Midway Island and they could have easily overrun Hawaii. Like Hawaii would have been done at that point. Like the US probably wouldn't have, if, if the US fleet was destroyed at Midway, and, and, and like the U.S. suffered such a defeat at Midway, they probably wouldn't have had the resources to save Hawaii. Japan probably would not have won the war still, but we wouldn't have been able to save Hawaii at that time. So like, Hawaii would have probably been taken. So it's like, uh, you know, Japan was a major power in World War II. Also, you know, we had to defeat Japan, and so it was. Um, 
You know, it, it's like, like I, I just personally don't like it when people say, like, you know, uh, you know, Russia won World War II, or they say America won World War II. In my eye, eyes, it's a combined effort. And sometimes the most important, a lot of the important stories are, like, stories you oftentimes don't hear about. Like, there's plenty of people that fought in World War II. P Poland, um, you know, Great Britain, you know, France. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people think France didn't help during World War II. France was a massive help during World War II. The, the problem with France was that France's military, their, their generals were stupid. But the average French soldier wanted to fight. The average French soldier wanted to help. And, you know, for, for people that say that, like, France did nothing, and they say that, like, fr the French are cowards, the Fren those people who call the French cowards, I'm telling you right now, those people would not have half of the, half of the courage that the French resistance had. They wouldn't even have half the courage. The French resistance are, like, some of the most bravest people ever, and the French resistance made a massive difference. So there's resistance movements, not just in France, but in, Czech in Czechoslovakia, in Poland. The people that resisted, even when, they, even when people were conquered, they didn't stop fighting. They kept resisting, and they said, no, you know, we're going to keep fighting. And, you know, we're not going to let these, um, uh, these fascists take our country, uh, our country over. So that's, you know, that's the thing about, that's, that's World War II. You have to look at everybody's contribution to the war. I think it's, you know, it's completely biased when, you know, one country says that they, that, that they uh, you know, won the war. When there's, like, you know, that... Let me look at the comments here. I just read a lot of history, so I, I know history pretty well. Um, let me look at the comments. I'm sorry if my character keeps moving left, guys. I'm trying not to do it, but it's my stupid controller. It's a lot of stick drift. But you know, it's you know, in honor of Veterans Day, I thought I'd talk about you know World War II, um, uh, you know World War II history and like the sacrifices a lot of our soldiers made. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, how about Mussolini in Italy? How were they defeated? Thank you, Aussie guy, for the um, uh, thank you guy for the super chat. Um, well, the thing is, Italy really defeated itself when you uh, uh, when you think about it, because uh, mm -hmm. what happened was, um, Italy was um, uh, Italy was a weird government. It had a very weird government um, at the time, because Italy was a dictatorship and a monarchy at the same time. And um, basically, how it, how it worked was that Mussolini was the dictator, and so he, you know whatever Mussolini said went. But the monarch also had considerable power. The monarch would oftentimes stay out of the way and let Mussolini do what he wanted to do. But the monarch at that point had actually um, had Mussolini arrested. So what actually happened was in 1943, the tides of war were turning and the Axis were, were losing. And so King Emmanuel, he was the king of Italy. He realized that, that it was only a matter of time, that they were going to lose. He, in 1943, like, like it, was a bad, it was a bad time in 1943 for the Axis. They started losing um, and losing back. And so what happened was King Emmanuel had, Mus had, had went, went to the Allies, and he said to the Allies, Okay, look, is there anything I can do to stop you guys from invading Italy? Can, can, you, guys, can you guys do something to, like, you know, we don't want to fight in this anymore, we don't want to help Germany. And uh, what happened was the Allies basically told him that w we, won't, um, uh, we will allow you to stay as monarch, we will allow you to stay as monarch, and we won't invade Italy. But you have to get rid of Mussolini, you have to arrest him, get rid of him. And uh, so it, King Emmanuel did that. He had Mussolini arrested, and Mussolini got sentenced to prison. And what ended up happening is the second that Mussolini got arrested, Germany declared war on Italy. And so the German troops actually turned on the um, uh, they turned on the um, on the Italian troops. And uh, what ended up happening was Germany rushed into Italy. Germany conquered Italy very fast. Like they, they within a, just a few weeks, they had taken pretty much most of Italy. And um, what ended up happening is. Um, uh, Mussolini was actually uh, uh, broken out of prison. So the the um, the Fallschirmjägers, the Fallschirmjägers are German paratroopers. They are and they're in Sniper Elite. So in Sniper Elite Four, when you see those you see those guys with like the you know the they're they're wearing they're wearing mostly green in Sniper Elite Four. They're the elite troops that you fight. The guys with FG 42s because the F the paratroopers were the ones who carried the FG 42s. Uh, the paratroop the German paratroopers were uh, some of their most elite soldiers, and the German paratroopers were also some of the most brutal. They were some of the most the brutal the war the worst were the SS, but the, the paratroopers, I would say, was probably the second worst. The paratroopers had committed horrible crimes. Like, whenever whenever the paratroopers would land into an area, they were known for, you know, really horrible war crimes. Uh, but the paratroopers had broke, landed in Mussolini's prison and actually broke him out, and then Mussolini actually created a puppet state in North Italy called the Italian Social Republic. And then, um, in the southern part of Italy, um, it was, you know, uh, pro-monarchy, and it was, um, you know, pro-allies. -al pro and so basically, Italy had almost like its civil war, its own civil war at that point. So there was two Italys that we were we, that were in the war. There was the Italy that was allied with us, and the fascist Italy. And so the fascists were mostly in North Italy. And here's the thing about Italian history that a lot of people don't, t don't tell you about, and it's also very important to World War II. The reason that Southern Italy turned on North Italy really fast is because Italy is almost like two countries. A lot of people, people don't know that. And... 
what I mean by that is that historically Italy has always been divided um, uh, in, into a lot of regions. Like, even when Italy was not a full country, like a full country, even when it was just a bunch of city-states, the north of Italy has always been the rich part. The north of Italy was always where it was really rich, it was really wealthy. The aristocrats, the aristocrats had, the elites had lived in north Italy. And the South Italy was very poor, very, very poor. Peasants, you know, big farmers, very, very poor. And the poorest region was Sicily. Sicily was the poorest region. And that's actually the same place where the mafia comes from. And that's actually, that's actually, that's actually um, not a coincidence. There's a reason the mafia is from Sicily. The reason the mafia is from Sicily is because it's the poorest part of Italy. Because the Italian government never did anything for Sicily. They never helped Sicily. And so the, the mafia got so powerful in Sicily because there was, no, there was very little government in Sicily. The, mafia didn't, the government didn't do anything to help. And so the, the, because of the corruption, because of the poverty, people turned to other ways to make money. And so the mafia got very powerful. And so the mafia also, you know, a lot of people ended up supporting the mafia in Sicily, the Italian civilians, because of the... Um, because the, the mafia, some of the mafia was giving them jobs and also giving them giving them money at times. There was also mafia that would scare people, but the mafia weren't good people. They weren't helping people in Sicily at the kindness of their hearts. The reason they were helping people in Sicily is because they wanted to get the the, uh, the hearts and minds of the people, and so they knew they, they didn't care at all about the people. But they did that because they knew they could say, oh, you know, the Italian government isn't helping you. We're the mafia. We are helping you. And so that's how the mafia got so powerful in Sicily because people people uh, you know relied on the mafia for help because the, the 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 government wouldn't do anything. And so Mussolini himself, when he was asked Actually asked about South Italy. He said the southern South Italy is a lost cause. And this isn't this isn't talking about World War II. He's just talking about the, the poverty in in in, um, in South Italy. And so what happened was you had the rich people that were in the top of Italy, the north of Italy, and they looked down on the people in South Italy and they saw them as like peasants. They saw them as beneath them, below them. They saw they didn't think that they were important. So the people in the the, the, the people that lived in the north, the rich elites, they thought that they were better and smarter than the people that lived in the south. And so they treated the, the south like garbage for hundreds of years. And that's why the the south went to the Allies so easily because they were tired of the fascists. They were just tired of the abuse that they had received for so long from the elites. And what, who were the elites in Italy during World War II? They were the fascists. The, the North was controlled by fascists. So that's pretty much, um, that was that. And that's that's ultimately what had happened with um, uh, with Italy, with that. But yeah, a lot, a lot of people don't know how divided Italy is. And Italy is still divided to this day. Like, like, North Italy votes very differently than South, South, South Italy, for example, in, like, elections. And so, like, um, Italy, Italy is very divided. The, the so South is still the poorest in Italy. The North is still the richest. And so it's still, it's still, there's still some division to this day. It's better than what it was, you know, in the past. But Italy is almost like two countries. And um, if you actually ask people, some people would probably prefer living in different countries. Like, um, because of that, how divided Italy is. But, like, yeah, like, it's, it's like that. Like, the division in Italy is, like, really bad. Like, if you are, um... If you're from North Italy and you go to South Italy, people might treat you, people might be very disrespectful to you. Even if, even if you're not a bad person, if you're just somebody from North Italy and you go to South Italy, people will treat you like, like, you know, you're bad. But if you go to South Italy, if you're from South Italy and you go to North Italy, might, the same thing might happen. People from North Italy will treat you like garbage. So it'll, um, you know, it, it works both ways. But, you know, it's, it's like that. Um, and it's like, and, I, and I've seen this also happen in, in Poland, in my parents' country of Poland. It's like, you know, the same, like, geographical, like, you know, um, uh, stuff. Um, southern Poland, Southern Poland isn't, like, you know, like very poor. It's not like, you know, South Italy where it was very poor, but it was like, Poland was mostly like, you know, it wasn't like a very rich country, but it wasn't like a very poor country, but it was, um, uh, the south of Poland is the Carpathian Mountains and the mountains, uh, uh, the, the, we call them in Polish Gorale, which is like the mountain men. And so, uh, basically a lot of the people that live in the mountain communities in Poland, um, uh, they were, um, uh, how would I say, they're very isolated, they keep to themselves in their communities, and they don't like outsiders. And so they especially hate people from the cities. Like, they really hate people from the cities. Like, if you're, you know, if you're, you know, from, you know, if you're from north, northern Poland, but you're at least, you're at least from, like, a farming community or something like that, they might not treat you as disrespectfully. But if you're from, like, one of the cities, like Warsaw or something like that, and you go to, like, the Carpathian Mountains, some of the mountain people there will treat you a lot of disrespect. And I'm not, and look, I'm not saying that all people that live in the mountains of Poland are rude. I'm not saying that at all. Um, uh, but it's, um, uh, but there's like, it's, it is, it is known that, 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 that has happened. Like that happened to me actually when I was working, um, uh, you know, when I was working in, in retail once, there was a guy who came in who he was Polish and I remember he was buying alcohol and, uh, I asked him for ID. He was around my age and, uh, and I, he showed me a Polish government ID and I looked at it and I could read, I could read it a little bit. I can read a little Polish. I speak Polish, but I can read a little Polish and I read it and he was from the Carpathian mountains. 
And I told him that my parents are from Poland also, and he asked me what part, and I said that my parents are from Olsztyn, which that is a, to the northern, it's a city to the north of Poland, and he immediately, like, snapped at me and just started giving me an attitude, and just, you know, started being disrespectful, like, you know, what did I do to you? I just said where my parents are from. You know, I can't control where I'm born, and just because, you know, just because my parents are from North Poland doesn't make them scumbags, so it just, um, uh, you know, it's, it's like that. People, people hate each other from specific regions, and it's like, um... It's, you know, it's the same in my country in America, you know, people don't like each other, people from certain states. So it's, um, uh, it, 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 it's, it's like that. But w when it comes to Italy, though, Italy, though, a lot of their, like, in, in Poland, for instance, a lot of the, um, a lot of the conflict between the mountain people and the, the people in the north, it's just nonsense, it's just stupidity, it's just basically, it's just basically my, my land is better than yours, that's pretty much what it is. Um, uh, and also, to be fair, there's also plenty of people from North Poland that are scumbags to people that live in the South. Like, there's, pe there's, there's big city elites that, like, live in Warsaw, and so they basically think that anybody who lives in the villages is, like, stupid. It's like that. There's, there's you know, el city elites like that, to be fair. Uh, but the, 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 the conflict in Italy is mostly like an economical conflict. It's not just, in Poland, it's more just a social conflict, but in Italy, it's a social and an economic conflict. It's like the, the South has always been really poor, and the North were the people who were in charge. And so they, they, blame, the, uh, they blame the North for it. And to be... To, it, if you want to know, I kind of agree with the South in this case. Like, I don't think that, like, I don't think that, that the Southern Italy, I don't think that, like, Northern, people from Northern Italy are, like, scumbags or anything, but his, but North Italy in their history has messed up. Like, North Italy is responsible for, like, a lot of the, a lot of the poverty in South Italy, and they haven't helped them. So I can completely understand why, you know, people in South Italy feel neglected, and they feel, like, you know, wronged by the North. I completely understand that, uh, but that's when it comes to Italy's, uh, uh, history. But that's, that's just, just so you know, for anybody, if anybody ever visits Italy as a tourist, just know that South Italy and North Italy are almost like two different countries, and they they are very different from each other. And people people will um, uh, people act very differently in, in both regions, and their communities are very different in both regions. There's good and you know there's good and bad to it. You know there's you know rude rude people on both sides. So that's just um that's just to know. Uh, but I was talking a lot about that specific subject. Hey, it's my birthday, pro. I love your content. Oh, he hello, um, Third Street. Hey, man. Thank you for the super chat. Is the Sicilian Mafia still in control of Sicily today? Um, the Sicilian Mafia has a lot of influence in Sicily, but it's not like in the past. Okay. However, though, the, Ita the Italian Mafia has a lot of control over ports. Like, ports, um, uh, a lot of- they, they control a lot of ports in, um, uh, in Italy. And so they're- they- there's massive corruption when it comes to ports. Like, the Mafia ships a lot of stuff. Like the ma like for instance, the mafia wouldn't be, be able to get away with a lot of the stuff like that they ship like through uh, shipping in like the U.S. because U.S. ports are more uh, uh, scrutinized, where like Italian ports there's a lot more corruption at them and a lot easier for the mafia to smuggle stuff. Some idiot orbed my nightclub sale a few minutes ago. Thankfully, I closed my app in time and didn't lose anything. The cannon that cannon was a mistake. Oh, I agree with you, Mario. It was really stupid. Um, it was the, the 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 orbital cannon was definitely one of the dumbest things that they've ever added. Um. I missed your super chat. Um, I'm really sorry if I did. Uh, there's been a lot of people that have been posting. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I like history a lot, and I can you know talk endlessly about history, about it, a lot of subjects. Um, uh, I think history is the best subject in education, I believe, in my opinion. I think, yeah, I, w I would say... I would say history is probably the most important subject that you learn in school. And the reason I think history is the most important subject in school is because if you don't learn from history, you're bound to repeat your mistakes of the past. And so that's why, um, yeah, that is definitely like, um, uh, that. Yep, yeah, it's very true. Uh, let me see it's funny here. how uh, they, because Putin says he's like, you know, Putin is a history nerd. Like, he knows a lot about history, yet here he is repeating history. Oh, Pol Putin is an idiot. He Not only is he a psycho dictator, but he's an idiot. He blamed Poland for World War II. I don't know if you guys know about that. You can look that up. Pol hit Putin blames Poland for World War II. He was like, I, I, was a, a long time ago, he made some ridiculous Why? statements. He, he blamed Poland for World War II. He claimed that Poland was aggressive with the Soviet Union, and he claimed that Poland didn't want to be friends with the Soviet Union. Like, it was like, a, it was a bunch of stupid things that he was saying. It was like a bunch of things. Um, you know, um... One one messed up, you know, one messed up thing that Poland did do um, before World War II is they did invade, you know, um, parts of Czechoslovakia. That is true. You know, that's a messed up thing that Poland did in its history. And, you know, and you know, but, you know, me being a Polish American, I do admit to that. And I say that that was, you know, that was, you know, a bad thing that Poland did. 
but, you know, to then, you know, for Putin to just, you know, say that, like, you know, Poland was, you know, responsible also for World War II is just, you know, ridiculous, like, you know, ridiculous statement. That's just um, not true. It's just stupid. Uh, and also, there's a reason that Poland didn't want to ally with the Soviet Union. Poland hated Nazi Germany. Poland was not a fan of Nazi Germany at all. But the reason that Poland didn't want to ally with the Soviet Union was because the Soviet Union literally um, uh, was constantly threatening their country. It was like, like Stalin, Stalin was not a person that you want to ally with. Like, it was, there's, it's, 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 you know, Poland was caught between two dictators, between Stalin and, like, Hitler. Like, it's like, <coughs> Poland's geography is, like, just, uh, just, uh, you know, it's, it's just in a bad place, but, you know. But, you know, P Putin's an idiot, and, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't listen to, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't listen to him. And also, you know, Putin, Putin denies the Holodomer. Which the Holodomer is like when the Soviets had, um, uh, the Soviets had, Stalin had actually killed 7 million Ukrainians. So that's, um, uh, that is an event that Putin actually denies. So it's, um, you know, don't, don't listen to that guy for history. He's an idiot. Um, it's not Friday without a pro stream. Take care. Thank you, um, thank you, Midnight. As a car guy, I feel bad for the rollers in Saints Row 1. Thank you, DL Gaming. Um, Friday. And uh, I'm gonna look up that there was, like, that comment that I missed. Right? Uh, let me see. Uh, somebody, I missed a comment from somebody earlier. Let's see. Uh, did he make Did he make a super chat earlier? Um, I'm trying. Uh, I'm trying to see who who was it that he said I said I missed somebody's comment. Um. <coughs> I don't, I don't know if I've, I've, who was it, who, whose comment did I miss again? Um, uh, Mr. B Mr. Blank, you said I missed your, uh, your super chat. I don't, I'm looking through the list. I don't think I missed, I, 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 I don't see a super chat, but anyways, you, you can ask me whatever you, um, whatever you want, I'll answer. Um, the only thing I don't answer is politics, guys, stay away from that, because it's a gaming channel, but I'll happily talk history and, like, you know, and, you know, other stuff, but, um, uh, yeah, but it, it's, um, yeah, that, that, um, honestly, like, uh, I don't think, I don't think any country should, uh, should, uh, should trust Putin ever. Like, you know, don't ever work with that guy, don't trust him. Um, uh, cause he, this is the, the, remember, this is the same guy who, who claimed several times that he's in, not invading Ukraine, and he claims he has no plans to invade Ukraine. And so after that, I've never, you know, I... I will never believe anything that the Russians said. I didn't believe any. I didn't believe the Russian government even before that. But I'm not. You know, this m makes me less likely to ever believe them. So that's just. Okay, I'll see you, Riddy. Um, thank you for the super chat. Thanks, man. I'll see you. What do you think of Marvel superhero films? I'm not, I'm not, um, uh, I'm not, um, uh, I'm not into them personally. You know, I've seen some superhero movies when I was younger, but I just, I'm just not into them. Bro, you're so smart. Oh, well, thank you, Clash. Uh, take out the bandits? What? Who, who? Yeah, there's still one up here. Have you heard about Russian men breaking their limbs to avoid being sent to Ukraine as part of the military? Yeah. Um. In my Saints Row fan fiction, I have I'm having to uh, my boss recruit Donnie after he sabotaged their cars because the dude is very likable and a good addition to the gang. Yeah, and and the thing is about it, I always felt bad for Donnie in a way because Donnie, like, what does Donnie say? Donnie says to 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 boss in Saints Row, 2, he's like, I never did anything to you. I just fixed cars, which is kind of true. He was involved in like the illegal car, you know, stealing ring, but he never did anything to the Saints. So it's like you know, and and you know, it, it was just that. But the boss just pushes him around. Um, Battle of the Bulge, um, uh, uh pro. I'll, I can talk about that. Thank you, Clash of Clans. Um, so, uh, Battle of the Bulge, um, uh, that was actually a, um, that was what the, the Battle of the Bulge was the, the, I would say the, the Germany's last attempt to try to turn it, turn the war around, and it failed miserably. Uh, the Battle of the Bulge wasn't in the Ardennes Forest, this was in modern-day Belgium, and, uh, what basically happened was they had over, I think it was over half a million soldiers, 
they mobilized like a force of half a million soldiers and they basically tried to overrun the American forces. They just did a surprise attack, tried to over uh, overrun them. And what actually happened was one of the reasons that the German advance failed. Um, if you guys could um, get off my horse, I could I could take the guy to the um, uh, I could take him to the uh, to the sheriff's office. But the reason that the German offensive in the Battle of the Bulge failed was because oh oops sorry hitting this guy. The reason it failed was because their Tiger tanks and their tanks didn't have enough gasoline. So they burnt a lot of gasoline on the advance and they didn't have enough gasoline and so their tanks were stalled and they abandoned a lot of tanks. That's one of the main reasons for it. The other reason was the Americans were resisting a lot. And also Germany's air campaign failed. So Germany Germany also launched an air attack in the air. The air attack failed. So that's um uh, the Battle of the Bulge. Um the best like the best depiction that I've seen of the Battle of the Bulge is um in uh, Call of Duty World War II. Call of Duty World War II is like the best depiction of it that I've seen. The, the, this is not Vanguard, this is Call of Duty World War II. Call of Duty World War II had a pretty good depiction of Battle of the Bulge. It was like a surprise attack, they didn't see it coming, they didn't know how they broke through. Uh, that was pretty- it showed the air campaign also, so that was like a, um, uh, I like Call of Duty World War II's depiction of it. Yeah, that was one of my favorite missions, Battle of the Bulge and Call of Duty World War II, I like that one a lot. <laughs> But like um uh the Battle of the Bulge, even if that had like some, if, even if the Germans had somehow broken through, um uh you know, I don't know what they were hoping to accomplish because they weren't, they were still gonna lose the war. If anything, it might have just delayed it. But they were still gonna lose the war. Like the, it, you know, Hitler thought that the Battle of the Bulge would knock the U.S. out of the war. That would not knock the U.S. out of the war. It would be a severe setback, but it would knock the U.S. out of the war. Um, so it was that, that. And then he was hoping to like use those soldiers to um, put them on the Eastern Front to stop the Soviets, which that um, uh, that wasn't gonna um, uh, that wasn't gonna stop it. But uh, it tell you like you know you know Hitler was like a you know a really stupid tactician. He was like really he not only was he evil, but he was also really like stupid when it came to like um, uh, military tactics. Like he had no idea what he was doing. Uh, he would he would constantly interfere in his general's plans. He would tell his generals what to do. And the thing is though is that if if the German generals were actually allowed to plan, um, uh, the war could have gone on for much much longer. But because Hitler interfered, interfered, he actually caused him to himself to lose the war quicker. Ironically. If Hitler's Almost generals were in, in power, how, how long do you think the war would have lasted? If the generals, if the generals could have done what they wanted to do, possibly another year or two. Um, hey, you right. Maybe till like 1947. <laughs> yeah, do you know the the do you know there there was one um there was one general um uh Keidling, I think he was was it Keidling? was that the guy's name. Um, uh, which Keidling was not a good man himself, you know, you know, he did some, he had, he participated in some war crimes, but Keidling was the one who actually had thought that invading the, so I think it was him, he thought that invading the Soviet Union was a disaster and that it was, that they were not going to win if they could do that. And, um, and the thing is though, the, why did Hitler think that he could, in, that he could take the Soviet Union so easily? Uh, the reason that he thought he could actually beat the Soviet Union was because of the Winter War, because when the Winter War happened, the Soviets had massive setbacks in the Winter War. Like, it was, like, massive setbacks. Uh, and the, the Soviets had lost hundreds of thousands of men. Thousands of tanks, hundreds of airplanes shot down. And even though they ended up they ended up getting Finland to force sign a treaty, which technically the Soviets won the Winter War, their losses were so great, Hitler was fully convinced that he could invade the Soviet Union and that they would fall really quickly. But the, one of the reasons that the... One of the reasons that the Soviets had, um, had failed in the Winter War was because Stalin was doing the same thing that Hitler was doing. Stalin was not letting his generals plan. And Stalin had some really smart generals. Like, Stalin had Zhukov, which Zhukov was a very smart general. But Stalin would not let... I don't know if Zhukov fought in the Winter War, but, like, Stalin... The, the generals that he had in the Winter War, Stalin would not let them actually plan. And he wouldn't actually let them... Um, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't actually let them um, uh, make a lot of decisions. And so... Stalin interfered, but another thing was the Soviet tactics. Like I said, the Soviets attempted to do Blitzkrieg in Finland, where Finland is a mountainous country and like a lot of forests, and it's heavy winter, and so the Soviet tanks got stuck in the mud. Um, it was in the w winter, slushy mud, I should say, because it's winter. Uh, but it was you had that. You also had another thing, and uh, this this you you guys will not believe this, but the Soviets invaded Finland in the winter. And winter in Finland is even worse than winter in parts of Russia. Like, the Finns are more used to the winter than some Russians are. That's how used to the uh, winter Finns are. So the Finns are people that can handle the winter, no problem. But when the, when, when the Russians invaded Finland, or the Soviets, I should say, when they invaded Finland, 
Do you know what the Finns were wearing? The Finns were wearing all white because it's a snow environment. Do you know what the Russians were wearing? Dark green. Dark green. So that, that's how incompetent the Soviet army was. They're wearing dark, they invaded a country in the winter time when your enemy is wearing white so they can blend in the snow and you're wearing dark green. And not only that, the Soviets had those stupid like communist hats on, like the ones with like the, the spiky ones with the, the red star on it, the old Bol school Bolshevik hats. And so, you know, this big pointy hat of like a red star on it wearing like a dark green uniform. It's, it's so easy for you to get spotted in a snowy environment. It's so easy. And so I don't know what they were. They didn't, they didn't even prepare for like a winter like attack. It was just, you know, it was just a disaster. And also because the Finns had resisted so much, the Finns the Finns would do everything to resist. And the Soviet <coughs> tanks were built so like they were built such they were such a stupid design to them that the Finns actually when the Finns would get I think it was the T twenty six because I don't know tanks that well. Um, uh, so somebody in the comments know probably knows. I know I know firearms like rifles much better, but tanks I don't know that well. But the, one of the Soviet tanks, I think it was the T twenty six, it was like a smaller tank, had like a really bad design where the back of the tank. If you actually threw a Molotov in the back of the tank, the whole tank would burst into flames. It was one of the Soviet tanks. I'm trying to remember which one it was, but it had like a really bad design. And they had hundreds of those tanks. And so the Finns quickly realized the flaw in the tank, it would exploit that. And uh, the Molotov cocktail actually was created from the Winter War. The Finns were actually the ones who invented the Molotov. Now, Molotovs had existed before that. And in this game, in Reddit Online, um, let me see here. In Reddit Online, the Molotov is actually called a fire bottle. And so a lot of people are wondering, why isn't it called Molotov? The reason that it's actually called Fire Bottle makes sense. Because Molotovs existed in this time period. Like in the Wild West, people used Molotovs. It did happen. However, though, that, that term Molotov did not exist yet. It didn't. So they, they, they were just called them Fire Balls, or they were called them incendiary grenades. That's what they would call them. So the term Molotov didn't exist. That's why it's called a Fire Bottle. But it is a Molotov. Um, so the Finns, when they started using the Molotovs, Basically, like, you know, bottle, um, bottle, fill it up with gasoline, mix, mix a little bit of alcohol, put like a, um, uh, put a, um, a rag on it, set the rag on fire, throw the bottle, the bottle will crack, you know, the, the, the fryer would spread all over the place. Now, um, the reason that, the reason that it's called the Molotov cocktail is because the, the, the foreign minister of the Soviet <coughs> Union was called, um, a Molotov. And so what happened was the Finns named the, the Molotov cocktail as a present to Molotov, who was the foreign minister. So when they were throwing Molotov cocktails at the Russian tanks, that was the gift from the Finns. That was like a, a joke that the Finns had created. So that's why it's called the Molotov cocktail, because that it traces its roots back to the Winter War. So Molotov was a real person. He was the foreign minister of the Soviet Union. And also, Molotov was the um, uh, the same idiot that would... Um, he said that the Soviets weren't bombing Finland. Like, he claimed the Soviets weren't bombing Finland. He claimed that they were um, that they were sending... that they were dropping food and humanitarian aid, which is just a bunch of nonsense. They're Planes were bombing their cities, bombing their towns. It's just a bunch of nonsense. Um, uh, and so that was like, uh, that's why the, the Finns hated Molotov so much because of that specifically. But that's, that's, you know, that's, you know, that's pretty much that. And, you know, relating this back to Hitler now. So what happened was Hitler thought that he could invade the Soviet Union because of the Soviet disaster in the Winter War. But the Soviets quickly changed from that. They started using white gear in the winter time. They had white, uh, like, winter gear ready. And also because the, so, um, uh, the Soviet Stalin would would get step away, so Stalin Stalin would ask for updates from his generals. Like Stalin would call up Zhukov and he would he would say to Zhukov like you know give me an update on the situation like what's going on I want to know now, and so he the generals would have to relay information back to Stalin. But Stalin typically would not go into the room. He wouldn't tell the generals okay you do this and that and that. So Stalin quickly learned early on that he's not a military commander and he realized that he made a lot, a lot of really stupid mistakes, and so Stalin let his generals plan for the most part. And so he stayed away from that. Where Hitler, on the other hand, Hitler would just go in the room and he, he would just tell the generals, no, 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 you don't do this, you do that and that and that. And so even when the generals knew that something was stupid, they knew that they knew that it wasn't going to work. They had to listen to Hitler. They had no choice. And so that's the, the strategy difference between, you know, Hitler and Stalin. Stalin made the same mistakes as Hitler, but he quickly learned from it. Um, where Hitler didn't learn from that. Hitler thought that he was like a god, that he was no matter what, his, his word was always right. He was not, he was impervious for making mistakes and he was going to, um, he was always correct. But here's the, the difference. There's whatever, whenever another country invades another country, the country that's, de that's defending always has an advantage. Always. Because it's their land. It's their land, and they know their land better than anyone. And also on top of that, they, they are on the defensive. So when, when a country is invaded, they, 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 they do counteroffenses back. But they also are on the defensive a lot. And so the enemy is coming to you. And so you can fortify your position and you can get ready for the enemy. The enemy has to expose themselves and they have to move up towards you. And that's why defenders have an advantage when attackers invade their country. But um, uh, there's a 
so Hitler was so stupid that he saw that he saw that the, the, the Soviets had suffered so badly in the Winter War, and he thought that it was going to be easy to invade the Soviet Union. But the Soviets were the ones who were invading. The reason the Soviets had such disasters were because they were the ones who were invading Finland, and, they, and their supplies were so crap. But there's a big difference between defending and invading. So Hitler would be the one that would be invading. So because he fought the Finns, the, the Finns had, had almost repelled the Soviet invasion, he thought that his invasion was going to go smooth. So there's a big difference in that. And so... I think Hitler underestimated the Soviet industry. He underestimated how how ma the Soviets could get mass production ready. He underestimated the the amount of, of Soviet troops. Uh, so there's a lot of things that that he miscalculated in, and um, and that's ultimately you know what what uh, what caused the defeat. But you know, but because because he was such an idiot, you know, we uh, because he was such an idiot, the war was uh, the war was won quicker. So, you know, if there was, like, another general, like, if Rommel was in charge or something like that, we'd be in much, much bigger trouble because the war would have, war would have gone on for much longer um, if Rommel was in charge. So it was just, um, there was, that was that ultimately that. It's like, you know, Hitler was an idiot. And that's, you know, re relaying this back to sniper elite, that's ultimately, that is ultimately the reason why the Allies stopped trying to assassinate Hitler. That's why. Because the Allies tried to assassinate Hitler. You know the the British had the British had come up with this one plan where they planned on like um, they planned on killing Hitler on his train and they planned on poisoning the water on his train, but the thing about that is Hitler's schedule was like so all over the place that they couldn't ever plan plan it when Hitler would be there. There was other Allied countries that tried to assassinate him. There was several plans, but uh, what happened was. Um, you had the Valkyrie plot, and the Valkyrie plot, um, that was in, um, uh, 1944, it was, Valkyrie was June or July 1944, I'm trying to remember, it was either June or July, my moonshine's almost ready, by the way, so it's, um, uh, what happened, the Valkyrie plot, you know, you had Colonel Stauffenberg, like, if anybody's seen the movie, the movie explains it pretty well what happened, um, you know, Stauffenberg and a bunch of other German officers were really, you know, upset with Hitler, and they wanted this war to end, and they realized that Hitler was gonna lead them to their dooms, because they realized that this, this war was gonna, you know, come to Germany, and they weren't gonna win. And so, um, you know, Stauffenberg and the other, you know, Valkyrie, um, you know, uh, uh, officers, they had, you know, planned, you know, with, they planned to eliminate Hitler and planned to arrest, you know, the top Nazi leadership. And so, you know, Stauffenberg left the briefcase with the bomb right next to Hitler's feet at the meeting. But what actually happened was another German officer moved it at the last moment. And so what ended up happening was Hitler survived that. He had shrapnel wounds, but he, you know, he was okay for the most part. Some of the other officers did die during that. But... What ended up, that was the closest that anybody ever came to killing Hitler. Like, there was other attempts, but that was the closest was the Valkyrie plot. It was, it was so close. If he, had, if he had just stood a little, a few feet or, um, closer, he would have been, uh, uh, Hitler would have died. But what actually happened was, after the Valkyrie plot, the Valkyrie plot actually made us, made the Allies win the war quicker. So even though Hitler survived, the reason the Valkyrie plot, um, uh, made it easier for the Allies to win is because Hitler then purged his military leadership after that. Anybody that Hitler didn't think he could trust, he got rid of right away. And so Hitler was even more aggressive in the in the, in the the boardroom. He would get even more aggressive with his generals and tell them what they can and can't do. So before that, he was dictating. But now he was dictating even more. And so it, it was... Hitler was convinced that he was like a god or something after the Valkyrie plot. Um, basically, uh, if you want to know, um, Hitler thought he was some supernatural force. So... Hitler would say that it was his destiny to lead Germany, and he thought that it was his destiny to, to that, it, that no, no matter what, nobody could kill him. That was what, in Hitler's mind, he was unkillable. And he was, uh, and nobody could kill him, and that he was going to win no matter what. It was his destiny. And now, you, you might be thinking, what was Hitler's religion because of this? Uh, it's unknown what Hitler's religion is. Nobody really knows what his religion is. It's a very debated subject in history. Like, you cannot find a unanimous, like, decision among historians. Like, if you ask historians what Stalin's religion was, Stalin was an atheist. We know that. Um, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, Mussolini, for instance, Mussolini was, you know, an atheist, but he didn't really, you know, talk about that much. However, though, Hitler, there's really no proof that Hitler was an atheist, but there's also no proof that he was a Christian. He wasn't a Christian, nor was he an atheist. Um, he was, he had some kind of religious view. Um, it's really unknown, but, and this is the thing about history, is that people oftentimes, um, what they do in history is people will, uh, uh, people try to, people try to make up religions, in it, that Hitler was, to try to bash one side. And what I mean by that is you will have, for example, you'll have, you will have atheists. Now, I'm not criticizing atheists or anything. I'm an agnostic, so I'm not even a, a religious affiliation myself. But what I'm saying is you, you have atheists that will say that Hitler was a Christian. 
And so he did these things because of Christianity, which is not true. Hitler despised Christians. He hated Christians. It's, it, this is historical, um, you know, thing. Hitler did make signs deals with the Vatican. That is true. They signed the Nazis signed deals with the Vatican, but they hated Christians. They despised Christians, and the Nazis wanted to eventually abolish Christianity. That was their plan. It was going to. They, they were going to create their own religion. There was the Nazi. The Nazis were going to have their own religion eventually. They were going to get rid of Christianity. So Hitler despised Christians, um, uh, and he also what, what Hitler despised about Christianity is he despised the worship of Jesus because Jesus was Jewish, and so that was Hitler despised Christianity. And even though Hitler, when he was when Hitler was born, he was born into a Roman Catholic faith. After World War One, there is no record of Hitler being a member of any church ever. There is no record of that. There is no proof that he attended mass. Hitler did go to funerals. Where the, where the, at churches, but there is no proof that he was ever a practicing Christian, and there is no proof that he was a um uh, he was there was no proof that he was you know Christian in any way. There is um uh what is it uh uh. Hitler did mention God in his speeches. You know, people will bring that up. He mentioned God, and he would also, um, uh, he would mention Christianity sometimes. He called himself a German Christian. When he was asked about, about that, he called himself a German Christian. But like I said, Hitler despised Christianity. He hated Christianity. Um, but the reason that Hitler was using, you know, you know, saying stuff like that is because if Hitler was a Christian, why did he go after Christians so much? Why did he go after so many priests? There were so many churches the Nazis went after. The Nazis went after so many religious people. So it was, um, uh, you know, when people tell you that Hitler was like, you know, a, um, you know, Christian, it's just not historically true. There's just no evidence behind it. His religion is largely unknown. Um, but also to, to, to the other side now, there's Christians that will actually say that Hitler was an atheist. And they'll say Hitler was an atheist and he did all these things because, you know, he was an atheist. But the reality of the situation is there's no proof he was an atheist either. So you'll have people who will say he's an atheist and then you have people who will say he's a Christian. But there's no proof that he was an atheist atheist either. Um, Hitler's driver had claimed that he was an atheist when he was asked about Hitler's religion, but that's just but what, what one guy said his driver. But then, but then there's also the speeches that Hitler gave. So his religion is largely unknown. It's unknown exactly what his religious viewpoints were. I think, you know, I think people should personally stop obsessing over his religion. I don't know why that's so important, but like so many people like to this day are so, you know, obsessed with what Hitler's religion was. The only thing that, the, the thing that I think is the most important is that the guy was just a psycho evil, you know, maniac dictator. That's um, uh, what it was. The guy was, you know, you know, you know, one of the most evil people in human history. So it's, um, you know, people trying to say he was this religion or not that religion. But I just, I'm, I'm bringing this up at this point because I'm talking about, the, you know, the whole destiny thing that he was talking about. Uh, so, you know, Hitler, um, uh, he was somewhere in the middle. I don't think he was like, you know, I don't think he, he was not a Christian, um, but he wasn't an atheist either. He was like, um, he believed, I per me personally, from everything that I've read about history, all the stuff that I've read about history, I think that Hitler personally was a pagan. That's what I personally think. I think I don't, you know, I don't have the best evidence for this, but from everything that I've read, because I've read a lot of history and I've read like, you know, um, about a lot of these dictators, is he, um, uh, I think he worshiped the ancient German gods. That's what I think. Um, and a lot of the SS, like the Nazis, the top SS, like Himmler and those people, they were actually um, uh, worshiping like, you know, pagans. So they would worship, uh, not pagans, the German, Germanic gods. And so they thought that that was like a core part of like German identity was like the ancient German gods. And so that's what I personally think. I think that Hitler had used um, uh, Christianity to just try to uh, get people to support him. But I, there's no proof, like I said, because you look at Hitler's policies. You know, you look at what he did. You know, he went after you know the um, uh, uh, he went after um, you know, a lot of Catholics. He went after um, uh, he went after a lot of Protestants. So there was that. A lot of priests were killed by the Nazis. So you know, when say when people say the Nazis were like a Christian party, it's not true. It's not. They, they hate. They despise Christianity. But this is just, you know, and this is coming. You know, um, you know, this is coming from somebody who's an agnostic. So I don't really have like an, a religious bias here when I say this. It's just you know history of what I'm talking about mostly. Um, but w getting back to what I was saying earlier um, about it is when I was bringing up Hitler's religion, the reason that that's important here in this case is because when Hitler had survived the Valkyrie plot, when he survived that, he believed that it was his destiny. And he believed that nobody could kill him. And he was like fully convinced that there was like some, he was some supernatural force. He thought that he was some kind of god or something like that. And he thought that nobody could, uh, nobody could stop him. Nobody could defeat him uh, no matter what. And because of that, because Hitler has like this new, like, you know, god complex about him, he, um, that makes him more prone to making mistakes because he thinks he's some kind of god. So he thinks he's not going to make mistakes. He thinks that everything he's going to, uh, he's going to do is, is going to be perfect. And because of that, you see where I'm going with this. Because of that, he, uh, he's going to make a lot of dumb mistakes. And so that is ultimately why the Allies stopped trying to assassinate Hitler. 
after the Valkyrie plot. They just they didn't assassinate him anymore. Um, the the mission in Sniper Elite uh, Five takes place a month after the Valkyrie plot, and um, uh, I'm trying to remember what the operation was called. It was um, uh, I would have to Google it. And let me look at the super chats um, here. I think I missed a few comments, but I, I know history a lot. So I'm sorry, guys. So I can just talk a lot about it. And since you know it's Veterans Day, I thought I would talk a little bit about um, you know you know wars that are that are our soldiers had fought through, and you know the evils like the Nazis that they had you know um, uh, you know fought to defeat. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Clash, for that super chat. Also, history lessons on the Battle of Sum. I, I can talk about that a little bit later. Thank you, Eclipse Nova. I just want to finish this point. Um, I'm going to... Pro, what event in the Cold War almost started World War III? The Cuban Missile Crisis. Thank you, Reward. Cuban Missile Crisis was the closest to that when uh, Castro had allowed Soviet missiles to be built. That was 1962, I believe. Um, Didn't yeah, Castro so, um, not want the Soviet missiles on his island? No, he he, he was perfectly fine with Because there was like something that. saying that he hated the missiles on his island. No, he he, he wanted um he wanted the missiles on his island because he thought that the U.S. was going to invade Cuba if he didn't have the missiles there. Um, but what's your opinion on Soviet Napoleon Union Bonaparte, still? Alexander the Great, and Genghis Khan as generals? I can answer your question in a little bit, Lopez. Thank you for the super chat. Um... Well, they were just, um, uh, you know, I've read all the history, uh, Mario, they're just, you know, evil, you know, you know, they're just evil psychos, and, you know, the Nazis were gonna, you know, the Nazis were gonna, you know, kill any anybody off that they didn't like. Like, if the Nazis had won World War II, the world would be a very different place. Like, they would have killed hundreds of millions of people. Hundreds of millions. They would have exterminated entire countries. Like, they would have, the Nazis would have exterminated everyone in Poland, pretty much. Everyone in Poland, in Ukraine, in Belarus, uh, most, almost everyone in, like, the, um, uh, in the, uh, western part of, um, Russia. They probably wouldn't have had the resources to invade eastern Russia, but they, um, they were, they, the Nazis hated Slavic people. They would have, you know, killed all the Slavs that they could have. Um, but um, what I was saying about um, Hitler's, like, God complex earlier, um, uh, the operation, I would have to look it up. It's in, um, uh, it's in, um, I remember, I, I can't believe I forgot this, um, uh, 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 this, but it was, um, it's in Sniper Elite, and I knew the, um, uh, 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 Operation Foxley, that was it. So Operation Foxley is the one in Sniper Elite. Operation Foxley was this British and American plan, a uh, sniper plan to kill Hitler. And it was, there was basically, it was going to be a German-speaking, British sniper that was going to be dropped into uh, into Bavaria into um uh into the um uh near the um the, damn what's the name of the house um uh the Bergdorf that was Hitler's mansion in the mountains and that 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 sniper was going to be dressed up as a German soldier and was going to use a car 98 with a scope and that he was going to kill um uh, he was supposed to kill Hitler now the reason that this operation was canceled this operation was canceled in November 1944 Hitler would never return to the Bergdorf um, uh, so, like, when he was there in July, that was his last time that he would ever be there. So they couldn't kill him there anymore because it was his last time. But also, because of that god complex that I told you about, how he, he believed that he believed that he was some kind of god and that he wasn't gonna, he, he, it was his destiny to lead and that he wasn't, he, he couldn't be killed off no matter what. Because of that, he was making a lot of really stupid decisions, a lot of really stupid military decisions. And, and so the Allies knew if they killed, if they killed Hitler, the war wouldn't just randomly end. Germany wouldn't just give up and stuff like that. If they killed Hitler, he might have turned into a martyr if they killed him. What would have happened is the Nazi, another Nazi general might have taken over and might have said the Allies had murdered our leader and everything like that, and he would have tried to use that as propaganda to rally even more Germans to fight. So that's, that is one of the reasons that they decide not to kill Hitler. And the, and the second reason, this is the most important one, is because Hitler was making so many stupid mistakes that he was going to cost Germany the war even faster. If they killed Hitler off, another German general could have taken over, and the war could have gone on for much longer. And so they knew if Hitler was in power, and he was constantly interfering with his generals and making stupid decisions, and they didn't kill him, the war would end faster. And also the third point, the, the Allies understood that even when they defeated Germany, the fight wasn't going to be over, even when they defeated Germany. The Allies knew they needed to denazify Germany, because even if they defeated Germany, that's still in the German minds. A lot of Germans still believe that. And so huge amounts of the German population were brainwashed. There was millions of Germans who believed this. A lot of Germans had, had believed in Nazism. And so um, uh, the Allies knew that they needed to get that out of their heads. They needed to, they needed to you know, the, the, the Nazis in charge of the military, they need to prosecute those people, put those people on trial for crimes against humanity, all the murders, the horrible things like the Holocaust and the war crimes, the invasions. But the, the, the regular German, the average everyday German that's brainwashed into Nazi ideology, they needed to change the way they think. And they needed to, to, to get that brainwashing out of their head. They needed, to get, they needed to show them that Nazism was evil and it was bad and they needed to break that. And so one of the, one of the ways they understood this is that if they killed Hitler, he would become a martyr. 
And so they needed to make Hitler lose. But not only did Hitler need to lose, he needed to lose bad. And so the German people, when they see that Hitler starts losing, when they see that he starts losing, and they see how desperate he gets, and they see the horrible things that he starts doing, that eventually starts breaking Nazism. When, the, when they start seeing that their leader is refusing to make peace, even when they know it's hopeless, even when they know their leader is going to sacrifice them, because Hitler was going to sacrifice every single person for his ego. He was not, Hitler was not going to make any kind of peace no matter what. He was going to fight till the very end. And that's pretty much what he did. So he wasn't going to, um, uh, he was not going to uh, surrender by any means. And so people saw that. Um, people saw how crazy he was. At the end of the war, people started realizing, a lot of people that were, you know, his devout followers had started realizing how crazy he was, that he wasn't going to, um, you know, give up no matter what, no matter how bad the situation was. And also, one, one of the most, one of the most evil things that, um, uh, one of the most evil, um, uh, evil things that Hitler did is Hitler had actually ordered um, uh, his top architect, um, I'm trying to remember what the guy's name was, um, uh, what was his, damn, I know history's so good, but I'm just losing my track of thought here on this on this topic, um, Speer, Albert Speer. So Albert Speer was the Germany's head architect, and Albert Speer is all, one of the few Nazis that actually ended up surviving the Nuremberg trials. Like, most of the Nazis had gotten hanged, but Speer had actually survived, and this is actually what ended up saving him, um, disobeying Hitler's orders on this. Um, now, Speer was not a good man himself. Speer had, you know, Speer used slave labor. So he used slave labor, so there was people that were in, from the concentration camps. He would he had, he had enslaved people, and he would use them to force to build German projects, and he ended up killing a lot of people doing that. So Speer was no, you know, good man himself. Himself. But Speer himself even realized how crazy Hitler was. Um, at the end of the war, Hitler gave him an order. And I don't remember what the order was called, but what the order specifically was is that Speer was to destroy every single German infrastructure, all German infrastructure, everything, so that the Allies would not get anything. That basically when the Allies come in, it's just rubble. It's nothing. And when Hitler said, told him to destroy all infrastructure, he wasn't just talking about things that could be used by militaries like train tracks and bridges. Hitler meant everything. So Hitler ordered Speer, destroy all German hospitals, destroy all German schools, destroy all German urban centers, just burn all German farms. You know, do you see what that's going to do? It's going to cause Germans to starve. Germans aren't going to have medical care. They're, um, uh, and... Basically, Speer had, Speer had argued with Hitler, and Speer told him, you can't do this. If you do this, our people are going to suffer, our people are going to die. But Hitler told Speer that all the true Germans have already died fighting, and the, only, the Germans that are left are the weak ones, and they deserve to suffer. So that's, what, that's the type of person that Speer was. And at that point, Speer realized how, just, how insane Hitler was, and Speer actually disobeyed the order. So Speer didn't carry out Hitler's order. He didn't destroy all the, all the German infrastructure that Hitler forced him to do. The, forced him to do. And so uh, that's the one reason that Hitchfield didn't get killed in Nuremberg. He did serve tri he did serve in prison for some time and eventually was released, but that's why he didn't get hanged. So a lot of people don't know why Speer didn't get hanged. It was because of that, because he stopped Hitler's plan to destroy the German infrastructure. So Speer, Speer did, and like I said, he was a bad person, but he did save a lot of lives also by um, you know, not following Hitler's you know, plan to destroy like, the, the infrastructure. And so that was that, like, you know, when the German people see stuff like that, they see their leader like destroying, like burning their farms, and stuff like that and destroying their hospitals they realize just how much of a psycho he is and so that's like you know brain the nazi brainwashing started being broken at that point um you know stuff like that um is it something uh yeah and um also like you know last thing i'll say about this but if you want to know how insane hitler was um uh, there's that scene which probably most people watching this probably have um have seen this this scene but there's that there's that there's that scene on um on uh what is it um uh, in, in Downfall. Downfall is the movie. I, I saw Downfall a long time ago. Downfall is a good movie. I recommend anybody that's interested in history should see Downfall. But um, uh, in Downfall, there's that, that one scene in Downfall where Hitler's like sitting in the, in the room and then his generals tell him bad news and he gets like really angry, throws the pencil and just starts going on his rant. And so people like made memes out of that and so they make like fake subtitles and stuff like that. So people know the scene that I'm talking about. Um, what the thing about it is that what people don't know, that Hitler rant actually happened. You know, when he went off and he threw the pencil and just, you know, started yelling at all the generals and uh that that actually happened when he was going on that rant and everybody overheard it it was very you know that movie was pretty historically accurate in what it uh, in you know capturing that whole scene um but basically hitler never admitted that the war was lost ever he never admitted he would always say we're winning we're winning on all fronts and that was the first time that he actually admitted the war was over that was like two weeks before he one or two weeks before he killed himself was when he gave that rant and um basically the reason that hitler got so angry in that scene was because he was ordering Felix Steiner, an SS general, 
to command a force. I think the force was like 86,000. It was a little, I think it was under that. It was under 100,000, I know that. And so he was ordering Steiner to take his force of under 100,000 soldiers and attack the Soviets head on. Just, just go straight at the Soviets. And the, Steiner's force did not have tanks. They didn't have enough ammunition. They didn't even have enough guns for all of their soldiers. And not only that, but Steiner's forces were no elite army. Steiner's forces were kids. A lot, a lot of them were kids. They were Hitler youth, like 16, 17 year olds, or even younger than that, who have never had any combat experience, who were in his army. There was even old people. So old people, people that were too old to fight were also in Steiner's army. This was the Volkssturm. This was basically the Germany's uh, uh, attempt to create a civilian um, uh, military force. So they were drafting people, old people, they were drafting kids, and they were drafting people who were sick. So people who were sick, who were old, only a few of the soldiers in Steiner's army were actually veterans. Like most of the soldiers had never seen combat before. And so Hitler was ordering that under 100,000 force who had barely any military training of just kids and old people um, with not even enough ammunition, not even enough guns. He was ordering them to charge at literally a force of over a million Soviets coming at them with tanks. And they didn't even have tanks. The Germans didn't have tanks. And so Steiner basically said no. He said, no, we're not doing this attack. This is, this is just stupid. This is ridiculous. And so Hitler, in his mind, thought that was going to turn the war around. He thought that that attack was somehow going to turn the whole war around and that, they were, that Germany was going to prevail and the whole Soviet army was going to get crushed. If that attack happened, they would have been slaughtered. There would have been, there would have been no, there's no chance for them. Even, there is nothing that, that no, no German general in April 1945 there's nothing any German general could have done to turn the war around. They were going to lose. It was over. There's nothing they could have done to turn the war around. And so Hitler was just such a maniac. That, like, you know, that stuff just showing you that he thought that this was somehow going to... It shows you he has no idea about tactics. He thinks that that's somehow going to defeat the entire Soviet army. This force of under 100,000, it's like kids and old people, with not enough guns, that's somehow going to defeat, like, this huge, like, Soviet army. And that's, like, you know, um, you know, that's, like, um, uh, you know... That that's that's basically that, um, but that 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 was like you know uh, you know people needed to see that and you know people needed to see like that their leader was like a psycho and that their leader was like you know this irrational and this like you know this this ridiculous and so that's that's that Steiner that's that's that Steiner rant is exactly the reason why the Allies didn't kill him at the end of the war they didn't kill Hitler near the end of the war they probably if they really tried they probably could have come up with some crazy plan to kill him but the reason they didn't kill him is because they knew he was going to make stupid decisions and he was going to make Germany lose. So that's why they, um, they didn't kill him, because they knew what, as long as he was going to keep telling his generals what to do and interfering with his generals' plans, that he was, it was only a matter of time until he was, um, uh, Germany was going to you know, collapse. So that's ultimately you know, the reason uh, why the Allies didn't assassinate Hitler. It was, like, um, it was basically just a stupid, um, you know, a stupid tactician. But we should be happy, though, that he made so many stupid mistakes, because, you know, like I said, the world would be a like, you know, much, much worse place if Germany had like won World War II, but you know, he was an idiot and you know, and thankfully, thankfully, you know, a lot of our, you know, veterans had fought to stop that and defeat him and you know, a lot of people sacrificed their lives to stop that maniac. So it was, um, uh, you know, that's what I think is important about like, you know, things like Veterans Day, remembering those people who, you know, fought against a maniac like that to stop him and free, of, you know, Europe from fascism. But that's, um, uh, you know, that, that's basically it, like, like my, you know, explanation on it. it was, you know, he was such a stupid, like, commander that, you know, he didn't know what he was doing, and that's ultimately it. Um, ha, 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 that Fegelein. Okay, yeah, so the Fegelein thing. So, um, uh, Fegelein, in, like, in the, um, uh... In like in his um in in the in the rant videos like it's oftentimes Fegelein is planning something like so the memes I'm talking about the memes like people make it so that he's ranting about Fegelein and that Fegelein is planning something stupid and stuff like that so in real life Hitler did rant about Fegelein also he got really angry about him Fegelein was Hitler's brother-in-law so Fegelein was an SS um, officer he was Ava Brown's brother so his wife's brother and what ended up happening was um uh, uh, Fegelein was trying to leave so he was trying to leave the bunker. And he was trying to flee. And so Hitler got really angry about that. And so that, that scene when he's when he's ranting about Fegelein, he, he's just saying Fegelein, Fegelein. Um, Otto Gunschi, he was like Hitler's secretary. Um, uh, you know, I think he was his chief of staff. He came in the room and he told Hitler, we could not find Fegelein. We don't know where he is. And Hitler's like, you know, what do you mean you don't know where he is? And he starts going on this rant and he starts saying Fegelein, Fegelein. And so that's ultimately about And if you want to know what happened to Fegelein, Fegelein got caught. And he got executed, so he got shot. So that's what um, uh, what happened. And Ava Brown was actually begging him not to kill Fegelein, but he still did it anyway. So that's um, uh, that's the story with um, uh, the Fegelein thing. Uh, so people know Fegelein was a real person. Hitler had him shot, and so that was like um, uh, that's the story behind that. Um, uh, 
thank you, Reedy5. Uh, thank you for the uh, thank you for sponsoring my channel. And let me answer some of those super chats because I didn't. Um, there were some super chats people asking me history questions that I didn't cover before. Um, history lessons on the Battle of Somme. Um, the Battle of the Somme, I actually don't know that much about. Um, the Battle of the Somme that was in World War One, and Battle of the Somme is arguably the worst battle of World War One. Like Somme was, if I'm pronouncing it, Somme, Somme, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Somme was just like a really, really bad battle. Like just, just really, really bad. The gas, the artillery, it's one of the battles with the worst casualties in the war. I know a little bit more about the Battle of Passchendaele. Um, Passchendaele, I know a little bit more about. Passchendaele, it was like the muddiest battle of the war. And Passchendaele, the craters in World War One and Passchendaele were like so big that you could actually drown in the craters because it would, there was a lot of craters that was from artillery and so a lot of mud. And then the rain brought in the mud. And so there was like, there was these big craters of water from the rain, and so you could actually fall into them and drown. That's like, you know, what the craters were like in Passchendaele. Um, I know about the Battle of Verdun. That one I know more about. Battle of Verdun was the longest lasting battle in history. It was like nine or ten months long. And, you know, and pe people, people say the French can't fight. The French defeated Germany at the Battle of Verdun in the longest lasting battle in history. And um, that one... Um, that one battle in Battlefield 1, in, in the multiplayer, the Battle of Fort de Vox, um, uh, it, it's the Operation Battlefield 1. Uh, in real life, the Germans ended up taking the fort, um, uh, but the reason that they took the fort wasn't because the, um, uh, it wasn't because the, um, the French just gave up. Uh, the reason that they, the French did surrender at the end, but the reason that they surrendered is because the French ran out of ammunition. They had no ammunition left, and so they knew that they had no chance. That's ultimately why the French surrendered in Vox, but they fought on until the very end. And so they fought until they, they had no ammunition left. So that's, you know, that's the story of Fort de Vox and the Battle of Verdun. But some, some I actually don't know that much about. Um, uh, I know it was one of the, you know, larger, uh, you know, larger battles and one of the worst ones of the war. But I don't know much more about that one. Um, let me ask the questions. Um, let's see if somebody else. What is your opinion on Napoleon Bonaparte, Alexander the Great, and Genghis Khan as generals? Um, Napoleon is probably the smartest general in, in, in history. Um, or uh, he's the smartest, I would say, he was probably the smartest general who was a world leader also, yes. Napoleon was a very, very smart man. Um, I would say his, Napoleon would definitely have to have a high IQ. You know, Napoleon was um, d definitely very intelligent. Like, Napoleon, Napoleon was a much more smarter, you know, uh, man than Hitler was. Like, Hitler was, like, Hitler was not only evil, but he was like a complete idiot. So Napoleon was actually a very smart man. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, Napoleon, Napoleon is a very controversial figure. You know, you know, when, when people say that he's like Hitler, I wouldn't use that comparison. Napoleon isn't, I don't think he's comparable to Hitler. Um, uh, but, um, you know, Napoleon isn't a, uh, isn't a good man himself. Um, uh, but Napoleon did, Na Napoleon is like a controversial figure because Napoleon did some good things. He did. Like, Napoleon, like, we're, like, Hitler, you know, did virtually no good things uh, whatsoever, like, especially when he was conquering, like, other countries. He's an evil you know, maniac. But, like, Napoleon, for instance, um, Napoleon had brought Napoleonic law into, like, uh, Europe, into, like, you know, places that he had, you know, occupied. And Napoleonic law, well, basically, Napoleonic law was it eliminated all, um, all uh, privileges, all aristocratic privileges, which is actually a good thing. Um, that was actually, uh, uh, and, and the thing is, a lot of people actually welcomed the French into their lands because of Napoleonic law. So that's that's one of the reasons that, like, when you think of the French occupying countries, like, look, look at, look at, like, World War II, for instance. In World War II, you had resistance all over. Like, you had people fighting back against the Nazis occupying them and stuff and stuff like that because the Nazis were just so brutal and they were so evil in the horrible things that they were doing. But when the French were occupying places, you had some resistance, don't get me wrong. You had people who fought back against that, but you didn't have that same resistance that the Nazis had encountered. Why? Because the French had treated people much better when they were occupying them. I'm not justifying what Napoleon did in his conquests. But I'm just saying with Napoleonic law, for instance, what Napoleonic law, when I was saying about the privileges, what that basically did was previously in European history, how it worked for hundreds of years, the people, the people who were generals, like the people who were generals and leaders of countries, they didn't get to, to their positions as generals, and they didn't get to their position as leaders through, like, honesty or elections or any of that. They didn't even have elections back then. But they got to their positions because of their bloodline. That's basically it. And what I mean by that is their, their family bloodline. So if you came from a specific family, it didn't, and it, this, this didn't just mean that you were rich. But it meant that you came from a specific family. If you were like of an aristocratic family, you would have everything given to you. You would have everything, all doors open to you. You would have everything given to you. If you were a peasant background, if you were a peasant, you would have all the doors shut in front of you and you couldn't advance. And for example, 
in the French military, Napoleon reformed the French military, and he reformed it in, in a much more smarter and tactical way. What happened was the French military before the revolution, and this wasn't just Napoleon, but it was a huge idea of the revolution, but Napoleon also believed in the French revolution. Um, but what the French military was like before the French revolution, the generals that were, in, that were leading France when it was the monarchy were put in place because they were aristocrats. And so the, the, the French believed that because they were aristocrats, that they were destined to lead, that it was their destiny to lead and that they, were, they came from a specific bloodline. And so the peasants had to follow them. If you were, if, if, if you went to military, if you, you, if you tried to go to a military school in France and you were a peasant, this is before Napoleon, if you tried to go to a military school and you were smart, you knew what you were doing, you were a capable soldier, you knew how to lead men, you knew how to get things done, you could not advance past a sergeant. Sergeant was like the last rank that you could get to. You couldn't get past sergeant. So like you could never become an officer. Only aristocrats, only people, nobles, were allowed to become officers. And so because of that, you had some really stupid people. Just because somebody comes from a specific, specific family doesn't mean that they're going to be, it doesn't mean that they're going to be smart and capable like um, officers in command. But uh, that's, um, that's how France believed before the revolution. The revolution changed that. The revolution abolished um, uh, privileges. And so ultimately, when, if you ask me about the French Revolution, I think the Re French Revolution ultimately was a good thing. Um, you know, there was, you know, there was bad people in the French Revolution like Robespierre, but the message, the message of the French Revolution, the, actual, the goal that they were fighting for, not, not, not the psychopath, not, not the insanity of Robespierre, but the equality that they were fighting for in the French Revolution. You know, this isn't, you know, this is not to be mixed with communism. This is very different. In the French Revolution, you know, they were fighting for abolishing of privileges so that a peasant would have the same capability. They would have the option like what we have today in our society, that, you know, anybody, anybody can rise their way to the top. Anybody can, you know, become rich and successful. So that's what they, they were fighting for in the revolution. They were fighting for it to get rid of those noble privileges. They were because the, the the church and the nobles they would dictate everything. They would control everything. And so Napoleonic law got rid of that. It got rid of the the noble privileges. The nobles didn't have their privileges anymore. And so more power was given to the peasants. More power was given to the um to the third estate. More power, the third estate was a class in France. The third estate was the um farmers, the peasants, and the merchants. The merchants were also in the same class as them if they weren't, um, uh, if they weren't um, aristocrats. And then you had the first estate, which was the aristocracy, I believe, and the second estate was the clergy, which is the church. Uh, and so France had a very unfair system beforehand with their classes. And so they completely changed that, where there's no more noble privileges. Everybody is equal under the law. Just because somebody is a noble doesn't mean that they have, like, um, uh, that they have greater say than somebody who's like poor. And so Napoleon's law changed that because Na Napoleon despised aristocrats. He hated n nobles. He hated aristocrats. Um, he was, um, and, and the most ironic thing about this is that Napoleon was an aristocrat himself. He was a noble himself. He came from that aristocratic bloodline. But even though he grew up around these people, he grew up around these elites, he hated the elites. He despised them. Now, Napoleon was his elite in his own way. You could definitely argue that. Um, but he hated the aristocrats. He despised, like, European aristocrats. He hated them. Um, uh, so he was um, he was no fan of the aristocracy, definitely. And that's why the aristocracy hated him so much. The aristocrats hated Napoleon for that reason. So Napoleon brought Napoleonic law into Europe, um, which basically made everybody equal under the law. And the, these scumbag aristocrats weren't able to dictate like they were. When Napoleon was defeated, though, Napoleonic law was repealed, and the aristocrats were given power again. Now, this doesn't justify Napoleon's conquest. I'm not saying what he did in his you know, in his invasions was right. What I'm saying is that when certain countries, when he would go in there, the people would have better lives than they did under their, under their um, uh, original, like, you know, countries. And that's why there was little, that's why the peasants typically didn't rise up against the French. Um, uh, so the peasant, uh, when you had a peasant revolution, you had a peasant revolution in Spain. And Spain was a little bit different in their peasant revolution. Uh, the reason that Spain's peasant revolu rev the, the reason the peasants in Spain were really angry at the French was because the French had the, Napoleon had put his brother as the king of France. That's basically why, and so that upset a lot of the Spanish. That's um, why. But that's like one of the bad things that he did. Um, uh, and you know, one 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 good thing that I would say he did also is he he gave Poland independence. So he he um. Uh, because Poland was carved up like by Rush Russia, Prussia, which was Germany, the largest German state, and Austria. And so Napoleon gave um, Poland its independence back. Now, Poland was kind of a puppet state of, of France, but it had much greater freedoms under the French than it did under the, um, under the, um, uh, under the Russians. Now, like, if, it depends on what country you go to. If you go to a country like, you know, Spain, and they, you talk about Napoleon, they'll hate Napoleon. Um, uh, but if you go to a country like North Italy, they might have a, a more positive view of Napoleon because he got rid of the privileges. If you go to Pol a country like Poland, they will have a positive view of Napoleon as well because Nap Nap Napoleon did help Poland in a way. If you go to a country like Russia, they're going to have a very negative view of him. So it's, it, 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 
you can see he's he's viewed very differently depending on the country. Um, but Napoleon did some really bad things as well. So even though you know he did some good and honorable things like Napoleonic law, he did some horrible things. And one of the worst things that Napoleon did was he reinstituted slavery. And that's like one of the worst things he did. Um, now slavery, when, after the French Revolution, slavery was banned. So slavery was made illegal. But when Napoleon came to power and became emperor, he, he kept most of the ideas of the French Revolution, like equality under the law and stuff like that, but he brought back slavery, which that was a horrible thing for him to do. Um, he, he brought back slavery in Haiti. And, um, uh, and so there was a revolution in Haiti because people, people were, you know, weren't enslaved, were, were given freedom not too long ago, and they were, they were enslaved again. And so there was a revolution in Haiti, and what happened was Napoleon didn't, uh, didn't have enough re soldiers to qu quash that rebellion in Haiti. And so he sent uh, Polish soldiers to Haiti, who were his, his allies, to, um, to stop the, the Haitian revolt. And what actually happened was the Polish soldiers, when they got to Haiti, refused to actually shoot at the, at the Haitian rebels. They refused. And the reason that the Polish, Polish soldiers had refused to, because Napoleon miscalculated in that. If he had sent the French soldiers over, the French soldiers would have probably shot. Um, but the reason the Polish soldiers, because Napoleon, by sending the Polish soldiers, didn't realize that the Polish had experienced uh, a, lot of, a lot of oppression. They experienced a lot of oppression. The Poles were oppressed by the Austrians, they were oppressed by the Russians, and they were oppressed by the Germans. So the Poles were constantly getting conquered, they were constantly getting invaded. Uh, and and the, 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 the Russian king had deported thousands of Polish people to, to work camps in Siberia. So that, that was like a, a lot of Polish people, when they saw what was going on in Haiti, they felt very sympathetic to that. And so they understood that this is a lot of the stuff that they were going through. And so that's why they didn't want to, they didn't want to shoot at the, 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 a lot of people don't understand that, why the Polish didn't want to shoot, but that's because they didn't want to shoot. Because they understood that it was, it's a lot of the stuff that they were going through. They felt sympathetic to them. And they felt like they, they were oppressed throughout their history. Yet you have to understand, like, the Polish soldier's perspective is, your, your people are constantly oppressed throughout history. And your country is constantly getting invaded by other countries. And they're constantly forcing their will on you. And now you are, you're a soldier and you're being sent to another country, and you're being told to oppress an another people. And so that's, that's, that's gonna make you think twice about that. And so that's why the Polish soldiers didn't shoot at these soldiers, and the Polish soldiers did the right thing. They didn't, they didn't wanna, they stood down. They didn't wanna shoot at the, um, at the, uh, uh, the Haitian rebels. And so what ended up happening is the, um, the, when, the Haitian when the Haitian rebels ended up winning, they actually gave amnesty to the Polish soldiers. So everyone, everyone, everyone who was pro-slavery, they kicked them out of Haiti. But the, the Poles who had stood down, they had actually given them amnesty. And so a lot of the Polish people had actually ended up staying there. The, the Haitian king um, uh, had actually, the, the Haitian king, I'm trying to remember his name, but he had basically said that Polish people um, had suffered, and he can completely understand that also. So it was just, um, uh, uh, he understood Polish history as well. Uh, but that's what ended up, um, uh, that's, that's what ended up happening. So that's the worst thing, one of the worst things Napoleon did is, you know, reinstituting of slavery. So Napoleon, like, I don't think he's as bad as Hitler. Um, uh, you know, he, he believed in, you know, equality under the law, but, you know, he was also a massive racist and he was, um, uh, you know, or I should say equality under the law for white people. That's what he believed in. So he abolished, like, you know, he abolished privileges. He abolished the aristocracy, the power of the aristocracy. He, he helped poor people in Europe, you know, get rid of, you know, their, um, you know, the aristocratic leaders. But, you know, he did bring back slaves. So Napoleon is a controversial figure. So he's like, um, you know, I don't think he's like, like, like Hitler scale. Um, you know, he did some good things. But, you know, he, he's, you know, not a good man, I would say also. It's like he's, you know, and this is why it's important in history. You, you, you read about everything somebody did. So you re read about the good things Napoleon did, but you also read about the bad things. That's why I think it's important to, like, you know, you read at history. You look at stuff like that. Um, but that's, that's basically about Napoleon. It, um, and also, for people interested in what happened to the Polish soldiers that stayed in Haiti, a lot of them, you know, had families in Haiti. And so there's a lot of people in Haiti today that are of Polish descent. There, is, there really isn't any, you know, known Polish community in Haiti, but there's a lot of Haitians who have Polish ancestry. And so there might be like a Haitian who has like a French first name, but like a Polish last name. So that's like, that's, that happens in Haiti. And that's because of the Polish soldiers ended up staying there. It was 200 years ago. So that's like, um, that's a little bit of the history behind that. Um, now the person asked me about another historical leader who would be asking me about also. He asked me about, um, let me see here. Um, oh, let's see here. I was asked a question about the other leaders. Uh, Alexander the Great was the other person he asked me about. Alexander the Great, I actually don't know much about that much about Alexander the Great. Um, uh, he came before the Romans, 
Um, uh, Alexander the Great was a, um, he, uh, he fought against the Persians. He was a conqueror also. Um, uh, I don't know much more, you know, besides that. Um, uh, I know that uh, Alexander the Great, um, uh, was... Alexander the Great was not a monster, I would say. You know, he wasn't like, you know, you know, some evil, like, you know, crazy psycho. Um, he was his conqueror in his own way. Like, um, what's his name? I don't remember the leader of the, the Persian, um, uh, uh, emperor. But basically what ended up happening was when Alexander the Great was fighting the Persian Emperor, what happened was the Persian Emperor had actually brought his mother along to actually watch him, watch his forces fight in battle. And so what ended up happening is the Persian Emperor was expecting to just you know, roll over Alexander the Great, but that didn't happen. And so the, the, the Persians started losing bad. And what ended up happening was the Persian army just collapsed and the Persian leader just fled. He fled. He, he ran away. And you know what he did? He left his mother there. He left his mother there. So this guy, he, he's the leader of this country. He brings his mother to watch him win in battle. He leaves his mother on the battlefield. So he goes to save himself and leaves his mother. This is what kind of, you know, scumbag is this guy. Um, uh, but he left his mother there. And what actually happened was Alexander the Great captured the enemy leader's mother. And, um, and Alexander the Great actually treated his mother well and treated his mother with respect. And so Alexander never seeked vengeance on his mother. He was the, this was the mother of your greatest enemy. And he never, you know, he could have easily killed her, had her executed, had her shamed. He never, he didn't shame her. He treated her well. And um, he basically, you know, was very kind to her. He knew her, you know, for the rest of his life. And what ended up happening was the, the guy, the Persian leader's mother actually claimed that Alexander was his, what her, was her real son. That's what what he what he claimed. So that's very interesting stories. He 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 spared the he spared his greatest leader's mother after his his greatest enemy his greatest enemy's uh, mother after his after he left his mother. But you know he left his mother there. That's just uh, man. That's uh, that's um, that. Uh, and the last one, Genghis Khan. Oh okay, Genghis Khan. Um, where do I start with him? Oh man, Genghis Khan. Um, and I I read a lot of history. Um, so yeah, I can just talk about this a lot. Um, Genghis Khan was the, um, uh, Genghis Khan, I would say, was the greatest conqueror that ever lived in, in, um, uh, in history. Ever. Probably ever. Napoleon, I, I, I kind of what I take, I kind of take back what I said about Napoleon. Napoleon is probably the smartest modern. So, like, Napoleon lived 200 years ago, but, you know, he lived in a time where, where he had, you know, guns, he had guns and cannons. Napoleon is probably, when you look at modern leaders, the last 200 years, Napoleon is definitely the smartest, like, you know, you know, you know, leader when it comes to that. Um, uh, in, in, you know, hit in the least modern history. But in, in um, past history, and the Mongols aren't really ancient, you know, this is over a thousand years ago. You know, ancient would be thousands of years ago. But Genghis Khan is probably the greatest conqueror when it comes to that. Now, I'm not saying he's a great leader. I'm not saying he's a great person by any means. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying he was greatest conqueror. What I mean by that is he was very effective in conquering things. I'm not saying he was a good person by any means. Um, but no, Genghis Khan was probably the greatest conqueror in human history. Definitely. Um, uh, the, uh, and the, the reason that the, now, I don't know much about his commanding, about his leadership, but I do know about why the Mongolians were so successful at conquering. And, um, do you know why the Mongolians were so successful at conquering? I'll probably go to, um, maybe go to a poker table in a little bit. But, okay, here. The, the reason that the Mongolians were so successful in their conquest, it was a variety of reasons, but... One of, the, one of the reasons the Mongolians were so successful is because the Mongolians understood capitalism and they understood how to make money with capitalism. They were, the Mongolians were very good at making money. When you, think, when you think about a civilization like the Mongolians, you don't think about them you know, being very rich and making a ton of money. You, a lot of people, because of the Hollywood thing, a lot of people think because of Hollywood, the movies and stuff like that, pe people think of like a bunch of Mongolian barbarians like coming in and just, you know, that. They don't think about how rich they were. But the Mongolians were very rich. The Mongolians were probably the richest civilization in the world at that time, when they were at the height of their empire, definitely. Um, now, how did the Mongolians get so rich, and why did they understand capitalism so well? It was because every single every single other civilization that the Mongolians had fought against wasn't a capitalist system. Every single other civilization they fought against was typically a feudal system. Now, feudalism is different than capitalism. A lot of people think that feudalism is capitalism. Feudalism is not capitalism. A lot of people think that it's um, it's the same thing. It's not. Um, uh, feudalism is very much a controlled economy. It's very much a controlled economy. It's a controlled... Basically, think of feudalism as a controlled economy 
ruled by the aristocracy and the king. So imagine like a king and a bunch of aristocrats controlling the economy directly. That's what feudalism is. Capitalism is basically when you allow the, um, you allow basically free trade, you allow the economy to just grow, you allow people to make as much money as they want. That's pretty much what capitalism is. This was not capitalism, it was the feudalism. It was just a bunch of like aristocrats and the king controlling the economy and heavily regulating, um, uh, you know, what, uh, what they kind of can't do. Now, this feudalism abused the poor. It was a, it was a system designed to exploit the poor. It was exploiting the peasantry. And it, it was benefiting the aristocrats, the, the, um, the people at the top, the nobles. Um, now, what, what happened with this, how this system basically worked, is after the fall of the Roman Empire, you had feudalism in Europe. And feudalism was very similar in Japan. Even though Japan was so far away, it was very similar in Japan, was the case also. Uh, how it basically worked, the Romans provided security. The Romans, the Romans were more closer to capitalism than than feudal feudal Europe was, but the the um, feudalism what basically happened was the Romans had provided security, so the Romans would would provide security that would keep people safe, and what happened was when the Roman Empire collapsed, you know what happened? Barbarians took over. Barbarians they came from Germany, uh, they were Germanic tribes, and the, the the barbarians came in. They were just slaughtering and killing people. It was horrible, and they were raiding towns, burning towns. It was they they raided Rome. They raided and burned Rome. The last, the, the barbarians captured the last Roman emperor. Um, so what happened was people wanted safety. They wanted security. People were desperate because w when the Roman Empire collapsed, you had nobody to protect you anymore. Before that, you had ro legions of Roman soldiers protecting you. But now you had nobody to protect you. And so the people were desperate and they wanted safety. And so they went to these aristocrats. These aristocrats were powerful people before the Roman Empire collapsed. And so the aristocrats ended up forming manners. What a manor basically was, it was like a small town, it was like a big wall around it, and there was like this village that was in the town. And the village was like huts, it was like really poor people, really poor peasants. And so the aristocrat would, an aristocrat would run the manor, so the whole manor would be run by one rich guy and his family. And the aristocrat would tell the poor people, he would tell, you can live inside my walls, you can have your hut and grow your food, uh, but you're going to grow food for me, and you're going to work for me, and I'll protect you in, in exchange. And so most people took that. But people didn't realize this was a scam. This was a scam. It was a system designed to exploit the poor. And so what happened was you were not allowed to leave the manor because you were property of the Lord as well. You were plot property of the aristocrat. You were not, um, uh, you were not allowed to leave um, uh, the manor. And so this, you can see, the, the, the Lord would use knights. He would use knights to enforce his will on the people. And so how this basically worked is, how is it a scam? Now, the thing is, I, I think it's ridiculous how, like, I see, like, people who defend monarchy. And, like, you know, it's fine to, like, you know, it's it's fine to, like, um, uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't hate, like, any monarchy today. But there's people who, have, who, like, think feudalism was a good system. And they think that feudalism is, like, you, you know, it worked. It didn't work. It was a, a system designed to, like, exploit the poor. And, um... And I'm gonna explain how this, uh, why this is important to Mongolians in a little bit, the Mongolians. Uh, cause the Mongolians were very different in how they handled things. But, uh, you had the whole, like, you know, the, the, the manor. So you would have this huge wall around, you have the little hut, and what would happen is, the, the people, the people who lived in these, in these, like, uh, uh, towns wouldn't even own the hut they lived on. They would, they would instead pay rent to, to the, to the lord. And so they would grow, grow food. And so imagine being like a poor farmer in medieval times. And what happens is you grow your crops, you grow your food, and what happens is the scumbag aristocrat comes to your land, comes to your land with um, a bunch of knights and just says, you give me 70% of your crops right now. Um, uh, and that's basically what happens. So the, the peasants would keep very little for themselves. The vast majority of it would go to the aristocrat and the aristocrat would tax the peasants heavily. And then what would happen is the aristocrats would work for the king or the queen. And so the aristocrats would exploit the poor, they would abuse the peasants, they would force them to work for them, they would heavily control the economy. And what would happen is the aristocrats, after they, they, they stole from the poor, would then give a cut of that to the king. And so that's how European kingdoms fu fu funded themselves for hundreds of years, that system. Feudalism was a little bit different in certain countries, like in Russia, feudalism was the worst. But it was, the, um, uh, but it was generally a similar concept around. It was that it was the aristocrat that would run things on the manor, the peasants would be forced to work for him, and the peasants would give him the majority of his crops. The Mongolians hated feudalism. They didn't have anything to, um, uh, uh, they, didn't, they didn't want anything to do with feudalism. And so this was, the Mongolians were more a tribal people, and they weren't, they weren't, a, a, they weren't based on equality, but they despised that system, like, you know, the, the whole aristocratic privilege system, stuff like that. Now, what the Mongolians did to 
to make so much money. So remember what I said about the European kingdoms. That's how European kingdoms funded themselves with the with the, with the feudal um uh, with the feudal um uh, manners and stuff like that. And because of that, they're not they're not making as much money as they possibly could. It's a system designed to keep the the rich up, keep the poor poor. That's what feudalism was. Uh, but they could make way more money using other systems and get much more tax money. But um, what the Mongolians did was the Mongolians, the Mongolians, you could argue, are the inventors of modern capitalism. You could argue that because people argue what civilization was the first capitalist civilization. I would say it's the Mongolian Empire was the first capitalist civilization. Uh, so how the Mongolians understood capitalism and they understood how to make money. The Mongolians understood that trade. They understood the value of trade and they understood that trade was vital to their empire and trade was vital to making them a lot of money. And so what the Mongolians did, they, they, they never forced their culture on another people. They never did. And that's one of the things that made them so effective. When they, ca when they came into a civilization, they conquered another civilization. They would tell that civilization, you're under the, um, the, you're under the Mongolian Empire now. You, you are under our, our law. You follow our laws. You, 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 um, uh, you follow our leader, Genghis Khan. But they didn't tell them, you, you cannot be a Christian anymore. Uh, you can't be Jewish. Um, you cannot be Muslim. You you were still allowed to keep whatever religion you were and whatever culture you were. You still had to pay taxes to the Mongolian Empire, and you had to rec you had to obey the Mongolian Empire. But they wouldn't go into your. They wouldn't tell you what r culture you could follow. They wouldn't try to force you to change their cult to to, your, to their culture. They wouldn't try to force you uh, their religion on you. Where most other civilizations did that back then. Most other civilizations they would force their culture on other people. Um, the, the civilization that was the worst with this was the Russians. The Russians were the worst with this throughout their history. They would conquer a people, and they would force the people to speak Russians. And they would force the people to speak Russian. They would force the people to speak Russian Orthodoxy. If you didn't listen to what the Russian uh, king, the Tsar, told you, they would deport you to the work camp. So the Russians were really bad with that. The Mongolians weren't, didn't do stuff like that. Um, the, now, the Mongolians were very brutal in their conquest. It's not to say that the Mongolians were good. They were very brutal. They were very... Um, uh, they were very they killed a lot of people. Millions of people died in the Mongolian conquest. A lot of people. But the Mongolian conquest went on for hundreds of years. So this went on for some time. But uh, the basically how it happened is it, the Mongolians, when they would come to a city, when they would try to take over a city, the Mongolians would typically tell that city to surrender. And if that city surrendered, generally the Mongolians would not kill the people in the city. Most of the time they wouldn't. They would come in the city, they would loot the city, sure. They would go into some homes and they would steal some stuff, the Mongolian soldiers would. But they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't just mass murder the whole city. Now, it's very different if you don't surrender. If you don't surrender and you fight against the Mongolians and they take the city, they're going to kill everyone, like most of the people. They're going to burn the city. They're going to destroy it. They'll keep some of the infrastructure so that they can keep that for their soldiers. But they'll kill a lot of people. They're going to they're gonna, literally um, they're gonna kill a lot of people. So that's why a lot of people ended up surrendering to the Mongolians because they knew that if they surrendered, they at least wouldn't be slaughtered. But if they fought and they were defeated, they'd be slaughtered. And that's exactly what happened to Baghdad. Baghdad, um, uh, the city in Iraq, refused to surrender. The Khan got really angry. And so the Khan um, had ordered the entire city to be destroyed once they took it. And the Mongolians murdered over a million people in that city. Baghdad was a massive city. It had millions of people in it back then. The Mongolians burned the entire city of Baghdad to the ground. They killed a million people in a few weeks. So it was one of the, the worst thing the Mongolians ever did was the, 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 the destruction of Baghdad. So they killed, like, they killed millions of people. They just went door to door just murdering everyone. But that's, that's what it was like. Um, if, you sur if you surrendered, they'd le leave you alone. But if you fought back against them, it was basically no mercy, just absolute brutality. And that's what made people so scared of the Mongolians was that it was the, the brutality of their, um, of their empire. But um, uh, to answer your question, to answer it further on about capitalism, how the Mongolians made money. They understood how vital trade was between, the, between their civilizations. And so but remember what I said earlier, they didn't force their culture on other people. And they, uh, they understood that, that by letting people keep their culture, they are going to, um, uh, that they are, they're, they're gonna have less rebellion, less resistance. Because most of the day, pe people, most of the day, people didn't really care, you know, who they were under, who, who ruled them. The only, the thing people cared about the most back then was if the person that ruled them was just to them, was fair to them. And it's, you know, it's it, true to an extent today, but people back then didn't have like, I, I would say like people back then didn't have a lot of the same national identity that they do today. Like people today will, um, uh, you know, they, even if somebody is ruling them, that's from like a different, um, uh, that's like an occupier, even if that occupier is, you know, treating them better than their, you know, than the people who rule their, their own people, they might still rebel against them because they want their identity protected. It's understandable. But back then, you know, people didn't have that same sense of national identity 
And so, you know, people didn't really care who their leader was as long as their leader treated them fair. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, people don't want to pay high taxes. They want to be able to keep their religion and their culture. So, you know, you keep, you keep your culture, keep your religion, and, pay, and don't pay high taxes. That's what people want most of the end of the day. And the Mongolians were very smart to understand this. The Mongolians had very low taxes. They had taxes, but they had low taxes. They didn't have high taxes under there. Where the European kingdoms, they taxed the living hell out of their people, out of their peasants. The Mongolians didn't really tax them. And so what that happened was because the Mongolians had so many cultures under their civilization, they facilitated trade. And so the Mongolians encouraged trade between the civilizations. So they would conquer one civilization and then a completely different civilization. And now they would encourage trade between the two civilizations. And so think about it this way. You conquer two civilizations, right? And each civilization has a completely different culture than, other, than the other civilization. They have different food. They, they, they have different clothes. They have different weapons, you know, uh, outfits, you know, you know uh, horses. You know, a, a bunch of different resources. Um, and so because of that, people from one civilization want what the other civilization has. And so the traders, the traders are going to fill that role. And because they're both under the Mongolian control, it's easy for traders to go back and forth between the civilizations. And the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the Silk Road, the Silk Road was a road that stretched from China all the way to Europe. It was like a big road. And what, what happened, the, the, the Mongolians weren't the ones who built the Silk Road but they were the ones who revolutionized the Silk Road. Because what the Mongolians did, the Mongolians had such a massive army, they had millions of soldiers. They had such a huge army that they put a checkpoint every mile on the Silk Road. Every mile there was a checkpoint on, on the Silk Road. That, 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 was, um, uh, that was every mile, it was like that. And so what that meant was, that was security. So think about it this way. If you are, if you are a merchant, if you're, if you're somebody that sells stuff, you're gonna love Mongolian rule because you have low taxes and you have security and you have easy transportation between the cities because, uh, because of that. So uh, traders, people could walk the Silk Road between cities they could, and they, they, they would know there's Mongolian soldiers every few miles. And so they wouldn't have to worry about bandits, highwaymen, highwaymen. There would be people that would sit on the, on the road and wait for you and they'd ambush you and they'd kill you and take your stuff. So they knew that they, the Mongolians were very good at that. They were very good at protecting the Silk Road and they, the Mongolians did protect their people. So they, and they wasn't, and they didn't just extend this to Mongolians. So anybody that, anybody that they conquered that was a loyal subject, they would protect them. So they'd protect them from bandits. So this was anybody, this was, you know, this was even Eastern Europeans. This was, um, uh, this was uh, people that were in the Middle East, Arabs. This would be people that were in Central Asia and, and also East Asians. So if you were, you know, a loyal subject of the Mongolian empire, they would protect you. So that was, um, people, uh, people knew the Silk Road was safe to travel. And so because of that, this is what I'm getting at. This is how the Mongolians understood capitalism. They understood how to make money. They would use the Silk Road. They would encourage trade. They would, they would come into a civilization and they tell them, we're going to let you keep your culture. We're going to let you keep your, um, uh, we're gonna let you keep your, your, your language. We're going to let you keep your religion. You just have to obey our rules from now on. And so most people at the end of the day are going to say, okay, fine. Um, uh, if I get to keep my culture and my religion and I pay low taxes, then I'll accept it. So that's why some people welcome the Mongolians because they knew they were going to they were gonna have a, a little bit better lives than under the people who, you know, their feudal masters who controlled them beforehand. Um, and so the traders, the traders made so much money. The traders would go between towns and the Mongolian, the, the, the cities the Mongolians controlled had different stuff from all over the world because the Mongolians, their empire stretched from China all the way to Eastern Europe. So now their, their cities had stuff from all over the world and the Mongolians weren't just efficient at selling stuff from, from places to places. They were efficient at using military technology. So a lot, they, they used military technology from other civilizations. They did it all the time. Um, they, the Mongolians used gunpowder from China. They took gunpowder and they used guns from China. They did. In, in, um, in Ghost of Tsushima, if anybody plays Ghost of Tsushima, you know the big guy that has like that big cannon gun? That's from China. That's a weapon from China that they used. The Mongolians used the trebuchets. The trebuchets were weapons from Eastern Europe that they had gotten. The trebuchet was a weapon that existed all around, but the Mongolians had mostly gotten the idea from, from Eastern Europe. The trebuchet is that big catapult, you know, the big thing that like throws like uh, flaming rocks and stuff like that. The Mong in Ghost of Tsushima, the Mongolians used it when they attacked um, uh, the, the village. I to remember the name of the village. So that's a European weapon. They have a European weapon, a Chinese weapon, and they have a Korean weapon, the Huacha. The Huacha is that like that big like um, flaming arrow thing. It's like that thing on the tower. It fires like a hundred flaming arrows at once. 
that the Huacha was, but, but the, the one thing Ghost of Tsushima got wrong, the Ghost of Tsushima was very historically accurate in the fact that the Mongolians used weapons from different civilizations. I love that because I was very concerned with how they were going to portray the, 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 the weapons that the Mongolians were going to use. And I absolutely love that in Ghost of Tsushima, that they, that they show that the Mongolians use weapons from different civilizations. Um, but the one thing that Ghost of Tsushima did get wrong, it got wrong that the Mongolians had the Huacha. That was wrong because the Mongolians did use the Huacha, but they didn't use it in Japan because the Huacha was invented over 100 years after Ghost of Tsushima. But they, brought the, they showed the Huacha in the game. It was, just a, it was a fun weapon to use, so that's, they brought it in for gameplay reasons. Mongolians did use the Huacha, but not in Japan. So that's one thing Ghost of Tsushima did get, um, did get, did get right. So the Mongolians made hundreds of millions of dollars by facilitating trade between the civilizations. They would encourage the trade between the towns, and so that's, they had low taxes. People, people made money, and so the merchants made a lot of money. People were, they were able to grow the economy. So the Mongolians understood how capitalism works, and they made a lot of money from that. And that's how they were able to, um, you know, get a lot of money. That's, how able, they, that's where they had the money to build all their ships. You see all the ships in, in Ghost of Tsushima, you see all those hundreds of ships that are invaded. That's where they got the money for that. It was through the trade. Um, so they, they, they understood capitalism. They knew how to make money with it. And you're probably wondering, okay, professional, if the Mongolians had low taxes, how did they fund their army? How did they fund that huge army? The, the way the Mongolians funded their army was also genius. They were very smart in how they funded their army. You know how they funded that huge army? They used tax money to build the ships. But do you know how they funded the soldiers? They didn't. That's the fake. And you're probably thinking to yourself, how? It's like not paying a soldier is a recipe for disaster because if you don't pay a soldier, you're gonna have you're gonna have mutinies and you're gonna have um and you're gonna have soldiers who are gonna you know their morale is gonna be really low. So paying not paying soldiers is a bad idea, but it's it's not that they necessarily didn't pay soldiers, but they did. It's how they paid them. It's um soldiers were not given a pay every month because back then when you were like a knight. In the, in the medieval era, you would get like a specific amount of coins like every month or something like that. It wasn't a lot, but that's how they, you know, they got paid. Um, that's how mercenaries got paid back then also in like the medieval era. The Mongolians, how they paid their soldiers is they told them that they're not getting like a pay every month, but instead they're being, they're being promised adventure and they're being told that anything that they get on their conquest, they get to keep. So think about that. Your leader tells you that when you go on a conquest, you get to keep what you find. And so that that encouraged a lot of them. They 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 a lot of them they they were very a lot of them wanted to adventure. They wanted to see the world. The, a lot of the Mongolian soldiers, and they also wanted to get stuff. So they would you know they would they would they would tell them that you know we we if we go on a conquering we take a city or something like that you get to keep stuff. That's what they uh they, that's how they would pay their soldiers. They would pay their soldiers in the stuff that they would conquer. So when they took another civilization, there would be looting. And this system worked. It was very effective because the Mongolians didn't have to spend millions of dollars on their military and they kept their soldiers happy because their soldiers knew that they would take stuff. Now, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, the loot was divided. It wasn't that just one soldier could take whatever they wanted. It was a specific division of loot. How the Mongolian commanders would assign that. But that's, that's how they funded their army. They didn't pay them like every month. They would, um, they would tell them whatever loot you, know, you, 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 um, uh, you, know, you find, you get to keep. And so that was that. In Ghost of Tsushima, you see how the Mongolian soldiers are like looting like these ja Japanese homes and stuff like that? It's because they don't get paid. They get paid through their loot. And so that's, um, that's why they're looting like, uh, that's why the Mongolian, that's why, because when, when people think of the Mongolian army, they think of looting. They think of the Mongolian army. But there's a reason. Why does the Mongolian army loot so much? It's because they didn't get paid that way. Their payment was the loot. That was the whole thing. Now, now I'm not saying that that's a, that's a good thing. Um, you know, they, they stole stuff. They took stuff from people. But that's how, the, I'm saying that it was a genius idea to fund their military like that. I'm not saying that the Mongolians were good in what they did. But I'm saying it was very smart because they didn't have to, they didn't have to fund their military entirely like that. And they didn't have to, they, they could spend money on other stuff. So that's ultimately why it was. The Mongolians understood capitalism. They understood low taxes. And they understood, you know, how to make money for their civilization. And so they were very intelligent in that. They understood, they, they understood not, to, not to push their culture on other people. They understood, you know, let people keep their culture and their language and don't tax them a lot and they won't rebel. And so that's... Um, that was, you know, ultimately, you know, wh why, why the Mongolians were so successful. Because when people think of the Mongolians, they just think of the conquest, but they don't think of why the conquests were so successful. And another, another reason, another reason the Mongolians were so successful in their conquest is because the Mongolians were really good riders. They were really good. And remember what I said about the, the, the road, how they had like a checkpoint every mile on the Silk Road? The Silk Road went on for hundreds of miles, hundreds of miles, and they had a checkpoint every road. And so that's, that's how big the Mongolian army is. Imagine having a checkpoint every mile for hundreds of miles. That's how big their army was. And these checkpoints that the Mongolians had, a, Mo a Mongolian soldier 
like a Mongolians could get messages out really quickly. So a Mongol, a Mongolian commander would give his one, one of his soldiers a message and tell him, "You give the other soldier, you give the other general this message." And so the soldier would ride down the Silk Road, and he would ride as fast as he possibly could. Now, people who are riders know that they, they I, I'm not a horse rider, but I know that you can't, you cannot tire out a horse like completely. Like there's a specific pace that you have to ride at. You can't ride super fast because if you ride super fast, you're going to tire the horse out. You have to ride at an average speed. But the Mongolian riders were able to ride at super fast speeds. And the reason for that is they would tire out the horse really quickly, but they would have a checkpoint every mile. So they could they could ride a few miles with the horse till the horse is, is very tired, and they could stop at a checkpoint, stop at a checkpoint, leave the horse there, and get a fresh horse from the checkpoint that's not tired, and then ride. And, and, and then they could ride for a few more miles, and then they could stop at the next checkpoint. They could get a hot meal, because there were like inns a lot of times at these, at these checkpoints. They could get a hot meal, they could sleep, and then they could ride out first thing in the morning and go and repeat the same process. And that's how the Mongolians were able to cover so much distance so fast in, back then over a thousand years ago, because of that. They were very smart. They knew how to maintain the roads. The, the trade roads, they knew how to, they knew trade was important to civilization, they understood capitalism, they understood not to let a, another, you know, force your culture on other people, and I'm not saying the Mongolians were good, you know, by any means, what I'm saying is their conquests, their policies, they were very smart in their conquests. Now, if I was alive back then, I would have fought against them probably, well, most people would have, you probably wouldn't have wanted to be under their control. What I'm saying is they understood how to, they understood um, uh, how to quell resistance, they understood, um, uh, not to interfere in people's culture. They understood how to grow the economy. They understood that trade and merchants are very important to growing the economy and making a lot of money. They understood the transportation trade, horses. Um, uh, they understood how to use weapons from different civilizations. They would adapt to other technologies. So they were uh, they were a very smart civilization. So and when I when I see people when I see people say the Mongolians were like mindless barbarians, it's not true. The Mongolians were very 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 smart. Very, very, very smart in their technology. They were, they were very brutal, but they were very, very smart, and uh, so they were. That's why their their empire was so successful in their conquests. Um, and so, like you know, even in like even in like Ghost of Tsushima, when the Khan says like the Khan tells him that he's gonna like he's gonna um uh, that he's gonna let his he, give his people peace and everything like that. To an extent, he probably does mean it. Like the Khan's a bad guy, but he does probably mean it to an extent because you know if the if the if the uh, people on Tsushima Island would have stopped resisting, the Mongolians would have occupied them or probably would have left them alone. But they had a right to resist also, so it was their land, and they didn't want their land taken. So it's completely understandable why they're resisting. But um uh, yeah, so it was the the sound the. The, the people on Tsushima Island were heroes fighting against the Mongolians, but you know there's you know I'm explaining basically how the Mongolians funded their military, and uh, you know that. But um, you know going back to Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan was like a very like um uh, uh, he was a very uh, uh, a strange guy because Genghis Khan, uh, for example, hated uh, privilege that I talked about earlier. He outlawed torture. Like Genghis Khan thought that torture was wrong, but even though he outlawed torture, he wrote laws banning torture. We know that his soldiers didn't follow that. So his soldiers didn't follow through that. So his soldiers tortured plenty of people. So that's what we know about. But people don't realize the the the, the Mongolian conquests are like so like um they they are just so crazy. There's like so it's like it goes all the way from China to Eastern Europe. That's how crazy it is. That's what the the, the whole Mongolian conquest. And um uh, on on my dad's side, on my dad's side, like you know hundreds of years back, there's actually some Mongolian ancestry. On my dad's ancestry, on my dad's ancestry, that's how crazy it is with the uh, Mongolian conquest. Now, I'm not um, uh, my my family comes completely is from Poland, but the reason that there's a tiny uh, some some Mongolian ancestry on my father's part is because of the conquest. Because like over a thousand years ago, the Mongolians invaded Poland. Yeah, they invaded Poland. So that's that's it. So like there are so many people from Eastern Europe to like the Middle East to like Central Asia to East Asia that if you you know you do DNA tests and all that other stuff, you can trace your roots back to like even to even Mongolians on certain parts of your family. I think a lot of people would be very surprised on how much um uh, how much that is because that's because of the empire. That's what it's um that that's ultimately what it what it's um you know they were very strong in their empire. But do you know what brought down the Mongolian Empire? What brought down their Mongolian Empire? Like, um, I would say for, like, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was brought down by incompetence. It was brought down by stupid leaders. Um, but the, um, bad policies. But the Mongolian Empire wasn't brought down by bad policies. It wasn't brought down by their economy. Their economy was fine. The reason that the Mongolian Empire actually collapsed was, it was because of a leadership struggle. That's ultimately why. Because when Genghis Khan died, he didn't appoint a successor. He didn't. And because because Genghis Khan didn't appoint a successor, everybody starts fighting. Everybody. 
over who the rightful Khan is. And so one guy says, I should be the Khan. The other guy says, no, I should be the Khan. And so Mongolia basically went into a civil war. And that's how their empire collapsed. It went to several different regions. You know, you had you had the um, the Qing, Qing di the dynasty in China. I, I, I think that's what it's called. That was the Mongolian dynasty. Then you had the Golden Horde in Central Asia. That was another um, uh, Mongolian breakaway. So that's, you had like these small, like, um, uh, these, these other Mongolian regions that all broke away because of that. Um, so it was because, the, but the, the thing about that is the Mongolian Empire could have survived. It could have. If, the, if Genghis Khan had simply appointed a successor, if he would have said, this is who my next successor is, if he would have outlined it, had witnesses and everything like that, then that would have, um, uh, the Mongolian Empire very well could have survived. And even today, today the Mongolian Empire could have possibly survived. I, I even think, believe that today, that it could have even lasted that long um, uh, because they were just so rich, they were so powerful, and people didn't generally rebel in their ter territories. Like I said, they left people's culture alone. And the, the, what, it, what makes people rebel? What makes people rebel? High taxes and also trying to force your will on people. When you force your will on people, you tell them you can't speak your language, you can't practice your religion, and you put high taxes on them, you're going to cause them to rebel. But people, because low taxes and also keeping your culture, that's how the Mongolians were able to keep people from rebelling in their territories. And so if the Mongolian Empire existed today, it would probably be one giant country today. It would probably be one giant Mongolian country today. Um, I don't know if it would necessarily be called the Mongolian Empire. It might be. It might be like. It, it might be like some like some giant United States. That's basically what it might be. It might be like because because it has so many different cu cultures and people in it. It would it would have. It would probably be like a giant like United country. It would be like a country of like different like cultures and stuff. So it wouldn't be se specifically centered Mongol Mongolia. But it would probably be like one country united together um, on their everything. Whether their capital would be in Mongolia, I don't know. But um, I think that if if Genghis Khan had appointed a successor, it's entirely possible the Mongolian Empire would have survived and um, existed today. Um, I don't know if that necessarily would be a good thing. I think that would probably be a bad thing because, like, um, uh, you know, people ultimately want to be in their own countries and they want to be able to rule themselves. So it's um, uh, but it's uh, that's you know an interesting history to think about. What happens if the Mongolian Empire survived? The world would be a very different place. A lot of people don't think about that. The Mongolians had controlled like 25% of the entire world. That's how that's how much they controlled. So that's like um, a quarter of the entire world the Mongolians be. had controlled, and that was um, that's ultimately that. But that's that. Yeah. I hope that answered the question. Um, I'm sorry it if I, I talk too much. To see about the um, about the uh, Mongolian Empire, like how World War Two would have played out if the Mongolian Empire would still be here. That's like an interesting. Thing oh well, to think Japan about would Japan saying. would have had no chance to. Um, uh, but the thing is, Japan probably would have ended up becoming part of the Mongolian Empire eventually, um, if they had if it hadn't collapsed. Yeah. But that's that's um. Uh, that. Thank you, Reedy, for the sponsoring my channel again. Let me see here. Um, Napoleon was a very intelligent man until he invaded Russia. Both Napoleon and Hitler sealed their fate when they invaded Russia and the USSR. Um, yeah, but the thing is, though, is that Napoleon actually ended up taking Moscow, Edgy. He took Moscow. Um, Hitler never took Moscow. However, though, he wasn't able to hold it. Um, what do you think of the British Empire's push to abolish slavery in the 19th century? Um, it was a good thing. You know, Britain, uh, Britain, I, Britain was the first Western um, uh, empire to abolish slavery, so they ended it. Um, thank you for the um, thank you for the super chat, Mario. Let me see here. Um, probably a lot of questions. Um, is this why the Mongolians are evil in Ghost of Tsushima? Um, thank you, Side. Well, they're invaders. You know, they're 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 trying to take over. You know, they're they're trying to take over their country. They're trying to take over their land. Um, that's um, you know, ultimately that. You know, the samurai are you know the good guys in that case. They're defending their their land and their people. Um, uh, but I was explaining earlier. I was explaining why the Mongolians were so successful in their conquest. Oh yeah. And there's one final thing I forgot to mention. One other thing about the Mongolians. The reason, that, another reason they were so successful. It, the, it was the trade. The trade made them money. They understood capitalism. They knew how to finance a military really well. Um, they were they knew how to revolutionize roads and trades. Um, but also, the Mongolians were really good warriors. That's it. Um, and what I mean by that is that nothing would stop the Mongolian army. And I mean nothing would stop them. Um, and what I mean by that is it doesn't matter the weather. It doesn't matter what weather you have. You will not stop the Mongolian army. The Mongolian army might be slowed down by bad weather, but they aren't going to be stopped by bad weather. A lot of armies throughout history have been stopped by bad weather. Um, the Nazis have been stopped by bad weather in the Soviet Union in the wintertime. Napoleon was stopped in, in Russia also in the wintertime. But, and this is what I'm going to tell people. People are not going to believe me when I tell you this. The Mongolians invaded Russia in the wintertime. They did. And they conquered Russia. The Mongolians were w one of the only civilizations that ever conquered Russia. 
there was um there was uh there was three um there was only really two civilizations that I can think of that conquered Russia throughout history. That was the Mongolians that conquered Russia. They were the ones who conquered it. Because when people tell you Russia's never been conquered, it's not true. Western Russia got conquered by the Mongolians. It did. Um, uh, is um, uh, The other ones were the Polish. The Polish invaded Russia in 1612. Uh, so, or, or actually earlier before 1612. 1612 was the major battle. But the Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth invaded Russia, and they took Moscow, and they held it for a few years. So Poland had invaded Russia and taken Russia. So Poland and Mongolia, I think there might be somebody else. The French were the closest other ones to take Russia. The French got closer to taking Russia than, than the Nazis did when the, during Napoleon's time. Uh, but, um, yeah, so that, it was the Mongolians that had conquered Russia. And you're probably thinking, why the hell would the Mongolians invade in the wintertime? Why? And why would they invade in the winter time? Because it was actually easier for them to invade in the winter time. The Mongolians liked invading in Russia in the winter. Why? Why would it be easier? The Mongolians aren't using cars. If they were using cars and trucks and tanks, it'd be harder in the winter time. They're using horses. And so um, horses aren't slowed down by snow as much as cars and, and trucks are. And so what the, Mon the, Mon the reason the Mongolians liked invading Russia in the winter is because of the ice. They would cross the Russian lakes across on the ice with their armies, their cavalry armies. So that's why. So nobody else has invaded Russia in the wintertime. Uh, other armies who invaded Russia, they invaded Russia in the summertime or the spring, and then it would turn winter and they would get stuck there. But the, um, the Mongolians invaded Russia in the wintertime. And do you know what else? The Mongolians invaded the Middle East in the summer. So they invaded the Middle East in the summer, and they invaded Russia in the wintertime. And neither the Middle Eastern heat nor the Russian winter stopped them. So the Mongolians are, like, unstoppable when it comes to the weather. The weather will not stop them. And you're probably wondering why. Why does the, wet, why does the cold winter and the extreme heat not stop them? The reason is because of Mongolia's climate. Mongolia has one of the strangest climates in the world. It has a very, very strange climate um, for a country. Because typically, there's typically three types of climates in the world. There's a, real, a cold climate. A cold climate that you would think of Russia. You would think of like a hot climate like the Middle East or a tropical climate. Um, and then there's the, the climate that's in the middle. Like something like North America, like a middle climate where you have know, all four seasons and stuff like that. But what Mongolia basically has, their country is a desert country. So Mongolia is desert and, and steppes. Steppes are like plains. So they have like de the Gobi Desert and they have like plains. And, and, and those, those plains get really hot in the summertime. Like very, very, very hot. I'm saying like over 120 degrees in Mongolia. But in the winter time, it gets really, really cold. Mongolian winters are also really brutal, just as brutal as Russian winters. And so it's like you can get negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit in, in the winter time. And so because of that, Mongolia is like one of the few countries in the world that has extreme heat and extreme cold. There's very few countries that have that type of temperature with extreme heat and extreme cold. But Mongolia has that extreme heat in the summer, extreme cold in the winter time. Um, where some countries have just extreme cold, but maybe hot summers. But Mongolia is both extreme cold and extreme heat. And because of that, their people are used to both temperatures. And so it's like, look, look at what happened to the Russians when they invaded Afghanistan in the, in the, um, the Soviet-Afghan war. Like, um, some, some parts of Afghanistan, like the mountainous regions, are like really um, cold. But like some of the other parts of it are really hot. And so the Russian soldiers, the Soviet soldiers, definitely suffered because of the heat. Because even though R R Soviet soldiers were good at fighting in the cold, they weren't good at fighting in the extreme heat. And so that's their weakness. And so the Mongolians don't have that weakness. They're used to both the cold and the heat. Like me, I'm personally like, you know, I'm personally like a cold guy. Like, you know, I guess it's because I'm Polish. Like, I, 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 live, I live in the upper Midwest. So I live in the really cold part of the Midwest. And, you know, where I live, you know, right now it's 19 degrees Fahrenheit. And it can get to, um, it can get to minus 20, minus 30 where I live in the wintertime. And that doesn't bother me. Like, you know, it's sure, I'll, I'll say that it's really cold. But it's not like, you know, it's, it's not like it's gonna, it's gonna really, really badly affect me. Like, I, I've been outside when it was minus 20. It was really annoying, sure, but I went to do groceries. I didn't stay outside for, you know, but I went outside once in the last winter when it was really cold, minus 20, and I actually went and did groceries. Probably should have waited till it was a little warmer, but I went outside, I did groceries, and, you know, I, I, I handled it. And, um, you know, I, I didn't stay outside for very long, but I, but I you know, went, went to the store and, you know, got groceries. But the, um, uh, I, could, I could stand outside, like, like me personally, for example, when I bought my PS, when I bought my PS5, I stood outside for hours, like in the Midwestern, like, um, uh, in the Midwestern, like, um, uh, uh, North, North Midwestern, like climate. And it was 10 degrees in November. Like that was two years ago. I stood outside. I stood outside for about two hours in 10 degrees. 
It was, it was, a, you know, it wasn't like, I would say, easy, but it wasn't like, you know, killing me or anything. It wasn't like to the point where I was just going to go back to my car. It was a little annoying, but I could, I could handle it. Um, but, like, a lot of the other people that I looked at when they were online with me were, like, you know, shivering and stuff like that. But I was just, like, um, uh, I, I, I mean, I know it's a little hard to believe. I was a little cold, too, but I wasn't, like, shivering. I was, like, you know, eh, handling it. The other, the other people, there was only three PlayStation 5s in the store. I got one. And uh, the other people missed out on it because they wanted to sit in their cars in the heat. And so that was it. But my point is, if I, if I have to stand outside in, like, in, in getting, waiting for a PlayStation for, like, th two, two hours in, like, 10-degree weather, I'll handle it. It's, it's going to be annoying, but I'll handle it. But if I have to stand outside in 120 degrees for literally uh, two hours, I'm not doing it. Like, I would go back to my, I would go back home. So I wouldn't have done it. So the point that I'm making is that... Different people are used to different climates. I'm used to the cold. I'm perfectly fine with the cold. That's why I, I, I tolerate the upper Midwest. I'm originally from New York, but the cold doesn't affect me. And so I can tolerate this climate. But like somebody else might yeah, not be able to tolerate it. And that's, that's, what, that's what people miss. Like people, people, talk about, people talk about how Russians are impervious to the cold. They talk about how, they talk about how no, the, the winters can't stop the Russians. But what about the extreme heat? Because that would be very different. Because even though Russians are used to the extreme cold, they're not used to the extreme heat. They're used to the summertime in their country, sure. But then go to a tropical country, and you know, and and you know, they it would be much harder for them. I'm telling you that. So, but the Mongolians, they're used to both uh, extreme heat and extreme cold, and so nothing is going to stop them. And so that's why I say the Mongolians were the greatest conquerors in history. I'm not saying they were a good civilization. I'm, not, I'm saying they were great in that they were they were very effective in taking land. They were very effective in conquering very fast. They knew trade understood trade, understood, you know, transportation. They understood how to, you know, uh, maximize their military. They understood, you know, uh, make a ton of money. They, they were very, they, no, no cold or hot temperature would bother them. They were really good cavalry riders. Um, so the, yeah, the Mongolians were the greatest conquerors and they, they could have possibly, if the Mongolians kept going, they could have conquered the world. Like honestly, I don't think they would have, you know, invaded like, you know, South and North America. But what I'm saying is they probably could have taken all of Europe if they wanted to, like eventually, like uh, at some point. Like if they just kept going in their conquest, you know, it, it was a, a thousand years ago. So, you know, they don't have the greatest technology. But, you know, imagine like, you know, Imagine if they if, if they if they had like technology like during the uh, if they if they if they had much better technology like because their empire had fallen apart so they really it was harder for them to you know, to grow but imagine if they like during the Napoleonic era if they had like all of that that's the same like resources that like a country like France or Britain had like during the Napoleonic era like they had battleships with like you know cannons on them and everything like that and they had like you know muskets and they had like cannons I think that they could have been unstoppable so that's like um, uh, I would say Mongolians were the greatest conquerors and and if for Ghost of Tsushima I would say they're their portrayal in Ghost of Tsushima is pretty historically accurate. I would say I would agree with that. Um, uh, it was. Um, I think they did a pretty good job of portraying the the, the Mongolians. Um, they um, they 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 had that talisman. You know that medal in Ghost of Tsushima that they had. That like the collaborators, the Japanese that would work with the Mongolians, would had that specific medal, and so they would show that medal to the Mongolian soldiers, and Mongolian soldiers would know that they're that they're an ally. And so that was actually a real thing. The Mongolians would actually give those medals out to people who were loyal to them. And so they would give that out to people. And so even though they didn't speak the Mongolian language, they would just show that to the Mongolian soldiers. And the Mongolian soldiers would know that they were friendly. And so that was, um, uh, that was an actual thing. But that, I hope that answered your question about what if I think what I think of Genghis Khan as a conqueror. That was a very long reply. Um, hey, Pro, I love your content. Thank you, Taco. I'm sorry if I talk a lot of history, guys. I love history. And so I can just go on and on talking. About it. I know it's weird talking on Reddit online stream. But, um, you know, hey, it's, it's, it's Veterans Day. And I was, um, uh, and I was, um, you know, I, I want to talk about military history a little bit and, you know, talk about things. Um, thank you, Purple Haze, for the super chat also. Um, I'm saying Napoleon committed the same mistake as Hitler um, uh, since uh, both lost their armies in Rus uh, Russia. Wasn't Russia also not a country during the Mongols since it was just a Kievan Rus? Um, it was a, a kingdom. It was a bunch of kingdoms, basically what it was, but it did get fully conquered. So that's, um, uh, yes. Thank you, Edgy, for that super chat. Um. Yes, I am going to talk about in my Saints Row review. Um, uh, I, my contr my course keeps moving, even though I, I'm I'm not my the stick drift is ridiculous. But yeah, um, but yeah, I I wouldn't be able to. Um, British Empire were the strongest. Well, the the British did not have the manpower that the Mongolians did. The Mongolians had much greater manpower than the British did. The British had more advanced technology. 
than the Mongolians, but they didn't have the manpower the Mongolians did. And the British used a lot of um, uh, the British used a lot of soldiers that were from their um, their colonies. Well, I, to be fair, the Mongolians did also from their lands. They used a lot of soldiers from the conquered lands. Um, Oh yeah, Ru well Russia failed in the Winter War. I mean, technically the Finns had to give up part of their land, but it was a, it was not a Russian victory by any means. Um, uh, oh no. I think samurai was a high rank in a warrior class. Well, I, I guess this this will probably be the last um uh. This will be the last thing I say on history because my throat's actually hurting because I talk too much. Um, but um, the samurai were not just warriors. Um, that's that's a difference be between them and medieval knights. Like a lot of people compare samurai to knights, but it's very different. Um, it's not just about the weapons they use or the armor that they have. Knights in in medieval Europe were mostly just soldiers. They were just soldiers. Um, uh, but in Japan, samurai weren't just soldiers. They were a class. They were a protected class. They were a class of elites. The samurai were the ones who ruled Japan. Um, so they, the, sam the samurai were almost like aristocrats. And um, what I'll say about the samurai is that th the samurai are not like you think in like a lot of movies. Like a lot of movies and games, you look at the samurai and you think of like these honorable soldiers who always did the right thing. That's not true. There were, def there were definitely good samurai. There were samurai who did honorable things and, you know, did good things. I'm not denying that. But I'm saying it's this idea that the average samurai was just a good person and, like, an honorable person. It wasn't true. A lot of the samurai were massive scumbags. Really bad people. And what I mean by that is the samurai would harass peasants. Like, the Japanese peasantry. So the peasants would... There's, there's a reason this, the peasants call samurai lords. There's a reason for that. Like, in Ghost of Shushima, they, they call him Lord Lord Sakai. But, um, but, but you know, Jin is a good person. He's not one of those scumbag samurai. Um, or technically, he's not even a samurai anymore because he realized how stupid the samurai were being. They kicked him out. But he was... Um, Jin was a person that was able to sympathize with the poor more, and so he was like he was. Jin was a man of the people. He was a man of, like, of the poor, and so the, the the peasants were able to sympathize with him a lot. But the the samurai um, uh, were they extorted a lot of poor people. Like so, a lot of the peasants were forced to give their stuff to the samurai. So the the like imagine basically it the the imagine you being like a poor peasant in something like that, and the samurai roll into your village one night. Or something like that. They're traveling between towns. They force their way into your home. They force you to cook for them. And not only that, they also tell you, you gotta sleep outside. I'm sleeping in your bed. And that's that. And then the next, the next, the next day they might leave or they might not. But that's what the samurai did. They did things like that. They would harass the poor people. And uh, and a lot of people don't know this. This isn't portrayed in a lot of movies and games. And so people think of this like, you know, honorable class of soldier, which that's that's not true. A lot of them were scumbags, and they were uh, you know elites. They were you know elites that abused the poor. They were samurai were very rich people typically. They were not poor people, usually. So when you were a samurai, that meant a lot. Like you were, it was an extremely important title because you could be a great warrior, but it didn't really mean much if you weren't a samurai. Samurai meant much more. So that's pretty much about that, but a lot of people don't know that. Um, the second strongest empire was the Mongolian Empire. Um, uh, it, 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 I, I don't know if you can really compare the British Empire to the Mongolian Empire, because the British Empire came much later, you know, came hundreds of years later. But I would say, though, if the, if the Mongolian Empire went up against the Kingdom of England, it would have lost. Uh, England would have lost. Definitely. Like, if they, like, Mongolia would, didn't conquer Western Europe, but if, like, if England and Mongolia went to a war back then, you know, you know, um, England would have lost to the Mongolians. Uh, the, there's no way that the, that the English would have beaten the Mongolians at that time. Um, you know, nobody could beat the Mongolians. There's very few people that were able to actually take them on and defeat them fully. There were some victories that people had, but, you know, it was very hard to defeat them. Um, but I would say, though, if the British Empire went up against the Mongolians, the British Empire would win. So that's, like, um, uh, that's, it depends on the time period. Um, a peri a pe opinion on Ronin. Well, Ronin are people who are not samurai. You know, they want to be samurai, but, uh, you know, there's... Um... Mongolian taxes were low because they only tax of Capitale. <laughs> uh -huh. Hey, can you help me sell next time? Um... Uh... You stream on GTA 5 because my birthday is next Sunday, and you are uh, sure my super chat is not there. Can I add you on PS4? Um, I'll take a look. Um, uh, I don't think I saw a super chat from you out here, but uh, I can hear you talk about history for hours. Thank you. Do you guys like it when I talk about history, or do you like 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 me avoiding subjects like this? But I I know history really well. Like I I read a lot, 
and so like I can just talk at hours about like a lot of different subjects. But like Mongolian Empire was like one thing I like to read about, and so I was always fascinated. I was always fascinated with how they managed to like you know run such a big empire, and so that's how I like I know a lot of the stuff that I was talking about them previously. But they were um. They were uh, very, um, uh, they were very smart. You know, for people, for people, for people to say the Mongolians were mindless barbarians is stupid. They wouldn't, if they were mindless barbarians, they wouldn't have become such a big empire as they are. Uh, I'm heading out now. Okay, I'll see you. Good night, man. Take care. All right. Okay, let me see here. Um. I don't think I see your your um. Twice now. No, I don't think I see your super chat here. Um, uh, who was it that uh, Mr. Blank? I don't think I see your super chat. You don't even need to. You don't need a super chat to ask me a question. Don't worry. What's your question? Just ask me, or I'll answer you right now. But like, don't think I always guys. I always appreciate any donation that people give me. But you don't have to give me a donation for me to answer a question. They, I, I wasn't answering questions before because I was talking about my stories. When I was talking about my stories, I'm kind of distracted with what I'm saying right now. But you know, just don't think you have to give me a donation for me to read your your comment. I'll, I'll I try reading as many comments as I can. I might not see your comment right away, but. I Try reading as many comments as I can. Um, I'm good. Um, uh, I'm good, man. How are you? Uh, hey, pro. I'm looking forward to your Saints Row reboot, um, also known as Fortnite clone, and also your review. Are you gonna do a comparison between Saints Row 2 and Saints Row uh, reboot and the cringe com compilation of your what reaction? Yeah. Yeah, that's um. Uh, I will um uh I'll, I'll I will do some of my reactions in the um Those who don't know their history doomed to repeat it. Yeah, well, it's everyone everyone should um everyone should like um uh everyone should know their country's history and like every everyone should know their bad history and their good history as well. It's important to know the good things that your country d did, but it's also important to know the bad things your country did. So you're proud of your accomplishments and you're proud of the good things, but you also admit the bad things that your country does and you also learn from those mistakes and never repeat them. That's why history is so important. Oh, that's a weird comparison complete quiz. I would say the Butcher from Modern Warfare 2019. <sighs> well, it looks like my controller's busted, guys. Look. See this? Oh, wait. Let's see. I gotta shake the controller a little bit. Yep, see? See, look. I'm not even touching it, and it's moving right now. And that's, um, uh, that's because stick drift. Yay! Busted controller, right? Wonderful. Um, but I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to, I, I don't know. Is there, can I get this thing fixed? Does anybody know? Because this, this just happened yesterday. Yesterday, my controller got this issue. I'm getting bad stick drift to the left side, and I don't know what I can do about this now. Like, can I get this fixed or not? Because this controller is fine for the most part, just this keeps going to the left. But it's, um, uh, this is just... Yeah, this this is really annoying, and I'm never I'm not playing any Sniper Elite because a Sniper Elite I need to be precise, and it's just this 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 is just uh, yeah. What the what the, what the hell is that? Okay. It's a raccoon. It's trying to kill you. Can they even kill you in this game? I think so if your health's low enough. I 100% agree with you, personally. You know what you're talking about. Thank you, gaming legend. Is it under a year old? Um, yes, it is. It is under a year old. Um, this. This 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 control this controller actually comes. This controller right here is actually from um uh it's from my PS5 back in home in um well my parents' house in New York because I have two PS5s. Um, because my mom ended up buying me a second PS5, which I'm very grateful for, but, you know, she didn't need to do that. But basically, um, my mom, um, uh, you know, my mom bought me a second P PlayStation 5, 
And the reason she bought me the second PlayStation 5 is so that when I visit, because when I visit, like, you know, New York, because that's where my parents live, I live in the Midwest. But when I visit New York, that I, um, I don't have to, like, you know, take my PlayStation back and forth with me. And so it's, um, uh, and so this controller was actually from that PlayStation 5, and so I brought, the, the, you know, the controller with me to the Midwest. So this controller is under, like, under a year old. Um, but, yeah. Where's your other PS5 um, controller, Pat? Like the one that came with your first PS5? Does that oh, have it, it, it was busted. It, it got stick drifts. I, oh. I've lost two PS5 controllers to stick drift already, and this is my third controller that I've lost to it. You know, you'd think that Sony would fix a problem like this. That this would, this would, you, know, you pay sixty dollars for a controller like this, they better fix it. Like it's just, it, it's ridiculous. It's just, it's just that. It's not even. It's about me. It's about the common person. The common person, like you know, you know, sixty dollars is a lot of money. It's not cheap by any means. And so it's just, you know, that's, that's ridiculous, you know. You know, it's like every, you know, th 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 that's, that's ridiculous. Um, I heard the Vietnamese were one of the few people who managed to repel the Mongolians. Yes, the, the Vietnamese, the Indians, and the Japanese. I don't, I'm sure there's probably somebody else, but the Vietnamese, the Indians, and the Japanese are people who repelled the Mongolian invasions. There are very few people who are actually able to stop them. Because the Mongolians conquered dozens of civilizations, but those were civilizations that they, um, that they, uh, that they that that had defeated the Mongolians. Oh great! One moment. Uh, yeah, my um, my controller's dead, but whatever. Um, uh, any history books you would recommend reading in general? Uh, thank you, Lopez, for the super chat. Um, I don't know actually. Yeah, I actually had this controller. For, like, I I don't I don't read a lot of history had books. Had I read online. Like I just I just read um. I, I read a lot of stuff like articles and stuff like that. So yeah, I read you know it's crazy. Um, I've actually I've noticed I've had a lot more stick drift problems with the PlayStation Four and PS Three controller. The P let me see here. Uh, and let me just um. Mute this uh completely here. Okay. Um, well um. What what I was saying was, um, I read a lot. Um, I read I read a lot of history online. And do you know what a good do you know a good place to read history is? Like a really good place. Um, a, a really good place to read history is Wikipedia. Now I know some people might find that hard to believe. See, Wikipedia, what? Wikipedia is actually good for the most part. Like I have not read really anything false in Wikipedia. You know, ever like uh, you know, I I check it. I look at you know what's on Wikipedia. And whenever somebody writes something false on Wikipedia, it's it's edited back really quickly. So it's the, the only reason that you hear Wikipedia is bad is because teachers don't want you to use it. The reason teachers don't want you to use it is because it's too easy. That's why. So it's um uh, that they tell you that it's not unreliable, but that's not true. But like the thing is, they tell you that they tell you to use other websites. Wikipedia is unreliable, but the other website could have just been made by somebody else too. So it's just um that. But Wikipedia is a good source for the most part. Um. Uh. But yeah, about about the, the uh, about the second PS5 that I have. So the story with that. Um. My mom wanted to buy me a, P a PS5 for my birthday. And my birthday was in June. So this, this, this PlayStation 5 controller is under a year old. So I can just... Um, I, I've had a PS5 already here for two years since launch. But my mom wanted to buy me a second one. Now, the reason my mom wanted to buy me a second one was because she didn't want me to constantly travel back and forth with it. And so she thought that it was going to break eventually or some, or somebody was going to steal it at the airport or, or something like that. And so uh, my mom wanted to buy me you know, a PS5. She told me that's part of my business also. You know, I use it to make videos. And so I got um, she said, you got to have a second one here. And so I told my mom... I don't need a PS, another PS5, I can, you know, bring one over, but she was insistent on it, that she wanted to buy it for me for my birthday, and I told my mom that I would only accept the, the PS5, only, a second one, only if you buy it for retail price, I said. I said, if you buy it for, you know, scalping price, I will not take it. And the reason for that was because I was just so against scalpers. Like, I hate scalpers so much. Like, people who try to sell PS5 for, like, massive profits. I would say, I'd only take it if you buy it for retail price. And so my mom did buy it for retail price. She got it at Sam's Club. And so that was, um, uh, you know, and so that was it. She showed me the receipt and everything. I, I thanked her for it, hugged her for it. And, you know, she got me a second PS5 for that. But it was just, um, you know, appreciate my mom for that. Love you, mom. But it was, um, uh, but that was, you know, that was the whole story of my second PS5. But this, um, uh... Uh, so this controller is under a year old. So does anybody know in the comments, is there something I can do to get this PS5 controller replaced? Uh, this is under a year old. This is from June. So I, the PlayStation was purchased in June. 
the PlayStation 5 this came with. And the reason I actually brought this, I, I had two controllers come with the PS5 that my mom bought me, because my mom bought a bundle at Sam's Club, and it was it had two controllers, and it had Horizon Zero Dawn 2. But this, um, uh, there was two controllers. I brought one with me back home, because the controller I had here actually got stick drift just as I left. And so now I've been using this controller, you know, for what, you know, I've been using it since June, so in not, not like, not like eight months like I fought earlier, so it's like half a year. And within half a year, the, the, the um, uh, uh, this controller is busted now. Um, can act, um, Sony, provide a receipt, um, uh, hmm, so is there anything I can do to get a, con get this controller replaced, is there, like, a warranty or something like that on this, since this is, like, under a year old, or is this just, or am I just screwed, um, pro, if you blow air to it, you can fix it, it's a built-up dust that got, uh, uh, you could tell, what's your PSI, Mr. Blank, it's a built-up dust that got inside, you can fix it the way mine had stick drift, because it happens every five months, I blow air into it, and if it, what, news, where, where do you blow air into it? Do you blow air into, like, where the mic is, like, right here? Because I've done that. I've watched videos of it on YouTube. I've watched videos where people, you blow air, and it doesn't do anything. It doesn't fix the stick drift for me. I just, it just doesn't. So that's just, um, uh... Opening it up and use contact layer. Yeah, the thing is though, if I would open it up, I'd probably break it if I opened it up. So I'd say I'm not. I'm probably not going to bother doing that. Yeah. But I remember my friend told me. Um, my friend once gave me advice, and he told me. Um, oh, you sent a super chat, Edgy. I'm sorry. Um, the the typhoon saved the Japanese from the Mongolians. Yes, you're right on that. It was the weather. The because. Because no matter no matter how resistant or to the heat or cold you are, you can't stop a hurricane if that's coming towards your ships, and so that that stopped the the storm. Stopped the, the the typhoon is actually at the end of Ghost of Tsushima when you're fighting the Khan. That's actually the typhoon during that. Um, but um, my friend told me once that there's a, that each, that there's different PS5 controllers, and I remember he said he said that there's a specific ID on like one of the controllers. It's like a specific number, and he said that one of them is more vulnerable to um uh one of them is more vulnerable to uh to stick drift than the other one. I'm trying to remember what which number he gave me, but if you know the number on the back of the controller, there's a way to tell. Like one of them breaks more easy than the other one. Uh, oh, well, happy birthday, gaming legend. Are you're 16? Um, then your birthday. Uh, Oh, this is from Sam's Club, so is, I I could probably go online and print out the Sam's Club receipt. But is there like a um, is there anything I can do with it to get the controller replaced? Because I'd rather not spend sixty bucks on a new controller. But if I have to, I'll, I'll do it. So that's just that's just it. Um, you know, I'm not cheap or anything, but it's just like you know, I'm, I don't think nobody likes you know spending sixty bucks on a on a new controller uh, when they could just get a new one if there's a warranty or something like that. Um, am I a good person? Yeah, you're fine, Mister Wave. Don't worry about it. Um, uh. What do you think about World War II weapons being used in the Russo-Ukraine war? Well, the, the, remember what I said earlier in the stream. The Russian army is so incompetent uh, and that they're, they're literally using anything that they can get their hands on. They're even using old Mosin the guns. It's a bolt-action rifle, five rounds in the, um, in the gun. So they're using... And the reason you see Mosin the guns, the Mosin the gun is the most mass-produced you know, bolt-action rifle in history. And the Mosin the gun is a great rifle, but you don't want to use that in a modern war zone. So that's just... Um, uh, that's just that. Um, I could see a sniper using it, but there's an infantry man like having that. It's just um, no. So it's like then the Russians are so incompetent. But you know, hey, you know, it, it's it's um, you know, at least that that helps out because the Ukrainians because the Ukrainians don't have to deal with as much advanced weapons, and so it's gonna be easier for them to liberate their country. Um, and you know, kick the Russians out. But like the the Russian armies are so incompetent, and you know, they're drafting people that um, uh, you know, they're drafting you know younger people, and they claim that it's only for people who have military service, but they're drafting people who don't even have military service beforehand. So it's um. You know, hopefully the war ends soon, and hopefully, you know, Ukraine can liberate their country and, um, uh, and, uh, kick them out. Uh, but that's that. Um, if you registered it, uh, when you get it, um, uh, 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 I don't, I didn't register it, I mean, just got it from Sam's Club.
Desmond Doss, that's the guy from Hacksaw Ridge, right? He fought in the Pacific. Um, that's him, right? He was the medic who... Be uh, sell at half price and get new. I mean, who would I... No, I'm, that's just... That's, 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 that's like... I, I, no, I mean, I mean, that's just like, if somebody gives, you know, if, 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 the only, like, I would, I would, you know, if, that, if I was to sell this controller, I would literally, like, you know, tell the person that, you know, it has stick drift. If you want it, you know, you know, you want it, or maybe I'd probably even give it away for free. I'd rather have somebody try to fix it or something like that. Even if somebody gives me 10 bucks for it, you know, I'll take, I'll take that. Um, but I'll tell them that the controller is stick drift. I'm not going to, you know, give somebody, like, a controller and try to sell it and tell them that. I'm not suggesting you're saying it either. But I wouldn't like, you know, I would never sell something like that. Even, 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 even as scummy as GameStop is, I wouldn't do something like that. I wouldn't bring them a busted controller and just say, hey, or can you give me money for that? I wouldn't do that. Um, uh, so it's just, no, it's just, no. Um, no, I would only, I would only give this controller away to somebody who knows that it has stick drift. I'll tell them it has stick drift. And that's just, um, uh, Uh, I don't know what that is, Lucky. But I guess I'll see. Um, you know, you know what? I, you know what I'll probably do. I'll probably, um, uh, you know, I'll probably like, you know, um, uh, tomorrow. Uh, there's a, there's a few cell phone shops in the area here that fix. They fix electronics, so they fix stuff that's that's broken. And I'll probably I'll probably call up one of the electronic like uh, you know stores that fix stuff, and I'll just like ask them, hey, okay, my PS5 controller has stick drift. Are you able to fix this? Because I don't want to take it apart myself. Because I, um, uh, and if they can you know fix the controller and I can still use it, I'll use it. But if if it's gonna be like you know if it's gonna be more than like you know forty dollars for the repair, I'll just buy a new controller. Then that's just um uh, so that's just um that uh. What's your PSN, Mister Blank? Call Tony, Sony customer. Tell them it's under a year. Provide proof. They have to either fix or send a new one. They will give you the runaround. Um, okay, how do I prove to them that the controller is under a year old? Do do I... Sh I could probably print out my Sam's Club receipt, but how would I prove that the, that the controller is from the PlayStation 5 that I bought? Um, how would I prove that? Yeah, we, we could in the future, Mr. Waifu. Pro, would you ever visit China? Um, no, no, yeah, I would never visit China. I have nothing against the Chinese people. I love, you know, Chi I love Chinese culture and I love the Chinese people. Um, uh, but I would say that um, it's the government. It's the government is the reason. The only way I would ever visit China is if the government, uh, if the communist government was not in there. I would visit. I would visit Taiwan. Like Taiwan, I would visit 100. percent Like Taiwan, you know considers itself the Republic of China. So Taiwan, I would visit definitely. China, no. And also, I have done a lot of videos criticizing the Chinese government on this channel. Like my my YouTube videos, there's a lot of YouTube videos like where I talk crap about the Chinese government, like a lot of videos. And so I don't want to go to China. And like, even if I'm visiting, even, even, even if I'm like, I'm not doing anything, I'm just visiting just as a tourist. You know, I don't want them to like, you know, check my ID or like, you know, find out that I'm a YouTuber and then like scroll through my videos, like, and then try to find like an old China video. And then I get into trouble. So that's, that's pretty much it. I would never visit China because of that. Like, you know, I love, you know, I love the Chinese people. I love the Chinese culture. Um, I love, I love a lot of, you know, cultures in, 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 in East Asia, but it's just, um, uh, but it's just, I, uh, I just, it's it, the government. It's just what I, I hate. And I, so I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't go there, um, because of that. So I, I would get in trouble. And, you know, that I wouldn't like if, if I was visiting China, I wouldn't like say anything because I'd be scared of getting arrested. But like I, I, you know, all it takes is for them just to look at my YouTube channel. And even though YouTube is banned in China, like they would just, you know, just look at my YouTube channel. If somehow they found that out, I'd be in some serious trouble. Um, so it's just um, like I didn't break the law or anything. Well, technically in China, I would. But it was um, uh, I uh, I there's a lot of videos um, on my channel of just me, you know, criticizing the Chinese government a lot. And so it's just that. Um, yeah. Serpetsa and Lahoe eighty six one recommended. Well, yeah, a lot of um uh, I I uh, there's there's um uh, these were YouTubers. One of one of the YouTubers he lived in China, right? One of the YouTubers he he lived in China and then he and then he uh, he regretted it after some time. But um, uh, 
Yeah. First, make sure your controller is turned off. Then, uh, insert and hold down the paper clip or safety pen into the tiny hole in the back of your dual sense controller for five seconds. After the the okay, is there a part two? I just I you got cut off there. Um, Ukrainian frontline soldiers and reserve forces are using World War II weapons like the PPSH-41, PPSH-43, MP-40, and the Maxim light, light machine gun. Well, yeah, because there's there's massive storehouses of World War II weapons because just the the World War II weapons were mass produced. Like the Mosin the Gaunt was mass produced. Like it was just um, PPS the PPSH is the most mass produced submachine gun of World War II. So that you're gonna still see a few of them. Um, but the thing is though is that the point that I was making is that. Ukraine has to use everything that it can use. It's defending its country, its people. Russia, on the other hand, you know, pretends like it's such an advanced country, but yet they're still using some World War II weapons. So it's um, uh, you know, I that's that's the that's the thing about it. Oh, the spe being sucked in a special cargo warehouse sucks. Um. When do you think America was at its low and and their peak? Um, I think that America, America was probably as, at its lowest during, it, it depends. It, are you talking modern history or are you talking like, um, uh, are you talking like, you know, past, like, like, you know, all the way since the foundation of the country. If you're talking about since the foundation of the country, the worst time period in American history is the civil war. Definitely. The, the, the whole country got ripped in half. It was, you know, over half a million Americans died. It was, that was the worst, you know, that was the worst time period was the, the American civil war. The worst time period in a modern American history was the great depression. That was the worst time period in a modern American history. The best time like I would say probably you know I would I would say probably the the 80s maybe you know 80s would probably be you know a good time you know the cold war was coming to an end um you know it was um uh you know people were people were making you know people were making good money you know my dad like uh, my dad tells me a lot of times how good it was in the 80s so I didn't I didn't live in the 80s so I don't know but my dad tells me how good it was in the 80s my dad tells me that when he came to this country in the 80s that he could um uh, he he could go into a diner and he could like have like um you know um uh scrambled eggs he could have toast and coffee for just like a few dollars um, but he says that now everything is so much more expensive. And he said that, like, he tells me, he's like, he's like, you kids have to pay a lot more for the stuff that we had to deal with. And so, you know, I know people, people made less than, than they did back then, but also, you know, you know, stuff wasn't, you know, as expensive to buy in a lot of places. So it's, um, it's, um, question, are Tommy guns still made today? Oh yeah, of course. There's Tommy guns that are on the civilian market. Like there's, there's like, there's Tommy guns that like, you know, that, you know, civilians own that are new and, you know, produced. Like, I don't think there's like a company that like mass produces them, but you know, they're still made. Um, uh, so that's, that's, you know, they, they, they're still, they're still very much made. Um, thank you, uh, Third Street for the super chat. How do you feel about people in this generation not respecting veterans? It makes me sick to my stomach. Um, uh, I don't know how, you know, I don't know how somebody could, you know, could could uh, could disrespect the veterans and treat them so bad. If you didn't have the veterans, you wouldn't have this country. The veterans protect this country and protect your freedoms. And it's 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 one thing, like, like you know, if you are like, it, it, like I don't I don't like to talk politics here. You know, this is a gaming channel, but like you know, there's a big difference between being against a war and supporting the veterans. Like, it's like, like, you you could be against the Iraq war, but still support the veterans. There's, like, nothing wrong with being against the Iraq war. I, I don't agree with the Iraq war either myself. I think the Iraq war was stupid. That's just my opinion. But even though I thought the Iraq war was stupid, I never, like, you know, I never fought any less of the veterans. I always supported the veterans 110%. And so that was just, um uh, you know, that. But, like, if some, you know, for somebody to just, you know, insult the veterans and just treat them like, you know, you know, garbage... And so a lot of, sometimes the veterans themselves don't even agree with the wars. Like a lot of a lot of Iraq war veterans didn't even agree with the Iraq war. Like they think the Iraq war was a disaster. So it's um uh, but you know a lot of them were signed up for the military. They were serving their country and then the Iraq war happened. And so they ended up there. So that's um uh you know that's that. But it's um uh you know, you know people people treat veterans, you know, badly. It just makes you sick to my stomach. Um it does. Um and um you know what I was, you know, you know, you know what, you know what, you know one thing that made me feel bad um, uh, made me feel bad once is I remember when I worked in retail, when I worked in retail, and this is, I, I would say this is very important to Veterans Day. When I worked in retail, I remember that this, 
this old man stopped me like the in the aisle and he didn't even need help or anything. I asked him if he needed help. And instead he was he was just trying to talk to somebody. That's what he said. And he was telling me like a World War II story. And it was just kind of bizarre and random. He like, you know, stopped to talk to me about world, but I but I was very interested in his story. Like I wasn't like, you know, I I I, I wanted to hear his story in full. And it, it kind of broke my heart how like some of the other people that were there didn't care. They just walked away. They, like, the, you know, he was telling a story. Customers heard it, but they didn't care. They walked away. Some of my, you know, coworkers, I don't know if they heard it, but I listened to the whole story that he told me. And basically the whole story that he told me is he told me how he was a, uh, he fought in World War II. He's like a very old guy. And he, um, he was a, a pilot. So he wasn't the front line. So he was a, a, fi a pilot. I, now, I don't know whether he was a bomber pilot, a bomber pilot, or whether he was a fighter pilot. I just know he was, he served in the, you know, the, the armed forces, he was a pilot, he fought in the Pacific, so he fought against the Japanese, and he specifically said how he fought the Japanese in the air, so he told me he fought them in the air, I don't know if that means that he was like, um, I think that kind of means, I guess he was a fighter pilot, but he fought, he told me he fought them in the air, and he said that he, this is, this is the, the part of it that, that, you know, always, I always remember this part, he told me that the, the thing, when he fought the Japanese, he said that the, the thing that he feared the most that he was scared of the most wasn't dying. He he told me that what he was scared of the most was getting shot down, surviving, and then getting captured by the Japanese. So he told me he was more scared of getting captured by the Japanese than dying. That's what he was more scared of. And he actually told me that if he had if if he was about to get captured, that he would have rather shot himself. That's what he told me. And so that's how scared this old guy was of Japanese torture because he knew about the torture and that's how scared of it he was. And he told me, you know, that story. I don't know. It was a very, it was a very strange thing to tell me that all of a sudden, like, you know, he just started telling me about his, like, you know, his, his World War II days and stuff like that. But I listened to him and, and it was that, I guess he just needed somebody to talk to. I guess he felt like alone and he didn't, he didn't have anybody to talk to, but I listened to the whole story. Um, but that was that, but I completely understand where he was coming from. And, you know, and the thing is, though, is it, it, it disgusts me that so many people don't care about history and they don't, you know, they don't value our veterans. Like, you know, they don't value our veterans a lot. Um, you know, I, um, there was a, there was a World War II veteran once at the DMV. He was, he was outside the DMV and he was asking for change. I gave him 20 bucks. So it was, um, uh, that was when I still lived in New York, but it was, um, uh, it was the, um, uh, it was, um, yeah, I think that a lot of like, um, uh, I, I think a lot of people, they don't have that much respect for veterans, and it makes me disgusted. Like I said, you could be against the Vietnam War, like, you could be against, like, the um, Iraq War, but there's a difference between being against the war and, like, trashing the veterans. And if you're, like, one of those people that trashes the veterans, you're a scumbag. Because um, you don't, you have no idea what these guys go through, what they deal with, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, And for people, for people who didn't understand what I was talking about, if you were, the Japanese were notorious for torture during World War II. If you were, um, if you were captured by the Japanese, you were, your chances of surviving were very, very slim, very, very slim. And it would not be a quick death. So it's, um, uh, that's why he was so scared of it. Um. But yeah, you know, I, I would say like, you know, you know, do you know what, and, I, and I'll, as, I, as I'm wrapping up this stream, guys, you know who I'll say is like, you know, um, uh, you know, my heroes, my personal heroes, my personal heroes are like, you know, the pilots, the, the American pilots that like fought at Midway to like stop the Japanese um, uh, from attacking Midway Island and, you know, defeat the Japanese. My heroes are like the, um, the American soldiers that like stormed the beaches in Normandy and like liberated um, uh, uh, Western Europe from the Nazis and fascism. Those are my heroes. My heroes aren't those, you know, scumbag celebrities that, like, so many people worship. They worship these celebrities. Like, if you, like, like it, it, it's, it just breaks my heart because it would just, like, it's, it's like the, 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 uh, when I was a kid growing up, like, we were always so fascinated by World War II veterans as a kid growing up. Like, they were our greatest heroes, and those were the people that we respected the most. But now in these days, if you take 100 kids today, 100 kids, even teenagers, young adults, even 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 people who are, you know, past, you know, they're, they're already adults, young adults, and you ask those 100 young adults, you ask them, you know, would you rather spend the day talking to a World War II veteran that was at Normandy or, um, you know, a pilot in, at Midway, or would you rather spend the day with a celebrity? And like most of the, you, you know who most of the people are going to choose. They're going to choose some, you know, some elitist, you know, scumbag celebrity that doesn't care anything about you to spend the day with them instead of spending the day with somebody who actually like, you know, actually made a difference in the world and somebody who actually like, you know, you know, helped liberate, you know, the world from the Nazis and the Japanese empire. 
So it was just um uh, that. But like these guys, like you know, if we if we didn't have them, like you know, there's a huge chance that like the, Europe could still be under the Nazis. The Nazis might even be in America. Like it's like they wouldn't have even conquered America at one point. Is like you know if we didn't like you know stop these guys. And it was like you know same thing. Like you know Asia might be you know mostly Japan today. If like if the Japanese weren't defeated, so it was just um uh, you know I don't think people like you know appreciate these um uh, these veterans that much and you know these these you know they they um they I I see these dumb comments like on Twitter where I see like these people say they say veterans are imperialists they're capitalists and just you know, all this dumb dumb you know dumb dumb nonsense that these people you know spout. But you know that um you know just 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 whenever whenever I see the baby killer comments about, like, accusing Vietnam veterans of being baby killers, those are the ones that really upset me, like, a lot, because, you know, the Vietnam War, you know, say what you want about it, it was kind of a dumb war, but it was, um, uh, it was the, you know, why would you trash the veterans who fought in the war? The veterans were, um, uh, they had no choice, they got drafted, and so we called them a, some, you know, how, I can't imagine how bad that would be, to be forced to fight in a war you don't want to fight in, and then surviving the war only to come back home and being called a baby killer when you didn't even do anything like that. It's just, that's just, um... Yeah. I don't think like the, the, the you know the, the you know the young people who are like so like the young people who are so arrogant today and like you know they are so disrespectful. I would say like you know they don't understand they they wouldn't have most of the stuff they have today if it wasn't for the veterans who fought for them. They wouldn't have this country. We wouldn't have this country without veterans. I mean veterans were created this country where where what was the revolutionary war? You know, it was that. So it was um you know people who fought for us for our country. Um, we'd still be under British rule. So it's just, um... Do you think Hirohito should have been tri tried for war crimes? Um, uh... I would say about, and I guess last comment that I'll make about history. I uh, talked a lot of history on this stream. Um, uh, okay, what I'll say about, um, Hirohito, the Japanese emperor. Hirohito was not a good man. He was a bad guy. Um, a, a lot of people, I see people that defend, like, um, defend Hirohito, and they'll say that, they'll say that Hirohito, that he was, um, uh, what they say about him, they'll say that, uh, they'll say that, that, that he didn't, uh, know, or that he wasn't, that he was, it was all Tojo, they would say that it was Tojo who did everything, Hirohito was just a cultural figure, you know, he didn't, uh, you know, condone the, um, the actions. Here's what I'll say about it, is Hirohito, um, uh, knew about the atrocities that the Japanese were doing. He knew about the horrible things that Tojo was doing. He didn't care. He didn't care about that at all. He made no attempt to stop it. If, if Hirohito was truly innocent, he would have made some attempt to stop Tojo. Tell him, you, you can't kill people. You can't do these horrible things that you're doing right now. You know, I, I, can't, I can't picture him like... He wouldn't have had the power to stop the, the invasions, but he would have had the power to at least stop the mass killings. Like that. Like, that was just, um, uh, for the, you know, the, the emperor of Japan, for him claiming to be some, such an honorable figure, to, like, allow the, the brutality that the Japanese empire did, and, um, there's a very, there's a very, uh, good movie that I recommend you guys watch, it's a historical movie, it's a British and a Chinese film, it's called City of Life and Death, City of Life and Death is, like, you know, a, a really good movie. And so, you know, typically, um, you know, typically I don't like to, you know, typically I don't like to um, uh, watch stuff from China and stuff like that because I'm worried about the Chinese government, like, you know, putting propaganda into it. But this movie was not propaganda in any way. This movie was just, um, even though it was British and a Chinese movie, this was a good movie. And this actually shows, like, the atrocities, the horrible things the Japanese did in China. And this, this movie was just um, uh, pretty historically accurate because the, the killings that they actually did in the movie actually happened in real life like that. Oh, uh, there's a bot. I'll ban the bot. But look it up. It's City of Life and Death. That's the name of the movie, City of Life and Death. The whole movie is black and white. It's made black and white. And it's one of the best World War II movies I've ever seen. If I made like a top 10 World War II movies, I would have um, put City of Life and Death on that. But City of Life and Death actually takes place in 1937. So it takes place... Um, it takes place actually um, uh, before World War II started in Europe, but it's World War II is already starting in Asia. Japan is invading China, and it takes place during the, Nan the Nanjing Massacre, which is the wor it, Nanjing Massacre is considered one of the worst massacres in human history. The Japanese killed somewhere around two hundred to three hundred thousand people in two weeks, 
and um, uh, it was you know it was, it was really bad. It was it was horrible. And so for the Japanese emperor to claim that he he wouldn't know that, no, I doubt it. The Japanese emperor knew about that, or he was willfully ignorant. Um, but the, there there's actually proof the Japanese emperor encouraged war crimes. And how do I know that? Um, there is Unit Seven Three One. Um, uh, Unit Seven Three One was a um, a covert uh, you know Japanese biological chemical weapons like uh, factory. And they actually kidnapped people from China. So they would kidnap Chinese villagers and they would experiment on them. They did horrible experiments. They would do an experiment like they would freeze people to death. They would see how much cold a person can take before they die. They would have one room where they would electrocute somebody to death. And they would slowly turn up the electricity to see how much somebody could could uh, could, could take. They would test flamethrowers on people. They would um, uh, they would also uh, use germ warfare. They would create diseases and test it on people. And they would even po poison Chinese wells and kill hundreds of Chinese kids. This is what the Japanese did in China. And so uh, they they saw the Chinese as they didn't see the Chinese as people. They saw them as subhuman. And the 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 Japanese emperor was actually given documents on Unit Seven Three One, and the Unit Seven Three One asked him for permission. They asked him for permission to use the gas and to use the diseases in China. And the Japanese emperor signed off on that. So the Japanese emperor was perfectly okay with them gassing Chinese civilians and okay with them using uh, you know biological warfare on civilians. These weren't even soldiers that they were doing this to. They were just civilians. These were kids that they were doing this to. The Jap the Japanese were very cruel. And Shiro Ishii, like the Japanese doctor involved in that, is like Doctor Evil. It's like it's like the one of the most worst people that you can possibly think of. The Japanese doctor was responsible for that. If you want to know what happened to the Japanese doctor responsible for that, he got, he got, he didn't get put in prison. He was, uh, he was free to go because the U.S. messed up. The, the U.S. government made him a deal and they made the Japanese doctor a deal. And they told him that if you hand over all of your research, um, all of you, all, all the research on all of your experiments and everything like that, we won't prosecute you. And so he gave over all his research and the U.S. didn't prosecute him. They let the, the evil Japanese scientists go who did those horrible things. There was other scientists. Um, uh, the other scientists were mostly let go as well. So they never got punished for that. But the point that I'm making is the emperor was actively involved in that and the emperor knew about that. And so to answer your question um, er, uh, earlier, you're asking me if I think the emperor should have been tried um, uh, for crimes. The emperor was a bad guy. He wasn't a good man by any means. Um, but... Um, uh, he was he was not he he wasn't innocent by any means he wasn't like the one actively doing the, the mass killings but he did nothing to stop it and he signed off on some of them so that was that was about it it was mostly tojo but the emperor was also involved in that and the emperor could have stopped it the emperor could have said no we're shutting down unit 731 but he never did that so that was that was the thing with the emperor now if you think i do i think the emperor should have been tried not i don't know because the not trying him even though, even though the Japanese emperor was a bad guy, and a lot of Americans wanted to see him hanged for Pearl Harbor, but not trying him is probably the better thing to do because what happened was the U.S. wanted an ally in Japan. They wanted Japan to be their ally, and they didn't want, um, uh, they didn't want um, uh, the Soviets end up taking over Japan. And so if the, if, if the U.S. had prosecuted Hirohito and they put him on trial and they hanged him, there would have been endless civil war in Japan. Like, because it, in, in that time period, the Japanese are very different than the, than the Japanese today. Like, if, if I was to compare the Japanese to anybody today, it would be North Koreans. The Japanese were very similar to North Koreans um, back then. Um, the only difference between Japan and North Koreans, the Japanese back then and North Koreans today, is that the Japanese weren't starving for the most part. The Japanese were a little bit richer, they had more money, and they weren't starving. They were, you know, fed. Um, but the North Koreans are starving and they're brainwashed. The Japanese, on the other hand, were just brainwashed. But... They saw, just like the North Koreans, the Japanese saw their emperor as a god. He was a god. He was the most important person ever to, on the entire planet. And you had, to, you had to worship him like a god. And if the U.S. was to kill him and hang him, the Japanese public would have engaged in endless civil wars. There would have been endless rioting. There would have been endless terrorist attacks. It would have just gone on and on and on for years. And the U.S. would have never been able to uh, control Japan because of that. So that's why the U.S. didn't put him on trial. I think it was probably the better thing to do because the emperor was seen as a cultural symbol. The better thing to do was to have the emperor literally tell his people to stand down. When the emperor told the Japanese public to stand down, we didn't have resistance in Japan. Like when, when the U.S. went into Japan, we didn't have, uh, uh, you know, uh, civil war. We didn't have, you know, Japanese terrorist attacks, you know, stuff like that. Uh, we didn't have that happen because the Japanese emperor told the Japanese people to stand down. And because they saw him like a god, they stood down. They listened to him when he said, stop, you know, we're, we're giving up. We're, we're ceasing hostilities because the emperor didn't say we're surrendering. He said we're ceasing hostilities. He didn't want to use the word surrender because he didn't want to bring greater shame to Japan. But it was, um, uh, that's it. So it, I think MacArthur was probably, probably right in what he did in the end. Um, but I would say that 
the unit 731 people, those people should have been hanged. Like, the, those people should have been killed. Like, the, 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 the Japanese scientists involved in that should have been hanged. Tojo deserved to get hanged. Um, Tojo got hanged. Um, a lot, but a lot of other Japanese generals didn't get punished, and they should have gotten punished. So it was, um, there's a lot of really bad Japanese generals that went scot-free, unfortunately, and they didn't get punished. But that's, um, uh, that, that's pretty much, that's, hope that answers your question about, um, uh, about uh, Japan and history. Um, yeah, but it's like I, um, uh, about celebrities, they're never going to see long, uh, see long because something will happen and they're eventually going to retire or something. Well, um, thank you. Thank you, Reward. Um, thank you for the super chat. But it's, it's like I said, I, um, I don't, I don't understand this fascination with celebrities. Like, like why? Like, like, you know, what, what, what's, what's so, what is so important about these celebrities? Like what, like why exactly? Like what is, what is like? What's the deal with these celebrities? Like, what's what's where does this obsession with these celebrities come from? Because these these celebrities, like these celebrities, will say dumb things, and people will defend them no matter what, even if they say dumb things. He thinks they're clearly, and it's like the, these celebrities, like it's it. They're like our new elites. Like they're like our new aristocrats. Like remember when I was talking with the aristocrats earlier? Like it was like they're they're like the modern day aristocrats when you think about it. It's like people who are very privileged, and it's like people people follow this class of people around like they're almost like they're gods in a way. Um, they're so fascinated by them. Um, you know, they don't have as much political power as the um, as the um, uh, aristocrats did, like you know, back in you know medieval Europe. But you know, still, and 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 the thing is though is is what I never understood this. This is not a you know um, uh, you know they, this is not you know political because I stay away from politics. This is a gaming channel. But why is it that some people think celebrities' opinion is more important? Like why 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 is that more important? I don't understand that. Um, like, it's like basically by thinking that a celebrity's opinion is more important, you're basically thinking that that celebrity is more important than the common person or is smarter than the more common person. That's basically what, um, uh, if somebody thinks a celebrity's opinion is more important, they're basically thinking that the, that the celebrity is smarter than the average person, which they're not. Like, honestly, like it, it, when a celebrity tells me that I should vote for somebody or like, or if, if I meet a guy in the bus, like I'm just riding the bus and some guy tells me to vote for somebody and I, and I see a celebrity make a YouTube video and they're saying vote for this person. Why should I value the celebrity's opinion more than the guy on the bus? Like, like why? I'm not even insulting the guy in the bus. He's just an average day person. But the point that I'm making is why should, you know, why should because of their, you, you should, you know, why should their opinion be more important than the opinion of others? And I'm not saying they can't have an opinion. They can vote for whoever they want. They can have any kind of opinion. My problem personally with it is when, when they think that because they're a celebrity, and this isn't just politics, but when they think that they're a celebrity, that they think that their opinion is more important, and they think that they know what's right. So some because they're a celebrity, that somehow they're going to um, uh, their opinion is more important, and that you have to vote for this person or not vote for this person, or you or you have to support this policy or, or that or that. It's, you're just a celebrity. You're just an actor. You're not an expert in you know economics. You're not an expert in all this other stuff. You know, stop acting like it. But that's just um that's just personally what I feel on the on the celebrities is I feel like a lot of times they don't know what they're talking about. And look, I'm not trying to trash all celebrities. I know some celebrities are like you know really good people. Like some celebrities donate a lot of their money to charity and they help people. So they're are you know good honorable celebrities but from what i'm seeing um what was it like um uh was it was it shaquille o'neal i think it was a shaquille o'neal right was it was it somebody knows in the comments shaquille o'neal was giving an interview once it was was it him i'm trying to remember was it, it was a it was a basketball player but it was a shaquille o'neal and he said he was it it was definitely not lebron james i think it was Sha shaq yeah i think it was shaq so shaq said he said that that um, he said he was at, he was called a celebrity and he said, I'm not a celebrity. And he said, what, what do you mean? And he said, most celebrities are scumbags. I'm not, I don't consider myself a celebrity. I just consider myself an average person. And like my respect for Shaq, like rose through the roof, like tremendously, like it just jumped through the roof. Like, like it was just that. And so it was that, um, so it was, um, uh, I, that's, so that's what I would say. I think it was Shaq. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but it was like a basketball player who he said that it, he said that, um, he, that most celebrities are scumbags. And that's, you know, I, I agreed with him. So it was that, um, it was Shaq, I said, so, okay, so I was right, it was Shaq. So yeah, my respect for Shaq, you know, um, uh, goes through the roof. Another, another um, a celebrity that I like is I like Denzel Washington. Anybody, this, the actor Denzel Washington, I like him a lot. And, and I like Denzel Washington because Denzel Washington never tries to push any kind of agenda or anything like that. He stays away from politics, he doesn't do any of that stuff. And, you know, and, and, and literally when he was asked about who he's voting for, he like literally said, it's none of your business. I vote for whoever I want to vote for. And that's, that's what I liked about Denzel is like Denzel, like, you know, is a very, you know, straightforward guy. And, you know, he's, he tells it like he thinks it is. And so he's not like, um, uh, 
He's not, um, uh, you know, he's not one of those elitist celebrities. So, you know, Denzel Washington, I like him. I like Shaquille O'Neal. They're both good guys. Um, uh, is like, is there another celebrity that I like? Um, uh... Conan O'Brien, I, I wouldn't say that I like Conan O'Brien, but I would say that I have more of a better opinion of him. And the reason that I the reason that I have a better opinion of Conan O'Brien is because Conan O'Brien tends to stay away from a lot of the, the stupid stuff that a lot of the other celebrities do. Like he doesn't tend to get involved. He like he doesn't get in, into like political stuff. Like he just tries to keep everyone happy, you know, keep his you know you know you know keep his audience happy, and you know just joke around. Like he's not like one of those guys that like he's like telling you you better vote this way and that and that or that. So it's but like the the um uh. The um the the other comedians like Jimmy Kimmel that idiot and like those I I can't stand those people like it's just I I can't I can't handle those people like they um uh, that um well, I, I I I I don't I don't even know much about this 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 Tate guy that people keep talking about I don't even like him I think he's kind of stupid I've heard some of the things that he said he's kind of a bit of an idiot so I don't even know who he really is he's just another celebrity he's just doing the same thing he's another celebrity he's just like he's some he's some wrestler or boxer or something like that that just goes on TV and just or radio show and just starts ranting about dumb things so it's that's just I just said I I like celebrities that stay away from stuff like that you know they just res they respect everyone it doesn't matter you know what your politics are like, people like Den. Washington, people like Shaquille O'Neal, that just, you know, mind your own business and just, you know, they don't try to act like they're better than somebody because they're, because they're a celebrity. That's like, um, uh, that's that, um, uh, yeah. you're my favorite celebrity pro. Well, thank you. Um, I don't even consider myself a celebrity. I, like Shaquille O'Neal said, I just consider myself an average person. What's your PSN, Mr. Blank? Um, don't worry, it's a meme. What the whole? T I don't even know this this Andrew Tate thing. I don't even know what that is. Like people, people keep bringing it up, and I, I saw a YouTube video of him once. Like he, he was going on like some radio rant. Like he was just ranting about dumb things, like just talking nonsense. And so that's just you know I don't even know who the guy fully is. But like from what I've seen, he's just another you know elitist celebrity, and that's just um uh you know that. And I don't, and like I said, I don't care if the celebrity is saying right wing, right wing or left wing stuff. I don't care. I just, I cannot stand when celebrities mix politics in, whether it's right wing or left wing, I don't care. So that's just it. So I, you know, I would think LeBron James is an idiot and Andrew Tate is an idiot. You know, both of them are. So it's just, um, you know, LeBron James, I have my um, issues with him also. It's just, you know, he defends the Chinese government and he defends, you know, you know, the, uh, what the Chinese government did in Hong Kong. So, you know, for me, he's just, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, he threw away all his honor and integrity when he defended the Chinese government. And uh, so did John Cena. Like John Cena, I have no respect for John Cena either. Um, John Cena's a joke. Um. Mm. Uh. Oh, okay, Mr. Waifu. Um. Sha Shaquille's intelligence is also the reason why he didn't become poor after, unlike, um, uh, unlike many celebrity athletes who retired from sports career. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't know much about him, but, like, you know, I just knew he was a basketball player, and, like, I had a video recommended to me, like, Shaquille O'Neal talks about celebrity scumbags, and I watched it, and so, like, I, I agreed with that, like, you know, fully. And look, guys, I'll tell you this, um, I have huge amounts of respect for, um, you know, my fan base, you guys, because without, without you guys... I would not have this YouTube channel. This YouTube channel would be nothing without you guys. You guys are what make up and make up this channel and make this channel successful. Um, uh, but like you know, I, 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 my job is an entertainer. That's what my job is. That's what I do. Is I entertain people. That's you know my specialty. And so you know, I'm not, I'm not a comedian. I don't make jokes. Like I'm not a funny guy. And I, I don't even you know. There's very few things that I joke about. Um, but what I am, what I am really good at, and I would like to think that I'm really good at is explaining stuff. Like like lore content, I would say that's one of my best, when I need to explain something, I, I would say that I'm good, like, wouldn't you guys, when explaining something, so that's my specialty, so somebody might be a comedian, but my specialty is personally, like, explaining stuff, and, like, you know, lore videos, and, you know, and doing streams, and stuff like that, and so that's, that's what I'm good at, that's my specialty, but it's, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, I, I don't, ever talk politics. I completely stay away from politics. The only time I've ever mentioned politics on this channel ever, ever, is when they, um, they, they talk video games. Like, when politicians want to ban video games, it's the only time I mention it, because it's, you know, it's something we can all agree on. It's stupid. Um, but, and I've seen people from both parties do it also. It's not just people from one party that want ban video games banned. I've seen both parties, at least in my country, America. But it's, um, uh, it's, I don't talk politics, and I don't talk politics because, it, because, Politics is a divisive issue, and everybody has their own opinion. Everybody feels like a certain way, and I personally think it's stupid when I see YouTubers or celebrities that have nothing to do with politics talk politics. And 
You know, you can be a political channel on YouTube and talk politics. That's fine. That's what you do for a living. That's your specialty. But if your specialty isn't that, you're a comedian, and then all of a sudden you start, like, shoving politics into it, or, you know, you're a basketball player, and you start shoving politics, or you're an actor, a musician, and you start shoving politics, and that's, all that's going to do is that's going to divide your fan base, because your fans like you. You know, your, your fans like you uh, from all over. Your fans from both left and right people like you. And so it's not fair to your fans when you start pushing a political agenda, no matter whether this agenda is left or right. You know, I, I, I can't stand whether celebrities on both, you know, sides will start saying, you know, dumb things. And what I'm getting to this is that because I'm an entertainer, guys, I have no right to push any kind of political viewpoint on you guys, nor do I want to. I just want to sit here and entertain. I hate drama. I hate politics. And I just want to sit here and, you know, make fun video streams where we all hang out and talk. And so that's ultimately my problem with celebrities. You know, I, I if you've followed my channel for some time, you know that I cannot stand celebrity elitism. I hate elitism, and I hate people, like, you know, thinking that they're better than other people, and so that's, you know, what I've, um, uh, I've always personally couldn't stand, so that's, I respect my audience a lot, and so because of that, I never, you know, push any kind of political agenda, never, you know, talk, um, uh, you know, never talk any of it, and also, it's, um, also, I don't, I don't even, I don't censor people on my channel, ever. Like, you know, even, even people who insult me, I don't censor them. I don't, I, I, I'm so against censorship. Like, I, I, I despise censorship so much. I do not, I don't, I don't even ban people for insulting me. Like, people can insult me and I'm not going to ban them. Like, sometimes the moderators do it, but I personally, I, I personally don't do it myself. I never ban somebody for insulting me or calling me stupid or anything like that. Um, the only time I will ban people is um, I will ban people only on two conditions, and those two, well, actually three conditions. The first condition is I'll ban somebody from my channel is if they're pulling a scam. That's a bannable offense for me. Um, the second thing is if somebody's, you know, being racist generally, I'll, you know, I'll get rid of it. Um, uh, I'll ban them. Um, if somebody is um, uh, spamming, really badly insulting, then I'll, you know, ban them. But somebody can come to my channel and they can call me an idiot. They can say, you know, you're stupid professional, you know, I, I hate your channel and everything like that. I'm not going to ban them. You know, there's, you, you can see there's plenty of comments. Like, you know, you, you look at my playthroughs. Look at my playthroughs, for instance. You'll see people on my playthroughs who have been the, making similar comments for months saying, like, I hate your channel or you're stupid or something. I don't kick, I don't kick them off my channel. I could delete their comments, ban them. I don't do it because I'm just so against censorship. I hate censorship so much. That's just, um, uh, that's just it. So if somebody's insulting me personally, I don't get rid of it. I don't ban it. I'll, I might, I might try to talk with them and I might ask them, you know, why don't you like me? Is there something I can improve on? But if they're just saying you just suck, you know, I'm just going to ignore it. But I don't, you know, I don't ban them. I don't censor them. You know, the reason I, the reason I get rid of racism and ban people for being racist is for obvious reasons, because it's bothering other people and offending other people. It's not just, you know, bothering me. But if it's, if it's just directed towards me, then I'm not, if somebody's just insulting me, I'm not going to, you know, ban them. But if somebody's being racist, you know, or sexist or something like that in the chat, I'll get rid of it. I'll ban it. But, you know, and, and, um, I give people multiple warnings a lot of times, but I like to think that I'm pretty reasonable when it comes to that, but it's, um, uh, but yeah, the, the point is, the point that I was making is that I, I despise censorship so much that even people, people, somebody could come to my channel and call me an idiot and I won't even kick them off. So that's just, um, uh, that's just it. Um, uh, yeah. And also I, I feel like personally, I personally feel like, I feel like censorship is, um, uh, you know, a path to disaster because if you start, you know, if you start censoring somebody for criticizing you, it's going to, you know, it's going to lead to a no, ever ending chain of just, you know, um, uh, you know, nonsense and everything, eventually everything is going to get, you know, you know, canceled. Everything is going to get, you know, you know, censored. And that's, you know, that's, you know, ultimately uh, my position on it. Um, I personally think that, you know, I personally think like somebody calling me an idiot, like, um, uh, when I look at the comments section, I look at the comments on my video, when somebody like calls me an idiot and I look at the comments, I was, I, I will see sometimes people responding to them. Like, like a lot of people reply to them and a lot of people will say, you know, why are you calling the professional an idiot? And it's like, it's like, it's like, like you're an idiot and like, you know, stuff like that. And I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you guys defending me, but you guys don't have to do that. Um, uh, but it's, um, uh, but it's, um, uh, yeah, I, I like to think that the person, the person calling me an idiot, they can probably be proven wrong. Um, in the comments, and they can probably eventually see that I'm not an idiot and I'm not, I'm not a scumbag. So that's just, um, uh, you know, that. You know, some people, you're not going to change their minds, but I like, to, I like to always change people's minds. And if somebody's, like, thinking negatively, I always try to change their minds. But I don't think that, you know, banning somebody is going to, like, you know, get people... If somebody, if somebody hates you and, you know, banning them, I don't think that that's going to help. That's just going to make them hate you even more. I think, you know, the best... I think the best thing to do is to, you know, try to have a discussion with the person. And I do that in my comment section. I, you know, I, even on my live stream, somebody says, I hate you. I say, why? Why do you hate me? What did I do? And like, and we take it from there. And I try to have a reasonable discussion. I try to say, you know, what's, what's your problem? You know, if there's something that I'm doing wrong, tell me. And I can try to improve. And if, if I do something that annoys you, I can try to stop it. So that's just um, it. Uh, but if, you know, if it's just repeatedly, you know, you suck and not giving an explanation because I see that a lot, I'll just ignore it at that point. I won't ban them, but I'll just ignore it. And I'll just say, you know, uh, whatever. It's no point reasoning with this person. But I always try to, um, 
always try to reason with people. I always think that, I think reasoning with people and trying to get people to change their ignorant views, I think that that is always the better way than censoring. I think censoring is not going to solve anything. I think it's, you know, kicking, banning somebody for, you know, saying something I don't think is necessarily going to change their mind. And so that's, I don't think that that's the correct way to handle it. I think education and trying to have a rational dialogue with people, I think is more likely to get the toxic people um, to stop. Um, Yeah, I don't care either, Aussie uh, guy. He's like, it's like he's he's, he's you know this, this. I don't know who this Tate guy is, but he's probably you know. It, I seen like I seen I seen one video of him being stupid, and he said some really dumb things. So it's you know it's just another elitist celebrity, you know, you know talking politics and other nonsense, and so that's just um uh, you know it, I can't stand a lot of them. Uh, hey, any advice on taking risk in life and following your dreams? Thank you, um, Lopez, for the super chat. Um, thank you, man. Um, I would I would say that like. I don't, I, I, about risk is I would say to like, never stop believing in yourself and always believe that you're gonna, that you're gonna achieve something in life. Because if you stop believing in yourself, that's a recipe for disaster. About risks, um, have I taken risks before? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, um, I've taken, I've taken risks with my YouTube channel. Um, and I'm gonna end the stream here in like a minute or two. I'm just really hungry, guys. I haven't eaten dinner. I'm kind of starving. The long stream today, almost five hours now at this point. Um. But um, I would say I took a risk with my with uh, I I took two major risks in my life uh, when it came to my money. Um, the first risk that I that I made that I had in my life was I um, I had um, I risked moving my channel away to other content. So when I started moving my channel to other content, because I used to do just GT online, when I moved my channel to other content, you know that was very risky because I had. Um, I lost a lot of views, and so I ended up losing a lot of money. I lost a lot of subscribers, but even though I did that, I followed my dreams because even though I didn't regret the GTA content that I made, I enjoyed it. I wanted to, um, I wanted to make like other content, and I wanted to start playing other games and have fun doing other stuff. And so that's ultimately what it was. Um, uh, that's ultimately what I wanted to do. And so even though I had gotten lower views, eventually worked out for myself. So a lot of YouTubers are scared to do that. I'll tell you, a lot of YouTubers are scared to take risk, and they're scared to move their channel in a different direction. They think that if they move their channel from like a different direction, that they're going to lose all their views if they start making different videos and stuff like that. But I was very, um, still very successful. Um, uh, you know, the second risk that I took is when I purchased a house. I purchased it as a rental property. It was a business. So I purchased it as a rental a business, and it was a massive risk too. Um, but I, I had good tenants, and so it, it worked out in the end, and everything's fine. And I, I have a good relationship with my tenants. My tenants like me. I like them. And so that's, um, you know, that. Um, uh There was also a late uh, a late night uh, host recently brought his wife to the to the in order to show uh, to support abortion rights. Ricky Gervais should roast them again. Well, it's like you know you know that's another you know controversial thing. I don't know like you know why celebrities like I'm not even taking a stance on it, but I'm just saying I don't know why you know why you know celebrities would like you know you know you know stuff like this. Like you know you're an entertainer in the end. I don't you know I I don't get that you know take. It, you know, trying to push a specific viewpoint on you. Um, shout out to Charlie Third Street. Happy birthday, dude. Happy birthday, Charlie. There's a bot. Where's the bot? Yeah. Okay, I'll try to add you, Mr. Blank. I, I'll, my, I might add you later or tomorrow, but I rem I'll, I'll have your name noted here. Um, I, I, I own a house. Um, uh, Yeah. But, you know, follow your dreams and do what you want to do. Because I'll tell you something. I, I wasn't, like, depressed or anything. I wasn't. Um, but when I... Um when I started, like, um, uh, when, when, like years ago, like, this is, like, I would say, like, 2017. 2017, I was not in, like, a good state. I wasn't, like, depressed, but I was just, like, I didn't know whether I would be success in life. I was scared I was going to be a failure. Because that, that, that's what I was ultimately scared of, is I was scared of being a failure in life. And, um, and so it was, um, you know, I was scared that I was going to, I was going to end up being stuck in retail and like working for decades. Like I actually thought that was going to happen to me. And so I was like, um, I was scared of that. And, um, event, you know, my YouTube channel became very successful. And I found something that I was really good at because I didn't know what I could be really good at. I didn't know. And like, I, I, I was, I was very knowledgeable in like history and stuff like that and talk, but I, you know, I didn't know like an actual skill that I could be good at. And so like you, YouTubing and like making videos and like talking about stuff. And I realized, you know, that's my passion. That's like, that's what I'm strongest at. That's what I'm good at. That's what, that's what, you know, that's what it is. You know, a million, you know, subscribers on the channel says, says that, that they like my content. And so 
shows that I guess that I'm uh, that I'm successful in that. And um, yeah, so I would say is like, but I, looking back at myself, that was one of the worst attitudes I ever had in my life. It was a horrible attitude. I wish I could take that attitude better. Like thinking that I was gonna be unsuccessful and thinking that I was gonna be like uh, that I was gonna be a failure in life. Don't think that like me because that was a really horrible feeling. And like, and my thinking on that completely changed around when I fought when I found something that I was really good at. So like you, you if you think think like that, you think you're gonna be a failure in life. Don't worry because there's something good that I know you would be good at and something that you would be successful at and something that you would probably um like doing. So that's um that um so that yeah just don't don't ever have that negative attitude that I had in like 2017 this is before my channel became big I had like under 100, 100 subscribers and I didn't like you know um you know you could become a teacher you can make a cool history teacher well thank you gamer um Pro, you were about to be a cop. Yeah, I, I finished law enforcement in school, but I, I and I, I wanted to somewhat be a detective, but I didn't know whether I wanted to pursue it. And so it's like I ended up not pursuing law enforcement in the end. Um, professional, is there a World War II game that takes place in the Netherlands? Yes, there is. Medal of Honor Frontline. Look up Medal of Honor Frontline. Um, that several missions are in the Netherlands. Do you know Corey X Kenshin birthday last two days ago? Oh yeah, um, a happy birthday to him. I think I know who he is. Wait, let me, let me just. I'm just gonna YouTube look up his YouTube channel because I think I know who you're talking about. Um, uh, let me just see here. Okay, yeah, yeah, him. I know who you're talking about. So, um, uh, that's that's the guy who suffered like he 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 encountered the racism from YouTube, right? I, I know I know who you're talking about now. Yeah, I know this guy. So you know his story is he was like um he was uploading videos on YouTube and they were getting age restricted and he was uploading very similar videos to other YouTubers and they weren't getting age restricted and so he was uh, uh yeah he was he was getting discriminated against and so there was a lot of speculation that it was because some of the people some of the moderators at YouTube were possibly racist and so I feel really bad for Corey in that regards but I see he's doing really good you know he's got you know 14 million subscribers he's doing much better than me so it's um uh. You know, wish him success and hope it. You know, hope everything goes good for him. Hopefully, he doesn't deal with that age restricted nonsense. Um, uh, I had a, a few of my videos age restricted too, but it's um, yeah, I I didn't have that as many as him though. He had a lot, so it was just um, that was um. Love your content, man. Thank you. Um. Do I prefer meeting Stephen Ogg or a World War II veteran? I'd much rather meet a World War II veteran. Um, but I guess I'm going to be going here, guys. I'm really hungry. Um, I haven't eaten dinner, so I'm actually, like, starving at this point. Um, so I'm going to—I guess I'm going to— um, I'm going to wrap up the stream here, guys, okay? Um, Godfather 2, it's still kind of late. Um, uh, it's still kind of late to upload it. Um, do you guys do you guys want me to upload the Godfather 2 part right now, or do you want uh, or do you want to watch it tomorrow, earlier? Let me know. What, do you rather be uploaded now, or do you want to watch it for tomorrow? Let me know in the comments, and what people say, I'll either upload it now or not. Um, one person said in the morning... Yes, yes. Uh, well, d y y just uh, just say once, yes. Just just say once, just so that multiple profiles don't have yes spam, please, everyone. Um. Well, no, the the video. All I have to do is just hit one button. That's it. I just have to hit one button and it's uploaded. So it's not that I have to edit anything. It's already done. Um. Uh. Now it's morning. Uh. Uh, morning. Okay, so there's, um, it seems like there's considerable people that will prefer it in being in the morning. So, um, uh, I guess, I guess I'll probably, I'll probably, I'll probably have the Godfather part up in the morning then probably, probably, um, uh, it is kind of late anyways. Um, uh, but it's, um, uh, it's, uh, just check out, check out in, in, what time is it? It's 2 a.m. for me. So I'm gonna... I'm going to set this this on a schedule then. Um uh let me see here. Um uh da, da, da.
Oh, schedule video. Here it is. Okay. Okay. Well, for me, it's it's it, for me it's two a.m. Um. Uh. Do I make false promises subconsciously? What What do you mean, man? Um. Uh. 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 Are you talking about the Saints Row review? I'm 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 editing the Saints Row review as we speak. It's it's it's. I already started it. It's the Saints Row review is going to be um. It's going to be up on this weekend. So just 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 wait with that. Um. Uh, okay, let's see here. Uh, okay, November twelfth. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna put this. I'm gonna put this. Um, uh, this. I'm gonna schedule this. This playthrough here. Ah, you know what? I. I ah, whatever. Um. I will, I, I can't make up my mind right now. Ah, uh, whatever. I guess, you know what, forget it. I'll just, you know what, I'm just going to make this, I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to put out the, the play for right now. So if it's, I hope it doesn't bother anyone. Um, uh, you don't have, you guys don't, don't, if you're tired right now, go to bed. But it's like for anybody that wants to watch the play for right now, I'll just put it up right now. So it's, um, uh, it's that, um, okay, so there we go. Okay, so the, so Godfather 2 is uploaded. It's very late through a 2 a.m. video to upload, but it's, um, uh, it's um uh it, it's uploaded so it's um if anybody if anybody wants to watch the next part of the Godfather I talk a lot of the mafia lore in that and like mafia history as I'm playing it so if you like talk me talk about history check out my Godfather like playthrough um, I'm talking a lot on that um uh, but it's it's up right now if anybody wants to watch it do drop a like on my Godfather playthroughs guys if you like them because it does help the the the, the, the series out a lot Pro asked a com a question in a comment earlier I'm sorry I didn't see IG let me see um yeah. Can I read your question? Let me see. What's your? Where's your question? Uh, do you think the Soviet invasion of Manchuria influenced the Japanese to surrender? Uh, it was part of it, but it wasn't the main reason. I know what you're talking about. The August 1945 invasion. Yes, I know. Yeah, the it was a million over a million Soviets that overran the Japanese in Manchuria. I know what you're talking about. Um. How come you weren't that upset over Aldo's death? Because because I've seen his death for you know ten years now. So I or, or you know however long twelve years since the Godfather two came out. I know that it's happening. So it's it's still it's it's a, it's a death that happened a long time ago in a game. Doesn't mean that I wasn't upset about it. Um, but it's just it's just I'm just so used to that game now. Um. Uh. No, I haven't seen that episode. What's what's the name of the episode, Alfredo? Um. April sent pro. Oh, somebody said a, a super chat. Let me see here. Uh, let me let me see. I'm sorry if if I missed anybody's super chat. I'm really sorry. Um, let me see here. Um, uh, Oh, and thank you, X X Legend Gaming. I'm sorry I didn't see your super chat. Love this game. Thank you, man. Um, uh, I'm looking for the list. I don't see. Uh, I don't see that one. But um, thank you, Ape. Uh, thank you, April. Um, Oh uh, wait. Uh, thank you, Pearl, for the stream. I needed it. Oh, thank you, April. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad I was able to help you. Um, I see your. Oh, I see your comments now. Here. Um, let's see what did you all? I blame school for my depression. Bullied worse in high school. I'm. I'm really sorry about that, April. Well. No. No. Know that you matter, and that. Um, don't don't let anybody tell you otherwise you know don't let these scumbags um uh you know you know don't let these scumbags push you around like this i would tell um i would tell tell a parent tell a counselor um you know that is um uh, i hope that um you know i hope that you you know don't 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 like physically encounter these people but um is um you know tell tell a parent tell a counselor because there are people who 
who uh, there are people who care about you, and I'm I'm really sorry that you're going through that. Um, but don't don't approach the bullies. Just um, just uh, tell a parent, tell a counselor, and just know that you matter and that you are important, and don't let anybody else tell you that. I hope that that um uh, I hope that does that's helped you out, April. I'm sorry that you're going through that. Hey, pro advice for small content creators. For small creators, you want to. It's something that you want to. You want to do it. it, it Small content creators is um it's 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 a bit hard, but I always, I looked at YouTube as something that I was doing for fun, and then when it you know turned into something that I could do for a living, you know I changed differently on like you know um it was like you know I I started you know working on it uh you know um and actually like um I started like you know putting more much more time into it, so it's um smaller creators it's a little bit harder to you know get started, but you know once you get that one viral video, it's really hard to start growing. And please talk to your family or a social worker. Don't hurt yourself. You're better than the bullies. Yeah, art art has a great point there. Yeah, don't don't approach the bullies. Um, April. Um, talk to your friends or family. Um, uh, talk to a counselor. I, I I tried, but no one wants to listen. They mock me. Who? Your family? Well, um, I I, I really hope it's not your family. That, but t- tell a counselor. A counselor. Ha- there's. I'm sure there's a counselor. I'm sure somebody that would help you. Um, it's okay, Mr. Waifu. If it, and and look, Art. I mean, Art. April. If 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 your counselors are not helping you, if your counselors aren't helping you with this, get in contact with the principal. And if the principal is not getting helping you, get in contact with the superintendent. There's people above the chain, and eventually you're, you're going to get to somebody who's going to help you, and um, is going to care about you. Um, but uh, you you, know, you get to them, you talk to them, and you tell them that that you know there's pe- there's bullying going on here at my school, and my counselors aren't helping me. And that's that's if the if the they're, if the counselors at your school aren't helping you, and you got to go above them, you know, to get help. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And Ender Ender is right there. There's you know there's there's people there's there's positive people that care about you. So you know don't let the bullies tell you that you're you're not important. You are. You're you're a good uh, bro. Well, thank you, Hugo. I don't know. I I, I, I I probably wouldn't have time for Discord, but um yeah. Hi Gary. Um Hey hey Pro, I remember you said North Korea would end up like Somalia one day. Well it's entirely possible. Um It was back in two thousand ten, but it still affects me. Well, if, if, if this happened in 2010 and this still affects you, I would talk to a family member about this. Uh, you need somebody that you can talk to, a good friend. Um, uh, but if your family members are being, you know, scumbags um, uh, as well, then I would, um, you know, I would try to find like, you know, uh, you know, a, a good, try to find a good friend. Or if you, if you can't do that, try to get like, um, uh, try to find so, like a, a therapist or like a, you know, a good, like somebody, somebody that can talk to and hear your problems out and like, you know, and give you good advice. Um, I hope that that helps. But just just know that you're important, April, um, and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Um, well, I guess we'll be um uh, I guess we'll be going here, guys. Um, I guess we'll be um I'll be going here, guys. I'm really hungry. I wanna um, I wanna make some dinner. I haven't eaten dinner. It's like two a.m. So I'm really hungry. I only had breakfast. I'm super hungry. So I'm just going to make some food and, um, you know, probably edit the Saints Row video re- review a little bit and go to sleep. The Saints Row review I will have for, for Sunday. So for Sunday, it should be up. So check out Sunday and you'll see the Saints Row review. Um, but um, I, 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 um, I, hope that, I hope that my advice has helped you, April. But just know that there, there, there are people out there that would care about you. I know it's not always easy to make friends, but there, there are good people out there. Um, that that would that would help you out and give you advice. But um, you know, if you ever you know if you're ever feeling down, you can you know you can come by my streams and you can you know you can talk to me. Um, uh, if I if I see your comment, I'll reply to you. Uh, I, I hope I hope that I helped you out. You will think. Do I think I'll let you move on to something else in the future other than gaming, like in the next ten years? 
I think that in the next 10 years, I'm going to run several rental properties, but I don't, um, uh, I don't think that I'm going to stop gaming. I'm always going to you know, do my channel. I have no plans to stop my YouTube channel. Like 10 years from now, I still plan on doing YouTube unless YouTube completely collapses and something happens, but it's like, um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to still do YouTube and all that. Um, please eat at normal times. Well, and I, I know I, I should start eating at more normal times, but it's, this is why I love pro because he cares about his viewers and fans. Well, thank you, Eric. Did I, did I help you out, though, April? Um, I hope you do a Max Payne 1 someday. That's the, one of my favorite games. Great stream. Thank you, John Phelps. Maybe I'll play the Halo games one day. Is April still here? Do you like the Civilization series? Some of them, yeah. Um... No, I, I didn't end the stream uh, uh, yet. How much do you eat a day? I usually try to eat three times a day. Um, it, my gym progression has been good, I'd like to think. Um, I had top views figuring out what I want to do as a career. I just have an interest in horror. can't decide between movies or games right now. Um... Hmm. Why don't you make like lore on horror games? You could do something like that, probably. Um, oh, and uh, you're sent from heaven itself, Patrick. Well, thank you, April. It means a lot to me. I I try to follow my workout plan. I try to work out every three days. If I can't work out every three days, I work out on the next day afterwards. So, but I I don't go more than four days without working out. Um. Yeah, this stream was long, but I'm going to be ending, um, uh, uh, but I will be, um, I'll be ending the stream here, guys. Thank you guys for watching. I hope that you guys, I hope that you guys enjoyed the stream and just know that all of you guys are important and all of you guys matter and, you know, don't let anybody tell you otherwise, but I guess we'll be ending the stream here. Um, thank you guys for watching. If you guys enjoyed the, um, uh, if you guys enjoyed the stream, do drop a like. It does help my channel out a lot. Um, thank you guys for watching. Check out The Godfather um, 2 if you like watching that series. I just uploaded it like a few minutes ago. But thank you guys for watching. I will see you guys on the next one. Take care, guys. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Take care, guys.